Great Expectations by Charles Dickens. Chapter 40 It was fortunate for me that I had to take precautions to ensure, so far as I could, the safety of my dreaded visitor. For this thought pressing on me when I awoke held other thoughts in a confused concourse at a distance. The impossibility of keeping him concealed in the chambers was self-evident. It could not be done, and the attempt to do it would inevitably engender suspicion. True, I had no avenger in my service now, but I was looked after by an inflammatory old female, assisted by an animated rag-bag whom she called her niece, and to keep a room secret from them would be to invite curiosity and exaggeration. They both had weak eyes, which I had long attributed to their chronically looking in at keyholes, and they were always at hand when not wanted. Indeed, that was their only reliable quality besides larceny. Not to get up a mystery with these people, I resolved to announce in the morning that my uncle had unexpectedly come in from the country. This course I decided on while I was yet groping about in the darkness for the means of getting a light. Not stumbling on the means after all, I was fain to go out in the adjacent lodge and get the watchman there to come in with his lantern. Now in groping my way down the black staircase I fell over something, and that something was a man crouching in a corner. As the man made no answer when I asked him what he did there, but eluded my touch in silence, I ran to the lodge and urged the watchman to come quickly, telling him of the incident on the way back. The wind being as fierce as ever, we did not care to endanger the light of the lantern by rekindling the extinguished lamps on the staircase, but we examined the staircase from bottom to the top and found no one there. It then occurred to me as possible that the man might have slipped into my rooms, so, lighting my candle at the watchman's and leaving him standing at the door, I examined them carefully, including the room in which my dreaded guest lay asleep. All was quiet, and assuredly no other man was in those chambers. It troubled me that there should have been a lurker on the stairs, on that night of all nights in the year and I asked the watchman on the chance of eliciting some hopeful explanation, as I handed him a dram at the door, whether he had admitted at his gate any gentleman who had perceptibly been dining out. Yes, he said, at different times of the night, three, one lived in Fountain Court, and the other two lived in the lane, and he had seen them all go home. Again, the only other man who dwelt in the house of which my chambers formed a part had been in the country for some weeks, the night being so bad, sir, said the watchman, as he gave me back my glass, uncommon few have come in at my gate. Besides them three gentlemen that I have named, I don't call to mind another since about eleven o'clock, when a stranger asked for you. My uncle, I muttered. Yes. You saw him, sir. Yes, oh yes. Likewise the person with him. Person with him, I repeated. I judged the person to be with him, returned the watchman. The person stopped when he stopped to make an inquiry of me, and the person took this way when he took this way. What sort of a person? The watchman had not particularly noticed. He should say a working person, to the best of his belief. He had a dust-coloured kind of clothes on, under a dark coat. The watchman made no more light of the matter than I did, and naturally not having my reason for attaching weight to it. When I got rid of him, which I thought it well to do without prolonging explanations, my mind was much troubled by these two circumstances taken together, whereas they were easy of innocent solution apart, as for instance some diner out or diner at home, who had not gone near this watchman's gate, might have strayed to my staircase and dropped to sleep there, and my nameless visitor might have brought someone with him to show him the way. Still, joined, they had an ugly look to one as prone to distrust and fear as the changes of a few hours had made me. I lighted my fire, which burnt with a raw pale flare at that time of the morning, and fell into a doze before it. I seemed to have been dozing the whole night when the clock struck six, and there was a full hour and a half between me and daylight. I dozed again, now waking up uneasily, with prolix conversations about nothing in my ears, now making thunder of the wind in the chimney, at length falling off into a profound sleep from which the daylight woke me with a start. All this time I had never been able to consider my own situation, nor could I do so yet. I had not the power to attend to it. 
I was greatly dejected and distressed, but in an incoherent wholesale sort of way. As to forming any plan for the future, I could as soon have formed an elephant. When I opened the shutters and looked out at the wet wild morning, all of a leaden hue, when I walked from room to room, when I sat down again shivering before the fire, waiting for my laundress to appear, I thought how miserable I was, but I hardly knew why or how long I had been so, or on what day of the week I made the reflection, or even who I was that made it. At last the old woman and the niece came in, and the latter with a head not easily distinguishable from her dusty broom, and testified surprise at sight of me in the fire, to whom I imparted how my uncle had come in the night and was then asleep and how the breakfast preparations were to be modified accordingly. Then I washed and dressed while they knocked the furniture about and made a dust, and so, in a sort of dream or sleep-waking, I found myself sitting by the fire again, waiting for him to come to breakfast. By and by his door opened and he came out. I could not bring myself to bear the sight of him, and I thought he had a worse look by daylight. I do not even know said I, speaking low as he took his seat at the table. But what name to call you? I have given out that you are my uncle. That's it, dear boy. Call me uncle. You assumed some name, I suppose, on board ship. Yes, dear boy. I took the name of Provis. Do you mean to keep that name? Well, yes, dear boy. It's as good as another, unless you'd like another. What's your real name? I asked him in a whisper. Magwitch, he answered in the same tone. Christened Abel. What were you brought up to be, a warmint, dear boy? He answered quite seriously, and used the word as if it denoted some profession. When you came into the temple last night, said I, pausing to wonder whether that could really have been last night, which seemed so long ago. Yes, dear boy. When you came in at the gate and asked the watchman the way here, had you anyone with you? With me? No, dear boy. But there was someone there. I didn't take particular notice, he said dubiously, not knowing the ways of the place, but I think there was a person to come in along of me. Are you known in London? I hope not, said he, giving his neck a jerk with his forefinger that made me turn hot and sick. Were you known in London once? Not over and above, dear boy. I was in the provinces mostly. Were you tried in London? Which time? said he with a sharp look. The last time. He nodded. First know Mr. Jaggers that way. Jaggers was for me. It was on my lips to ask him what he was tried for, but he took up a knife and gave it a flourish, and with the words, And what I'd done is worked out and paid for, fell to at his breakfast. He ate in a ravenous way that was very disagreeable, and all his actions were uncouth, noisy, and greedy. Some of his teeth had failed him since I saw him eat on the marshes, and as he turned his food in his mouth, and turned his head sideways to bring his strongest fangs to bear upon it. He looked terribly like a hungry old dog. If I had begun with any appetite, he would have taken it away, and I should have sat, much as I did, repelled from him by an insurmountable aversion, and gloomily looking at the cloth. "'I'm a heavy grubber, dear boy,' he said, as a polite kind of apology when he made an end of his meal. "'But I always was.' If it had been in my constitution to be a lighter grubber, I might have got into lighter trouble. Similarly, I must have my smoke. When I was first hired out as a shepherd to other side of the world, it's my belief I should have turned into a melancholy mad sheep myself, if I hadn't had my smoke. As he said so, he got up from the table, and putting his hand into the breast of the pea-coat he wore, brought out a short black pipe and a handful of loose tobacco of the kind that is called negro head. Having filled his pipe, he put the surplus tobacco back again, as if his pocket were a drawer. Then he took a live coal from the fire with the tongs, and lighted his pipe at it. And then he turned round on the hearth rug, with his back to the fire, and went through his favourite action of holding out both hands for mine. And this, said he, dandling my hands up and down in his, as he puffed at his pipe, and this is a gentleman what I made, the real genuine one. It does me good for to look at you, Pip. All I stipulate is to stand by and look at you, dear boy. I released my hands as soon as I could, and found that I was beginning to slowly settle down to the contemplation of my condition. What I was chained to, and how heavily, became intelligible to me. 
as I heard his hoarse voice and sat looking up at his furrowed bald head with its iron grey hair at the sides. I mustn't see my gentleman a-footing it in the mire of the streets. There must be no mud on his boots. My gentleman must have horses. Pip, horses to ride and horses to drive, and horses for his servant to ride and drive as well. Shall colonists have their horses? And bloodens, if you please, good lord. And not my London gentleman? No, no, we'll show him another pair of shoes than that Pip, won't us? He took out of his pocket a great thick pocket book, bursting with papers, and tossed it on the table. There's something worth spending in that there book, dear boy. It's yourn. All I've got ain't mine. It's yourn. Don't be afraid to open it. There's more where that come from. I've come to the old country to see my gentleman spend his money like a gentleman. That'll be my pleasure. My pleasure will be for to see him do it and blast you all. He wound up, looking round the room and snapping his fingers once with a loud snap. Blast you, every one, from the judge in his wig to the colonists are stirring up the dust. I'll show a better gentleman and a whole kit and you put together. Stop, said I, almost in a frenzy of fear and dislike. I want to speak to you. I want to know what is to be done. I want to know how you are to be kept out of danger. How long are you going to stay? What projects do you have? Look here, Pip, said he, laying his hand on my arm in a suddenly altered and subdued manner. First of all, look ye here. I forgot myself half a minute ago. What I said was low. That's what it was, low. Looky here, Pip. Look over it. I ain't going to be low. First, I resumed, half groaning, what precautions can be taken against your being recognised and seized? No, dear boy, he said in the same tone as before. That don't go first. Lowness goes first. I ain't took so many a year to make you a gentleman, not without knowing what's due to him. Looky here, Pip. I was low. That's what I was. Low. Look over it, dear boy. Some sense of the grimly ludicrous moved me to a fretful laugh as I replied. <laughs> I have looked over it. In heaven's name, don't harp upon it. Yes, but looky here, he persisted. Dear boy, I ain't come so fur. Not for to be low. Now go on, dear boy. You was a saying. How are you to be guarded from the danger you have incurred? Well, dear boy, the danger ain't so great, without I was informed again, the danger ain't so much to signify. There's Jaggers, there's Wemmick, and there's you. Who else is there to inform? Is there no chance person who might identify you in the street? said I. Well, he returned, there ain't many. Nor yet I don't intend to advertise myself in the newspapers by the name of A.M. come back from Botany Bay, and years have rolled away, and who's to gain by it? Still, look here, Pip. If the danger had been fifty times as great, I should have come to see you, mind you, just the same. And how long do you remain? How long? said he, taking his black pipe from his mouth and dropping his jaw as he stared at me. I'm not a going back. I've come for good. Where are you to live? said I. What is to be done with you? Where will you be safe? Dear boy, he returned, there's disguise in wigs can be bought for money and there's hair powder and spectacles and black clothes, shorts and what not. Others has done it safe afore, and what others has done afore, others can do again. As to the where and how of living, dear boy, give me your own opinions on it. You take it smoothly now, said I, but you were very serious last night when you swore it was death. And so I swear it is death, said he, putting his pipe back in his mouth, and death by the rope in the open street not far from this. And it's serious that you should fully understand it to be so. What then, when that's once done? Here I am. To go back now would be as bad as to stand ground. Worse. Besides, Pip, I'm here because I've meant it by you years and years. As to what I dare, I'm an old bird now, and has dared all manner of traps since he was fledged, and I'm not afraid to perch upon a scarecrow. If there's death hid inside of it, there is. Let him come out, and I'll face him and then I'll believe in him and not afore. And now let me have a look at my gentleman again. Once more he took me by both hands and surveyed me with an air of admiring proprietorship, smoking with great complacency all the while. It appeared to me that I could do no better than secure him some quiet lodging hard by, of which he might take possession when Herbert returned, whom I expected in two or three days. That the secret must be confided to Herbert as a matter of unavoidable necessity, 
even if I could have put the immense relief I should derive from sharing it with him out of the question. It was plain to me, but it was no means so plain to Mr. Provis, I resolved to call him by that name, who reserved his consent to Herbert's participation until he should have seen him and formed a favourable judgment of his physiognomy. And even then, dear boy, said he, pulling a greasy little class black testament out of his pocket, we shall have him on his oath. To state that my terrible patron carried this little black book about the world solely to swear people on in cases of emergency would be to state what I never established, but this I can say, that I never knew him put it to any other use. The book itself had the appearance of having been stolen from some court of justice, and perhaps his knowledge of its antecedents, combined with his own experience in that wise, gave him a reliance on its powers as a sort of legal spell or charm. On this first occasion of his producing it, I recalled how he had made me swear fidelity in the churchyard long ago, and how he had described himself last night as always swearing to his resolutions in his solitude. As he was at present dressed in a seafaring slop suit, in which he looked as if he had some parrots and cigars to dispose of, I next discussed with him what dress he should wear. He cherished an extraordinary belief in the virtues of shorts as a disguise, and had in his own mind sketched a dress for himself that would have made him something between a dean and a dentist. It was with considerable difficulty that I won him over to the assumption of a dress more like a prosperous farmer's and we arranged that he should cut his hair close and wear a little powder. Lastly, as he had not yet been seen by the laundress or her niece, he was to keep himself out of their view until his change of dress was made. It would seem a simple matter to decide on these precautions, but in my days not to say distracted state, it took so long that I did not get out to further them until two or three in the afternoon. He was to remain shut up in the chambers while I was gone, and was on no account to open the door. There being to my knowledge a respectable lodging house in Essex Street, the back of which looked into the temple, and was almost within hail of my windows, I first of all repaired to that house, and was so fortunate as to secure the second floor for my uncle, Mr. Provis. I then went from shop to shop, making such purchases as were necessary to the change of his appearance. This business transacted, I turned my face on my own account to Little Britain. Mr. Jaggers was at his desk, but seeing me enter, got up immediately and stood before his fire. "'Now, Pip,' said he, "'be careful.' "'I will, sir,' I returned, for coming along I had thought well of what I was going to say. "'Don't commit yourself,' said Mr. Jaggers, "'and don't commit anyone. You understand, anyone. Don't tell me anything. I don't want to know anything. I am not curious.' Of course I saw that he knew the man was come. I merely want, Mr. Jaggers, said I, to assure myself what I have been told is true. I have no hope of its being untrue, but at least I may verify it. Mr. Jaggers nodded. But did you say told or informed? He asked me with his head on one side, and not looking at me, but looking in a listening way at the floor. Told would seem to imply verbal communication. You can't have verbal communication with a man in New South Wales, you know. I will say informed, Mr. Jaggers. Good. I have been informed by a person named Abel Magwitch that he is the benefactor so long unknown to me. That is the man, said Mr. Jaggers, in New South Wales. And only he, said I. And only he, said Mr. Jaggers. I am not so unreasonable, sir, as to think you at all responsible for my mistakes and wrong conclusions, but I always supposed it was Miss Havisham. As you say, Pip, returned Mr. Jaggers, turning his eyes upon me coolly, and taking a bite at his forefinger. I am not responsible for that. And yet it looks so like it, sir, I pleaded with a downcast heart. Not a particle of evidence, Pip, said Mr. Jaggers, shaking his head and gathering up his skirts. Take nothing on its looks, take everything on evidence. There's no better rule. I have no more to say, said I with a sigh, after standing silent for a little while. I have verified my information, and there's an end. And Magwitch in New South Wales, having at last disclosed himself, said Mr. Jaggers, you will comprehend, Pip, how rigidly throughout my communication with you I have always adhered to the strict line of fact. There has never been the least departure from the strict line of fact. You are quite aware of that. Quite, sir. 
I communicated to Magridge in New South Wales when he first wrote to me from New South Wales the caution that he must not expect me to ever deviate from the strict line of fact. I also communicated to him another caution. He appeared to me to have obscurely hinted in his letter at some distant idea he had of seeing you in England here. I cautioned him that I must hear no more of that, that he was not at all likely to obtain a pardon, that he was expatriated for the term of his natural life, and that his presenting himself in this country would be an act of felony, rendering him liable to the extreme penalty of the law. I gave Magridge that caution, said Mr. Jaggers, looking hard at me. I wrote it to New South Wales. He guided himself by it, no doubt. No doubt, said I. I have been informed by Wemmick, pursued Mr. Jaggers, still looking hard at me, that he has received a letter under date Portsmouth from a colonist in the name of Purvis, or, or Provis, I suggested. Or Provis, thank you, Pip. Perhaps it is Provis. Perhaps you know it's Provis. Yes, said I. You know it's Provis, a letter under the date Portsmouth, from a colonist of the name of Provis, asking for the particulars of your address on behalf of Magwitch. Wemmick sent him the particulars, I understand, by return of post. Probably it is through Provis that you have received the explanation of Magwitch in New South Wales. It came through Provis, I replied. Good day, Pip, said Mr. Jaggers, offering his hand. Glad to have seen you. In writing by post to Magwitch in New South Wales, or in communicating with him through Provis, have the goodness to mention that the particulars and vouchers of our long account shall be sent to you, together with a balance, for there is still a balance remaining. Good day, Pip. We shook hands, and he looked hard at me as long as he could see me. I turned at the door, and he was still looking hard at me, while the two vile casts on the shelf seemed to be trying to get their eyelids open and to force out of their swollen throats. Oh, what a man he is! Wemmick was out, and though he had been at his desk, he could have done nothing for me. I went straight back to the temple where I found the terrible Provis drinking rum and water and smoking Negro Head in safety. Next day the clothes I had ordered all came home, and he put them on. Whatever he put on became him less, it dismally seemed to me, than what he had worn before. To my thinking there was something in him that made it hopeless to attempt to disguise him. The more I dressed him, and the better I dressed him, the more he looked like the slouching fugitive on the marshes. This effect on my anxious fancy was partly referable, no doubt, to his old face and manner of growing more familiar to me, but I believe too that he dragged one of his legs as if there was still a weight of iron on it, and that from head to foot there was convict in the very grain of the man. The influences of his solitary hut life were upon him besides and gave him a savage air that no dress could tame. Add to these were the influences of his subsequent branded life among men, and crowning all his consciousness that he was dodging and hiding now. In all his ways of sitting and standing, and eating and drinking, of brooding about in a high-shouldered reluctant style, of taking out his great horn-handled jackknife, of wiping it on his legs and cutting his food, of lifting light glasses and cups to his lips as if they were clumsy pannikins, of chopping a wedge off his bread and soaking it up with the last fragments of gravy round and round his plate, as if to make the most of an allowance, and then drying his finger ends on it and then swallowing it, in these ways and a thousand other small nameless instances arising every minute of the day, there was prisoner, felon, bondsman, plain as plain could be. It had been his own idea to wear that touch of powder, and I conceded the powder after overcoming the shorts, but I can compare the effect of it when on to nothing but the probable effect of rouge upon the dead. So awful was the manner in which everything in him that it was most desirable to repress started through that thin layer of pretense, and seemed to come blazing out at the crown of his head. It was abandoned as soon as we tried and he wore his grizzled hair cut short. Words cannot tell what a sense I had at the same time of the dreadful mystery that he was to me. When he fell asleep of an evening with his knotted hands clenching the sides of the easy chair, and his bald head tattooed with deep wrinkles falling forward on his breast, I would sit and look at him, wondering what he had done, and loading him with all the crimes in the calendar, until the impulse was powerful on me to start up and fly from him. 
every hour so increased my abhorrence of him that i even think i might have yielded to this impulse in the first agonies of being so haunted notwithstanding all he had done for me and the risk he ran but for the knowledge that herbert must soon come back once i actually did start out of bed in the night and begin to dress myself in my worst clothes hurriedly intending to leave him there with everything else i possessed and enlist for india as a private soldier i doubt if a ghost could have been more terrible to me up in those lonely rooms in the long evenings and long nights with the wind and rain always rushing by a ghost could not have been taken and hanged on my account and the consideration that he could be and the dread that he would be were no small addition to my horrors when he was not asleep or playing a complicated kind of patience with a ragged pack of cards of his own a game that i never saw before or since in which he recorded his winnings by sticking his jackknife into the table and when he was not engaged in either of these pursuits he would ask me to read to him foreign language dear boy while i complied he not comprehending a single word would stand before the fire surveying me with the air of an exhibitor and i would see him between the fingers of the hand with which i shaded my face appealing in dumb show to the furniture to take notice of my proficiency the imaginary student pursued by the mishappened creature he had impiously made was not more wretched than i pursued by the creature who had made me and recoiling from him with a stronger repulsion the more he admired me and the fonder he was of me this is written of i am sensible as if it had lasted a year it lasted about five days expecting herbert all the time i dared not go out except when i took provis for an airing after dark at length one evening when dinner was over and i had dropped into a slumber quite worn out for my nights had been agitated and my rest broken by fearful dreams i was roused by the welcome footstep on the staircase provis who had been asleep too staggered up at the noise i made and in an instant saw his jackknife shining in his hand quiet it's herbert i said and herbert came bursting in with the airy freshness of six hundred miles of france upon him handel my dear fellow how are you and again how are you and again how are you i seem to have been gone a twelve month why so i must have been for you have grown quite thin and pale handel my halloa i beg your pardon he was stopped in his running on and in his shaking hands with me by seeing provis provis regarding him with a fixed attention was slowly putting up his jackknife and groping in another pocket for something else herbert my dear friend said i shutting the double doors while herbert stood staring and wondering something very strange has happened this is a visitor of mine it's all right dear boy said provis coming forward with his little clasped black book and then addressing himself to herbert take it in your right hand lord strike you dead on the spot if ever you split in any way somever kiss it do as he wishes i said to herbert so herbert looking at me with a friendly uneasiness and amazement complied and provis immediately shaking hands with him said now you're on your oath you know and never believe me on mine if pip shan't make a gentleman of you chapter forty one In vain should I attempt to describe the astonishment and disquiet of Herbert when he and I and Provis sat down before the fire, and I recounted the whole of the secret. Enough that I saw my own feelings reflected in Herbert's face, and not least among them my repugnance towards the man who had done so much for me. What would alone have set a division between that man and us, if there had been no other dividing circumstance, was his triumph in my story saving his troublesome sense of having been low on one occasion since his return on which point he began to hold forth to herbert the moment my revelation was finished he had no perception of the possibility of my finding any fault with my good fortune his boast that he had made me a gentleman and that he had come to see me support the character on his ample resources was made for me quite as much as for himself and that it was a highly agreeable boast to both of us and that we must both be very proud of it was a conclusion quite established in his own mind now look here pip's comrade he said to herbert after having discoursed for some time 
I know very well that once since I come back, for half a minute, I've been low. I said to Pip, I knowed as I'd been low, but don't you fret yourself on that score. I ain't made Pip a gentleman, and Pip ain't going to make you a gentleman, not for me to know what's due to you both, dear boy, and Pip's comrade. You two may count upon me always, having a genteel muzzle on. Muzzled I have been since that half a minute when I was betrayed into lowness, and muzzled I am at the present time. Muzzled I will ever be. Herbert said, certainly, but looked as if there were no specific consolation in this, and he remained perplexed and dismayed. We were anxious for the time when he would go to his lodging and leave us together, but he was evidently jealous of leaving us together, and sat late. It was midnight before I took him round to Essex Street, and saw him safely in at his own dark door. When it closed upon him, I experienced the first moment of relief I had known since the night of his arrival. Never quite free from an uneasy remembrance of the man on the stairs, I had always looked about me in taking my guest out after dark, and in bringing him back, and I looked about me now. Difficult as it is in a large city to avoid the suspicion of being watched when the mind is conscious of danger in that regard, I could not persuade myself that any of the people within sight cared about my movements. The few who were passing passed on their several ways, and the street was empty when I turned back into the temple. Nobody had come out at the gate with us, nobody went in at the gate with me. As I crossed by the fountain I saw his lighted back windows looking bright and quiet and when I stood for a few moments in the doorway of the building where I lived before going up the stairs, Garden Court was as still and lifeless as the staircase was when I ascended it. Herbert received me with open arms, and I have never felt before so blessedly what it is to have a friend. When he had spoken some sound words of sympathy and encouragement, we sat down to consider the question, what was to be done? The chair that Provis had occupied still remaining where it had stood, for he had a barrack way with him of hanging about one spot, in one unsettled manner, and going through one round of observances with his pipe and his negro head and his jackknife and his pack of cards, and what not, as if it were all put down for him on a slate. I say his chair remaining where it had stood, Herbert unconsciously took it, but next moment started out of it, pushed it away and took another. He had no occasion to say after that that he had conceived an aversion for my patron neither had I occasion to confess my own. We interchanged that confidence without shaping a syllable. What, I said to Herbert when he was safe in another chair, what is to be done? My poor dear Handel, he replied, holding his head, I am too stunned to think. So was I, Herbert, when the blow first fell. Still, something must be done. He is intent upon various new expenses, horses and carriages, and lavish appearance of all kinds. He must be stopped somehow. You mean that you can't accept? How can I? I interposed, as Herbert paused. Think of him. Look at him. An involuntary shudder passed over both of us. Yet I am afraid the dreadful truth is, Herbert, that he is attached to me, strongly attached to me. Was there ever such a fate? My poor dear Handel, Herbert repeated. Then, said I, after all, stopping short here, never taking another penny from him, think what I owe him already. Then again I am heavily in debt, very heavily for me, who now have no expectations, and I have been bred to no calling, and I am fit for nothing. Well, 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 Herbert remonstrated, don't say fit for nothing. What am I fit for? I only know one thing that I am fit for, that is to go for a soldier, and I might have gone, my dear Herbert, but for the prospect of taking counsel with your friendship and affection. Of course I broke down there, and of course Herbert, beyond seizing a warm grip of my hand, pretended not to know it. Anyhow, my dear Handel, he said presently, soldiering won't do. If you were to renounce this patronage and these favours, I suppose you would do so with some faint hope of one day repaying what you have already had. Not very strong, that hope, if you went soldiering. Besides, it's absurd. You would be infinitely better in Clarica's house, small as it is. I am working up towards a partnership, you know. Poor fellow, he little suspected with whose money. But there is another question, said Herbert. This is an ignorant, determined man, who has long had one fixed idea. More than that, he seems to me, I may misjudge him, to be a man of a desperate and fierce character. 
I know he is, I returned. Let me tell you what evidence I have seen of it. And I told him what I had not mentioned in my narrative of that encounter with the other convict. See then, said Herbert, think of this. He comes here at the peril of his life for the realisation of his fixed idea. In the moment of realisation, after all his toil and waiting, you cut the ground from under his feet, destroy his idea and make his gains worthless to him. Do you see nothing that he might do under the disappointment? I have seen it, Herbert, and dreamed of it ever since the fatal night of his arrival. Nothing has been in my thoughts so distinctly as his putting himself in the way of being taken. Then you may rely upon it, said Herbert, that there would be great danger of his doing it. That is his power over you as long as he remains in England, and that would be his reckless course if you forsook him. I was so struck by the horror of this idea, which had weighed upon me from the first, and the working out of which would make me regard myself in some sort as his murderer, that I could not rest in my chair, but began pacing to and fro. I said to Herbert, meanwhile, that even if Provis were recognised and taken, in spite of himself, I should be wretched as the cause, however innocently. Yes, even though I was so wretched in having him at large and near me, and even though I would far rather have worked at the forge all the days of my life than I would ever have come to this, but there was no staving off the question, what was to be done? The first and main thing to be done, said Herbert, is to get him out of England. You will have to go with him, and then he may be induced to go. But get him where I will. Could I prevent his coming back? My good Handel, it is not obvious that with Newgate in the next street there must be a far greater hazard in your breaking your mind to him and making him reckless here than elsewhere. If a pretext to get him away could be made out of that other convict or out of anything else in his life now. There again, said I, stopping before Herbert with my open hands held out, as if they contained the desperation of the case. I know nothing of his life. It has almost made me mad to sit here of a night and see him before me, so bound up with my fortunes and misfortunes, and yet so unknown to me, except as the miserable wretch who terrified me two days in my childhood. Herbert got up and linked his arm in mine, and we slowly walked to and fro together, studying the carpet. Handel, said Herbert, stopping, you feel convinced that you can take no further benefits from him, do you? Fully. Surely you would, too, if you were in my place. And you feel convinced that you must break with him. Herbert, can you ask me? And you have, and are bound to have, that tenderness for the life he has risked on your account, that you must save him, if possible, from throwing it away. Then you must get him out of England before you stir a finger to extricate yourself. That done, extricate yourself in heaven's name, and we'll see it out together, dear old boy. It was a comfort to shake hands upon it and walk up and down again, with only that done. Now, Herbert, said I, with reference to gaining some knowledge of his history, there is but one way that I know of, I must ask him point blank. Yes, ask him, said Herbert, when we sit at breakfast in the morning, for he had said on taking leave of Herbert that he would come to breakfast with us. With this project formed, we went to bed. I had the wildest dreams concerning him, and woke unrefreshed. I woke, too, to recover the fear which I had lost in the night of his being found out as a return transport. Waking, I never lost that fear. He came round at the appointed time, took out his jackknife and sat down to his meal. He was full of plans for his gentleman's coming out strong and like a gentleman, and urged me to begin speedily upon the pocket-book which he had left in my possession. He considered the chambers in his own lodging as temporary residences, and advised me to look out at once for a fashionable crib near Hyde Park, in which he could have a shakedown. When he had made an end of his breakfast, and was wiping his knife on his leg, I said to him without a word of preface, After you were gone last night, I told my friend of the struggle that the soldiers found you engaged in on the marshes when we came up. You remember? Remember? said he. I think so. We want to know something about that man and about you. It is strange to know no more about either, and particularly you, than I was able to tell last night. Is not this as good a time as another for our knowing more? Well, he said, after consideration, you're on your oath, you know, Pip's comrade. Assuredly, replied Herbert. As to anything I say, you know, he insisted, the oath applies to all. 
I understand it to do so. Look here, whatever is done, I worked out and paid for, he insisted again. So be it. He took out his black pipe and was going to fill it with negro head, when looking at the tangle of tobacco in his hand, he seemed to think it might perplex the thread of his narrative. He put it back again, stuck his pipe in a buttonhole of his coat, and spread a hand on each knee, and after turning an angry eye on the fire for a few silent moments, he looked round at us and said what follows. Chapter 42 Dear boy, and Pip's comrade, I'm not going for to tell you my life like a song or a story book, but to give it to you short and handy. I'll put it at once into a mouthful of English. In jail, out of jail. In jail, out of jail. In jail and out of jail. There, you've got it. That's my life, pretty much. Down to such times as I got shipped off and out of Pip stood my friend. I've been done everything too, pretty well, except hanged. I've been locked up as much as the silver tea kittle. I've been carted here and carted there, and put out of this town and put out of that town, and stuck in the stocks and whipped and worried and drove. I've no more notion where I was born than you have, if so much. I've first become aware of myself down in Essex, a thieving turnips for my living. Someone had run away from me, a man, a tinker, and he took the fire with him and he left me very cold. I knowed my name to be Magwitch, christened Abel. How did I know it? Much as I'd knowed the birds' names in the edges to be a chaffinch, a sparrow, thrush. I might have thought it was all lies together. Only as the birds' names came out true, I suppose mine did. So far as I could find, there weren't a soul that see young Abel Magwitch with as little on him as in him, but what caught fright at him, and either drove him off or took him up. I was took up, took up, took up, to that extent that I regularly growed up, took up. That is the way it was, that when I was a ragged little critter, as much to be pitied as ever, I see, not that I looked in the glass, for there weren't many insides of furnished houses known to me, I got the name of being hardened. This is a terrible hardened one, they say, to prison visitors picking out me. May be said to live in jails, this boy. Then they looked at me, and I looked at them, and they measured my head, some on them, they had a better measured my stomach, and others on them give me tracts that I couldn't read, and made me speeches that I couldn't understand. They always went on again me about the devil, but what the devil was I to do? I must put something in me stomach, mustn't I? Howsoever, I'm a getting low, and I know what's due, dear boy and Pip's comrade. Don't you be afeard of me being low. Tramping, begging, thieving, working, Sometimes when I could, though that weren't as often as you may think, till you put the question whether you would have been over ready to give me work yourselves. Bit of a poacher, bit of a labourer, bit of a wagoner, bit of a haymaker, bit of a hawker, bit of most things that don't pay and lead to trouble. I got to be a man. A deserting soldier in a traveller's rest, what lay hid up to the chin under a lot of taters, learned me to read, and a travelling giant what signed his name at a penny a time, learned me to write. I weren't locked up as often now as formerly, but I wore out my good share of key metal still. At Epsom Races, a matter of over twenty years ago, I got acquainted with a man whose skull I'd crack with his poker like the claw of a lobster, if I'd got it on this hob. His right name was Compeyson. And that's a man, dear boy, what you see me a-pounding in the ditch, according to what you truly told your comrade, after I was gone last night. He set up for a gentleman, this Compeyson, and he'd been to a public boarding school, and he had learning. He was a smooth one to talk, and was a dab at the ways of gentlefolks. He was good-looking, too. It was the night afore the great race when I found him on the heath in a booth that I'd knowed on. Him and some more was a-sitting among the tables when I went in, and the landlord, which had a knowledge of me and was a sporting one, called him out and said, I think this is a man that might suit you, meaning I was. Compeyson, he looks at me very noticing, and I look at him. He has a watch and a chain and a ring and a breast pin and a handsome suit of clothes. To judge from appearances, you're out of luck, says Compeyson to me. Yes, master, and I've never been in it much. I'd come out of Kingston jail last on a vagrancy committal. Not but what it might have been for something else, but it weren't. Luck changes, says Compeyson. Perhaps yours is going to change. 
I says, I hope it may be so, there's room. What can you do, says Compeyson? Eat and drink, I says, if you'll find the materials. Compeyson laughed, looked at me again, very noticing. Give me five shillings and appointed me for the next night. Same place. I went to Compeyson next night, same place, and Compeyson took me on to be his man and partner. And what was Compeyson's business in which we was to go partners? Compeyson's business was the swindling, and writing, forging, stolen banknote passing, and such like. All sorts of traps as Compeyson could set with his head, and keep his own legs out of, and get the profits from, and let another man in for, was Compeyson's business. He'd no more heart than an iron file. He was as cold as death, and he had the head of the devil aforementioned. There was another in with Compeyson, as was called Arthur, not as so christened, but as a surname. He was in a decline, and was a shadow to look at. Him and Compeyson had been in a bad thing with a rich lady some years afore, and they'd made a pot of money by it. But Compeyson betted and gained, and he'd have run through the king's taxes. So Arthur was a dying, and a dying poor, and with the horrors on him. And Compeyson's wife, which Compeyson kicked mostly, was having pity on him when she could, and Compeyson was having pity on nothing and nobody. I might have took a warning by Arthur, but I didn't, and I won't pretend I was particular, for where'd be the good on it, dear boy and comrade? So I begun with Compeyson, and a poor tool I was in his hands. Arthur lived at the top of Compeyson's house, over nigh Brentford it was, and Compeyson kept a careful account again him for board and lodging, in case he should ever get better to work it out. But Arthur soon settled the account. The second or third time as ever I see him, he come a-tearing down into Compeyson's parlour late at night, only in a flannel gown, with his hair all in a sweat, and he says to Compeyson's wife, Sally, she really is upstairs along of me now, and I can't get rid of her. She's all in white, he says, with white flowers in her hair, and she's awful mad, and she's got a shroud hanging over her arm, and she says she'll put it on me at five in the morning. Says Compeyson, why, you fool, don't you know she's got a living body? And how should she be up there without coming through the door or in at the window and up the stairs? I don't know how she's there, says Arthur, shivering dreadful with the horrors, but she's standing in the corner at the foot of the bed, awful mad, and over where her heart's broke, you broke it, there's drops of blood. Compeyson spoke hardy, but he was always a coward. Go up along this drivelling sick man, he says to his wife, and Magwitch, lend her a hand, will you? But he never come nigh himself. Compeyson's wife and me took him up to bed again, and he raved most dreadful. Why, look at her, he cries out. She's a-shaking the shroud at me. Don't you see her? Look at her eyes. Ain't it awful to see her so mad? Next, he cries, she'll put it on me, and then I'm done for. Take it away from her. Take it away. And then he catched hold of us, kept on talking to her, and answering of her, till I half believed I'd see her myself. Compeyson's wife, being used to him, give him some liquor to get the horrors off and by and by he quieted. Oh, she's gone, as her keeper been for her, he says. Yes, says Compeyson's wife. Did you tell him to lock her in and bar her in? Yes, and to take that ugly thing away from her? Yes, yes, all right. You're a good critter, he says. Don't leave me, whatever you do, and thank you. He rested pretty quiet till it might want a few minutes of five. Then he starts up with a scream and screams out, Here she is, she's got the shroud again. She's unfolding it. She's coming out of the corner. She's coming to the bed. Hold me, both of you. One of each side. Don't let her touch me with it. Ah, she missed me that time. Don't let her throw it over my shoulders. Don't let her lift me up to get it round me. She's lifting me up. Keep me down. And he lifted himself up hard and was dead. Compeyson took it easy as a good riddance for both sides. Him and me were soon busy. And first he swore me, being ever artful, on my own book. This here little black book, dear boy, what I swore your comrade on. Not to go into the things that Compeyson planned and I done, which would take a week. I'll simply say to you, dear boy and Pip's comrade, that that man got me into such nets as made me his black slave. I was always in debt to him, always under his thumb, always a-working, always a-getting into danger. He was younger than me, but he'd got craft and he'd got learning, and he overmatched me five hundred times told and no mercy. My missus, as I had the hard time, what? Stop, though, no, I ain't brought her in. 
He looked about him in a confused way, as if he had lost his place in the book of his remembrance, and he turned his face to the fire, and spread his hands broader on his knees, and lifted them off and put them on again. "'There ain't no need to go into it,' he said, looking round once more. "'The time with Compton was almost as hard a time as I ever had. That said, all said. Did I tell you I was tried alone for misdemeanour while with Compton? I answered, no. Well, he said, I was and got convicted. As to took up on suspicion, that was twice or three times in the four or five year that it lasted. But evidence was wanting. At last me and Compton was both committed for felony, on the charge of putting stolen notes in circulation. And there were other charges behind. Compton says to me, separate defences, no communication. And that was all. And I was so miserable poor that I sold all the clothes I had except what hung on my back afore I could get jaggers. When we was put in the dock, I noticed first of all what a gentleman Compenson looked, with his curly hair and his black clothes and his white pocket handkerchief, and what a common sort of wretch I looked. When the prosecution opened and the evidence was put short aforehand, I noticed how heavy it all bore on me, and how light on him. When the evidence was given the box, I noticed how it was always me that had come forward, and could be swore to how it was always me that the money had been paid to, how it was always me that had seemed to work the thing and get the profit. But when the defence came on, I could see the plan plainer. For, says the counsellor for Compeson, my lord and gentlemen, here you as afore you, side by side, two persons as your eyes can separate wide. One the younger, well brought up, who will be spoke to as such. One the elder, ill brought up, who will be spoke to as such. One the younger, seldom if ever seen in these here transactions, and only suspected, t'other the elder, always seen in em, and always with his guilt brought home. Can you doubt if there is but one in it? Which is the one, and if there's two in it, which is the much worse one? And such like. And when it come to character, weren't it Compeson as he had been to school, and weren't it his schoolfellows as was in this position, and in that, and weren't it him as had been knowed by witnesses in such clubs and societies, and note to his disadvantage? And weren't it me as had been tried before, and had been knowed up hill and down dale, in bridewells and lock-ups? And when it came to speech-making, weren't it Compeson that could speak to him with his face dropping every now and then into his white pocket handkerchief? Ah, and with verses in his speech too, and weren't it me as could only say, Gentlemen, this man at my side is a most precious rascal. And when the verdict come, weren't it Compeson as was recommended to mercy on account of good character and bad company, and giving up all the information he could again me, and weren't it me as never got a word but guilty? And when I says to Compeson, out of this court I'll smash that face of yourn, ain't it Compeson as prays to the judge to be protected, and gets two turnkeys stood betwixt us, and when we're sentenced ain't it him that's get seven year, and me fourteen? And ain't it him as the judge is sorry for, because he might a done so well, and ain't it me as the judge perceives to be an old offender, of violent passion, likely to come to worse? He had worked himself into a state of great excitement, but he checked it, took two or three short breaths, and swallowed as often, and stretching out his hand towards me said in a reassuring manner, I ain't going to be low, dear boy. He had so heated himself that he took out his handkerchief and wiped his face and head and neck and hands before he could go on. I'd said to Compeson that I'd smash that face of his, and I swore Lord smash mine too to do it. We was in the same prison ship, but I couldn't get at him for long enough, though I tried. At last I come behind him and hit him on the cheek to turn him round and get a smashing one at him when I was seen and seized. The black hole of that ship weren't a strong one to a judge of black holes that could swim and dive. I escaped to the shore, and I was hiding among the graves there, envying them as was in them, and all over, when I first seen my boy. He regarded me with a look of affection that made him almost abhorrent to me again, though I had felt great pity for him. By my boy I was given to understand as Compison was out on them marshes too. Upon my soul I half believed he escaped in his terror to get quit of me, not knowing it was me as had got ashore. I hunted him down, I smashed his face, and now, says I, as the worst thing I can do, caring nothing for myself, I'll drag you back, 
and I'd have swum off, towing him by the hair, if it had come to that, and I'd have got him aboard without the soldiers. Of course he'd much the best of it to the last. His character was so good. He had escaped when he was made half wild by me and my murderous intentions, and his punishment was light. I was put in irons, brought to trial again, and sent for life. I didn't stop for life, dear boy, and Pip's comrade, being here. He wiped himself again as he had done before, and then slowly took his tangle of tobacco from his pocket, and plucked his pipe from his buttonhole, and slowly filled it, and began to smoke. "'Is he dead?' I asked, after a silence. "'Is who dead, dear boy? Compeyson. "'He hopes I am, if he's alive, you may be sure, with a fierce look. "'I never heard no more of him.' "'Herbert had been writing with his pencil in the cover of a book. "'He softly pushed the book over to me, as Provis stood smoking with his eyes on the fire, "'and I read in it, "'Young Havisham's name was Arthur.' Compison is the man who professed to be Miss Havisham's lover. I shut the book and nodded slightly to Herbert, and put the book by, but we neither of us said anything, and both looked at Provis as he stood smoking by the fire. Chapter 43 Why should I pause to ask how much of my shrinking from Provis might be traced to Estella? Why should I loiter on my road to compare the state of mind in which I had tried to rid myself of the stain of prison before meeting her at the coach office, with the state of mind in which I now reflected on the abyss between Estella in her pride and beauty and the returned transport whom I harboured? The road would be none the smoother for it, the end would be none the better for it, he would not be helped nor I extenuated. A new fear had been engendered in my mind by his narrative, or rather his narrative had given form and purpose to the fear that was already there. If Compeyson were alive and should discover his return, I could hardly doubt the consequence, that Compeyson stood in mortal fear of him. Neither of the two could know much better than I, and that any such man as that man had been described to would hesitate to release himself for good from a dreaded enemy by the safe means of becoming an informer was scarcely to be imagined. Never had I breathed, and never would I breathe, or so I resolved, a word to Estella of Provis. But I said to Herbert that before I could go abroad I must see both Estella and Miss Havisham. This was when we were left alone on the night of the day when Provis told us his story. I resolved to go out to Richmond next day, and I went. On presenting myself at Mrs. Brandley's, Estella's maid was called to tell that Estella had gone into the country. Where? To Sartis' house, as usual. Not as usual, I said, for she had never yet gone there without me. When was she coming back? There was an air of reservation in the answer which increased my perplexity, and the answer was that her maid believed she was only coming back at all for a little while. I could make nothing of this, except that it was meant that I should make nothing of it and I went home again in complete discomfiture. Another night consultation with Herbert, after Provis was gone home, I always took him home, and always looked well about me, led us to the conclusion that nothing should be said about going abroad until I came back from Miss Havisham's. In the meantime, Herbert and I were to consider separately what would be best to say, whether we should devise any pretense of being afraid that he was under suspicious observation, or whether I, who had never yet been abroad, should propose an expedition. We both knew that I had but to propose anything and he would consent. We agreed that his remaining many days in this present hazard was not to be thought of. Next day I had the meanness to feign that I was under a binding promise to go down to Joe, but I was capable of almost any meanness towards Joe or his name. Provis was to be strictly careful while I was gone, and Herbert was to take the charge of him that I had taken. I was to be absent only one night, and on my return the gratification of his impatience for my starting as a gentleman on a greater scale was to be begun. It occurred to me then, and as afterwards I found to Herbert also, that he might be best got away across the water, on that pretense, as to make purchases or the like, having thus cleared the way for my expedition to Miss Havisham's, I set off by the early morning coach, before it was yet light, 
and I was out on the open country road when the day come creeping on, halting and whimpering and shivering, and wrapped in patches of cloud and rags of mist, like a beggar. When we drove up to the Blue Boar after a drizzly ride, whom should I see come out of the gateway, toothpick in hand, to look at the coach, but Bentley Drummle? As he pretended not to see me, I pretended not to see him. It was a very lame pretense on both sides. The lamer because we both went into the coffee-room where he had just finished his breakfast, and where I ordered mine. It was poisonous to me to see him in the town, for I very well knew why he had come there. Pretending to read a smeary newspaper long out of date, which had nothing half so legible in its local news as the foreign matter of coffee, pickles, fish, sauces, gravy and melted butter, and wine with which it was sprinkled all over, as if it had taken the measles in a highly irregular form. I sat at my table while he stood before the fire. By degrees it became an enormous injury to me that he stood before the fire, and I got up, determined to have my share of it. I had to put my hand behind his legs for the poker when I went up to the fireplace to stir the fire, but still pretended not to know him. "'Is this a cut?' said Mr. Drummle. "'Oh,' said I, poker in hand, "'it's you, is it? How do you do? I was wondering who it was who kept the fire off.' With that I poked tremendously, and having done so, planted myself side by side with Mr. Drummle, my shoulders squared and my back to the fire. "'You have just come down,' said Mr. Drummle, edging me a little away with his shoulder. "'Yes,' said I, edging him a little away with my shoulder. "'Beastly place,' said Drummle. "'You're part of the country, I think.' "'Yes,' I assented. "'I'm told it's very like your Shropshire.' "'Not in the least like it,' said Drummle. Here Mr. Drummle looked at his boots, and I looked at mine. And then Mr. Drummle looked at my boots, and I looked at his. "'Have you been here long?' I asked, determined not to yield an inch of the fire. "'Long enough to be tired of it,' returned Drummle, pretending to yawn, but equally determined. "'Do you stay here long?' "'Can't say,' answered Mr. Drummle. "'Do you?' "'Can't say,' said I. I felt here, through a tingling in my blood, that if Mr. Drummle's shoulder had claimed another hair's breadth of room, I should have jerked him into the window, equally that if my own shoulder had urged a similar claim, Mr. Drummle would have jerked me into the nearest box. He whistled a little, so did I. "'Large tract of marsh is about here, I believe,' said Drummle. "'Yes, what of that?' said I. Mr. Drummle looked at me, and then at my boots, and then said, "'Oh!' and laughed. "'Are you amused, Mr. Drummle?' No, said he, not particularly. I'm going out for a ride in the saddle. I mean to explore those marshes for amusement. Out of the way villages there, they tell me. Curious little public houses and smithies and that. Waiter! Yes, sir. Is that horse of mine ready? Brought round to the door, sir. I say, look here, you, sir. The lady won't ride today. The weather won't do. Very good, sir. And I don't dine because I'm going to dine at the ladies. Very good, sir. Then Drummle glanced at me with an insolent triumph on his great jowled face that cut me to the heart. Dull as he was, and so exasperated me, that I felt inclined to take him in my arms, as the robber in the storybook is said to have taken the old lady, and seat him on the fire. One thing was manifest to both of us, and that was that until relief came, neither of us could relinquish the fire. There we stood, well squared up before it, shoulder to shoulder and foot to foot, with our hands behind us, not budging an inch. The horse was visible outside in the drizzle at the door. My breakfast was put on the table. Drummle's was cleared away. The waiter invited me to begin. I nodded. We both stood our ground. "'Have you been to the Grove since?' said Drummle. "'No,' said I. I had quite enough of the finches the last time I was there. "'Was that when we had a difference of opinion?' "'Yes,' I replied, very shortly. "'Come, come, they let you off easily enough,' sneered Drummle. "'You shouldn't have lost your temper.' "'Mr. Drummle,' said I, "'you are not competent to give advice on that subject. "'When I lose my temper, "'not that I admit to having done so on that occasion, "'I don't throw glasses.' "'I do,' said Drummle. "'After glancing at him once or twice "'in an increased state of smouldering ferocity, I said, Mr. Drummle, I did not seek this conversation. I don't think it an agreeable one. I'm sure it's not, said he superciliously over his shoulder. 
I don't think anything about it. And therefore, I went on, with your leave, I will suggest that we hold no kind of communication in future. Quite my opinion, said Drummle, and what I should have suggested myself, or done, more likely, without suggesting. But don't lose your temper. Haven't you lost enough without that? What do you mean, sir? Waiter, said Drummle, by way of answering me. The waiter reappeared. Look here, you, sir. You quite understand that the young lady don't ride today, and that I dine at the young lady's. Quite so, sir. When the waiter had felt my fast-cooling teapot with the palm of his hand, and had looked imploringly at me, and had gone out, Drummle, careful not to move the shoulder next to me, took a cigar from his pocket and bit the end off, but showed no sign of stirring. Choking and boiling as I was, I felt that we could not go a word further without introducing Estella's name, which I could not endure to hear him utter, and therefore I looked stonily at the opposite wall, as if there were no one present, and forced myself to silence. How long we might have remained in this ridiculous position it is impossible to say, but for the incursion of three thriving farmers, laid on by the waiter, I think, who came into the coffee-room, unbuttoning their greatcoats and rubbing their hands, and before whom, as they charged at the fire, we were obliged to give way. I saw him through the window, seizing his horse's mane, and mounting in his blundering, brutal manner, and sliding and backing away. I thought he was gone. When he came back, calling for a light for the cigar in his mouth, which he had forgotten, a man in a dust-coloured dress appeared with what was wanted. I could not have said from where, whether from the inn-yard, or the street, or where not, and as Drummle leaned down from the saddle, and lighted his cigar and laughed, with a jerk of his head towards the coffee-room windows, the slouching shoulders and ragged hair of this man, whose back was towards me, reminded me of Orlick. Too heavily out of sorts, to care much at the time, whether it were he or no, or, after all, to touch the breakfast. I washed the weather and the journey from my face and hands, and went out to the memorable old house that it would have been so much the better for me never to have entered, and never to have seen. Chapter 40 In the room where the dressing-table stood, and where the wax candles burnt on the wall, I found Miss Havisham and Estella. Miss Havisham seated on a settee near the fire, and Estella on a cushion at her feet. Estella was knitting, and Miss Havisham was looking on. They both raised their eyes as I went in, and both saw an alteration in me. I derived that from the look they interchanged. "'And what wind,' said Miss Havisham, "'blows you here, Pip?' Though she looked steadily at me, I saw that she was rather confused. Estella, pausing a moment in her knitting with her eyes upon me, and then going on, I fancied that I read in the action of her fingers, as plainly as if she had told me in the dumb alphabet, that she perceived I had discovered my real benefactor. "'Miss Havisham,' said I, "'I went to Richmond yesterday to speak to Estella, and finding that some wind had blown her here, I followed.' Miss Havisham, motioning to me for the third or fourth time to sit down, I took the chair by the dressing-table, which I had often seen her occupy. With all that ruin at my feet and about me, it seemed a natural place for me that day. What I had to say to Estella, Miss Havisham, I will say before you, presently, in a few moments. It will not surprise you, it will not displease you. I am as unhappy as you can ever have meant me to be. Miss Havisham continued to look steadily at me. I could see in the action of Estella's fingers as they worked that she attended to what I said, but she did not look up. I have found out who my patron is. It is not a fortunate discovery, and it is not likely ever to enrich me in reputation, station, fortune, anything. There are reasons why I must say no more of that. It is not my secret, but another's. As I was silent for a while, looking at Estella and considering how to go on, Miss Havisham repeated, It is not your secret, but another's. Well? When you first caused me to be brought here, Miss Havisham, when I belonged to the village over yonder, that I wish I had never left, I suppose I did really come here as any other chance boy might have come, as a kind of servant to gratify a want or a whim, and to be paid for it. Aye, Pip, replied Miss Havisham, steadily nodding her head, you did. And that Mr. Jaggers... Mr. Jaggers, said Miss Havisham, taking me up in a firm tone, 
had nothing to do with it, and knew nothing of it. His being my lawyer, and his being the lawyer of your patron, is a coincidence. He holds the same relation towards numbers of people, and it might easily arise. Be that as it may, it did arise, and was not brought about by any one. Any one might have seen in her haggard face that there was no suppression or evasion so far. But when I fell into the mistake I have so long remained in, at least you led me on, said I. Yes, she returned, again nodding steadily. I let you go on. Was that kind? Who am I? cried Miss Havisham, striking her stick upon the floor, and flashing into wrath so suddenly that Estella glanced up at her in surprise. Who am I, for God's sake, that I should be kind? It was a weak complaint to have made, and I had not meant to make it. I told her so as she sat brooding after this outburst. Well, 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 she said, what else? I was liberally paid for my old attendance here, I said to soothe her, in being apprenticed, and I have asked these questions only for my own information. What follows has another, and I hope more disinterested, purpose. In humouring my mistake, Miss Havisham, you punished, practised on, perhaps you will supply whatever term expresses your intention, without offence, your self-seeking relations. I did, why they would have it so, so would you. What has been my history, that I should be at the pains of entreating either them or you not to have it so? You made your own snares, I never made them. Waiting until she was quiet again, for this too flashed out of her in a wild and sudden way, I went on. I have been thrown among one family of your relations, Miss Havisham, and have been constantly among them since I went to London. I know them to have been as honestly under my delusion as myself, and I should be false and base if I did not tell you whether it is acceptable to you or no, and whether you are inclined to give credence to it or no, that you deeply wrong both Mr. Matthew Pocket and his son Herbert if you suppose them to be otherwise than generous, upright, open, and incapable of anything designing or mean. They are your friends, said Miss Havisham. They made themselves my friends, said I, when they supposed me to have superseded them, and when Sarah Pocket, Miss Georgiana, and Mistress Camilla were not my friends, I think. This contrasting of them with the rest seemed, I was glad to see, to do them good with her. She looked at me keenly for a little while, and then said quietly, What do you want for them? Only, said I, that you would not confound them with the others. But believe me, they are not of the same nature. Still looking at me keenly, Miss Havisham repeated, What do you want for them? I am not so cunning, you see, I said in answer, conscious that I reddened a little, as that I could hide from you, even if I desired that I do want something. Miss Havisham, if you would spare the money to do my friend Herbert a lasting service in life, but which, from the nature of the case, must be done without his knowledge, I could show you how. Why must it be done without his knowledge, she asked, settling her hands upon her stick, that she might regard me the more attentively. Because, said I, I began the service myself more than two years ago, without his knowledge, and I don't want to be betrayed. Why I fail in my ability to finish it, I cannot explain. It is part of the secret which is another person's and not mine. She gradually withdrew her eyes from me and turned them on the fire. After watching it for what appeared to be the silence and by the light of the slowly wasting candles to be a long time, she was roused by the collapse of some of the red coals, and looked towards me again, at first vacantly, then with a gradually concentrating attention. All this time Estella knitted on. When Miss Havisham had fixed her attention on me, she said, speaking as if there had been no lapse in our dialogue, What else? Estella, said I, turning to her now, and trying to command my trembling voice, You know I love you. You know that I have loved you long and dearly. She raised her eyes to my face on being thus addressed, and her fingers plied their work, and she looked at me with an unmoved countenance. I saw that Miss Havisham glanced from me to her, and from her to me. I should have said this sooner, but for my long mistake, it induced me to hope that Miss Havisham meant us for one another, 
while I thought you could not help yourself as it were, I refrained from saying it, but I must say it now. Preserving her unmoved countenance, and with her finger still going, Estella shook her head. I know, said I, in an answer to that action, I know I have no hope that I shall ever call you mine, Estella. I am ignorant of what may become of me very soon, how poor I may be, or where I may go. Still, I love you. I have loved you ever since I first saw you in this house. Looking at me, perfectly unmoved, and with her fingers busy, she shook her head again. It would have been cruel in Miss Havisham, horribly cruel, to practice on the susceptibility of a poor boy, and to torture me through all these years with a vain hope and idle pursuit, if she had reflected upon the gravity of what she did. But I think she did not. I think that in the endurance of her own trial she forgot mine, Estella. I saw Miss Havisham put her hand to her heart and hold it there as she sat looking by turns at Estella and me. It seems, said Estella very calmly, that there are sentiments, fancies, I don't know how to call them, which I am not able to comprehend. When you say you love me, I know what you mean, as a form of words, but nothing more. You address nothing in my breast. You touch nothing there. I don't care for what you say at all. I have tried to warn you of this, now have I not? I said in a miserable manner, yes. Yes, but you would not be warned, for you thought I did not mean it. Now did you not think so? I thought and hoped you could not mean it. You, so young, untried and beautiful. Estella, surely it is not in nature. It is in my nature, she returned. And then she added, with a stress upon the words, It is in the nature formed within me. I make a great difference between you and all other people when I say so much. I can do no more. Is it not true, said I, that Bentley Drummle is in town here and pursuing you? It is quite true, she replied, referring to him with the indifference of utter contempt. That you encourage him and ride out with him that he dines with you this very day? She seemed a little surprised that I should know it, but again replied, quite true. You cannot love him, Estella. Her fingers stopped for the first time as she retorted rather angrily. What have I told you? Do you still think, in spite of it, that I do not mean what I say? You would never marry him, Estella. She looked towards Miss Havisham and considered for a moment with her work in her hands. Then she said, Why not tell the truth? I am going to be married to him. I dropped my face into my hands, but was able to control myself better than I could have expected, considering what agony it gave me to hear her say those words. When I raised my face again, there was such a ghastly look upon Miss Havisham's that it impressed me even in my passionate hurry and grief. Estella, dearest Estella, do not let Miss Havisham lead you into this fatal step. Put me aside for ever, you have done so, I well know, but bestow yourself on some worthier person than Drummle. Miss Havisham gives you to him as the greatest slight and injury that could be done to the many far better men who admire you and to the few who truly love you. Among those few there may be one who loves you, even as dearly, though he has not loved you as long as I. Take him, and I can bear it better for your sake. My earnestness awoke a wonder in her that seemed as if it would have been touched with compassion, if she could have rendered me at all intelligible to her own mind. I am going, she said again in a gentler voice, to be married to him. The preparations for my marriage are making, and I shall be married soon. Why do you injuriously introduce the name of my mother by adoption? It is my own act. Your own act, Estella, to fling yourself away upon a brute. On whom should I fling myself away, she retorted with a smile. Should I fling myself away upon the man who would the soonest feel, if people do feel such things, that I took nothing to him? There, it is done. I shall do well enough, and so will my husband. As to leading me into what you call this fatal step, Miss Havisham would have had me wait and not marry yet, but I am tired of the life I have led, which has very few charms for me, and I am willing enough to change it. Say no more. We shall never understand each other. 
such a mean brute such a stupid brute i urged in despair don't be afraid of my being a blessing to him said estella i shall not be that come here is my hand do we part on this you visionary boy or man oh estella i answered as my bitter tears fell fast on her hand do what i would to restrain them even if i remained in england and could hold my head up with the rest how could i see you drummle's wife nonsense she returned nonsense this will pass in no time never estella you will get me out of your thoughts in a week out of my thoughts you are part of my existence part of myself you have been in every line i have ever read since i first came here the rough common boy whose poor heart you wounded even then you have been in every prospect i have ever seen since on the river on the sails of the ships on the marshes in the clouds in the light in the darkness in the wind in the woods in the sea in the streets you have been the embodiment of every graceful fancy that my mind has ever become acquainted with the stones of which the strongest london buildings are made are not more real or more impossible to be displaced by your hands than your presence and influence have been to me there and everywhere and will be estella to the last hour of my life you cannot choose but remain part of my character part of the little good in me part of the evil but in this separation i associate you only with the good and i will faithfully hold you to that always for you must have done me far more good than harm let me feel now what sharp distress i may oh god bless you god forgive you in what ecstasy of unhappiness i got these broken words out of myself i don't know the rhapsody welled up within me like blood from an inward wound and gushed out i held her hand to my lips some lingering moments and so i left her but ever afterwards i remembered and soon afterwards with stronger reason that while estella looked at me merely with incredulous wonder the spectral figure of miss havisham her hand still covering her heart seemed all resolved into a ghastly stare of pity and remorse all done all gone so much was done and gone that when i went out at the gate the light of the day seemed of a darker colour than when i went in for a while i hid myself among some lanes and by-paths and then struck off to walk all the way to london for i had by that time come to myself so far as to consider that i could not go back to the inn and see drummell there that i could not bear to sit upon the coach and be spoken to that i could do nothing half so good for myself as to tire myself out it was past midnight when i crossed london bridge pursuing the narrow intricacies of the streets which at that time tended westward near the middlesex shore of the river my readiest access to the temple was close by the riverside through whitefriars i was not expected till tomorrow but i had my keys and if herbert were gone to bed I could get to bed myself without disturbing him as it seldom happened that i came in at that white friars gate after the temple was closed and as i was very muddy and weary i did not take ill that the night porter examined me with much attention as he held the gate a little way open for me to pass in to help his memory i mentioned my name i was not quite sure sir but i thought so here's a note sir the messenger that brought it said would you be so good as to read it by my lantern much surprised by the request i took the note it was directed to philip pip esq and on the top of the superscription were the words please read this here i opened it the watchman holding up his light and read inside in wemmick's writing don't go home chapter forty five Turning from the temple gate as soon as I had read the warning, I made the best of my way to Fleet Street, and there got a late hackney chariot and drove to the Hummums in Covent Garden. In those times a bed was always to be got there at any hour of the night, and the Chamberlain, letting me in at his ready wicket, lighted the candle next in order on his shelf, and showed me straight into the bedroom next in order on his list. It was a sort of vault on the ground floor at the back, with a despotic monster of a four-post bedstead in it, straddling over the whole place, putting one of his arbitrary legs into the fireplace, and another into the doorway, 
and squeezing the wretched little washing-stand in quite a divinely righteous manner. I had asked for a night-light, and the Chamberlain had brought me in, before he left me the good old constitutional rush-light of those virtuous days, an object like the ghost of a walking-cane, which instantly broke his back if it were touched, which nothing could ever be lighted at, which was placed in solitary confinement at the bottom of a high tin tower, perforated with round holes that made a staringly wide-awake pattern on the walls. When I had got into bed and lay there footsore, weary and wretched, I found that I could do no more than close my eyes than I could close the eyes of this foolish Argus, and thus in the gloom and death of the night we stared at one another. What a doleful sight! How anxious, how dismal, how long! There was an inhospitable smell in the room of cold soot and hot dust, and as I looked up into the corners of the tester over my head, I thought what a number of blue-bottle flies from the butchers and earwigs from the market and grubs from the country must be holding on up there, lying by for next summer. This led me to speculate whether any of them ever tumbled down, and then I fancied I felt light falls on my face, a disagreeable turn of thought suggesting other and more objectionable approaches up my back. When I had lain awake a little while, those extraordinary voices with which silence teems began to make themselves audible. The closet whispered, the fireplace sighed, the little washing-stand ticked, and the one guitar-string played occasionally in the chest of drawers. At about the same time, the eyes on the wall acquired a new expression, and every one of those staring rounds I saw written, Don't go home. Whatever night fancies and night noises crowded on me, they never warded off this Don't go home. It plated itself into whatever I thought of as a bodily pain would have done. Not long before I had read in the newspapers how a gentleman unknown had come to the hummums in the night and had gone to bed and had destroyed himself and had been found in the morning weltering in blood. It came into my head that he must have occupied this very vault of mine, and I got out of bed to assure myself that there were no red marks about, then opened the door to look out into the passages and cheer myself up with the companionship of a distant light, near which I knew the Chamberlain to be dozing. But all this time, why I was not to go home, and what had happened at home, and when I should go home, and whether Provis was safe at home, were questions occupying my mind so busily that one might have supposed there could be no more room in it for any other theme. Even when I thought of Estella, and how we had parted that day for ever, and when I recalled all the circumstances of our parting, and all her looks and tones, and the action of her fingers while she knitted, even then I was pursuing, here and there and everywhere, the caution, don't go home. When at last I dozed in sheer exhaustion of mind and body, it became a vast shadowy verb which I had to conjugate. Imperative mood, present tense. Do not though go home. Let him not go home. Let us not go home. Do not ye or you go home. Let them not go home. Then potentially, I may not and I cannot go home. And I might not, could not, would not and should not go home until I felt that I was going distracted and rolled over on the pillow and looked at the staring rounds upon the wall again. I had left directions that I was to be called at seven, for it was plain that I must see Wemmick before seeing anyone else, and equally plain that this was a case in which his Walworth sentiments only could be taken. It was a relief to get out of the room where the night had been so miserable, and I needed no second knocking at the door to startle me from my uneasy bed. The castle battlements arose upon my view at eight o'clock, the little servant happening to be entering the fortress with two hot rolls. I passed through the postern and crossed the drawbridge in her company, and so came without announcement into the presence of Wemmick as he was making tea for himself and the aged. An open door afforded a perspective view of the aged in bed. Hello, Mr. Pip, said Wemmick. You did come home, then. Yes, I returned, but I didn't go home. That's all right, said he, rubbing his hands. I left a note for you at each of the temple gates on the chance. Which gate did you come to? I told him. I'll go round to the others in the course of the day and destroy the note, said Wemmick. 
It's a good rule never to leave documentary evidence if you can help it, because you don't know when it may be put in. I'm going to take a liberty with you. Would you mind toasting this sausage for the aged P? I said I should be delighted to do it. Then you can go about your work, Mary Ann, said Wemmick to the little servant. Which leaves us to ourselves, don't you see, Mr. Pip? He added, winking as she disappeared. I thanked him for his friendship and caution, and our discourse proceeded in a low tone, while I toasted the aged sausage and he buttered the crumb of the aged's roll. Now, Mr. Pip, you know, said Wemmick, you and I understand one another. We are in our private and personal capacities, and we have been engaged in a confidential transaction before today. Official sentiments are one thing, we are extra official. I cordially assented. I was so very nervous that I had already lighted the aged sausage like a torch, and had been obliged to blow it out. I accidentally heard yesterday morning, said Wemmick, being in a certain place where I once took you, even between you and me, it's as well not to mention names when avoidable. Much better not, said I. I understand you. I heard there by chance yesterday morning, said Wemmick, that a certain person, not altogether of uncolonial pursuits, and not unpossessed of portable property, I don't know who it may really be, we won't name this person, not necessary, said I, had made some little stir in a certain part of the world where a good many people go, not always in gratification of their own inclinations, and not quite irrespective of the government expense. In watching his face I made quite a firework of the aged sausage, and greatly discomposed both my own attention and Wemmick's, for which I apologised. By disappearing from such a place, and being no more heard of thereabouts, from which, said Wemmick, conjectures had been raised and theories formed, I also heard that you at your chambers in Garden Court Temple had been watched and might be watched again. By whom, said I? I wouldn't go into that, said Wemmick evasively. It might clash with official responsibilities. I heard it, as I have in my time heard other curious things in the same place. I don't tell you it on information received. I heard it. He took the toasting fork and sausage from me as he spoke and set forth the aged's breakfast neatly on a little tray. Previous to placing it before him, he went into the aged's room with a clean white cloth, and tied the same under the old gentleman's chin, and propped him up and put his nightcap on one side, and gave him quite a rakish air. He placed his breakfast before him with great care, and said, All right, ain't you aged P? To which the cheerful aged replied, All right, John, my boy, all right. There seemed to be a tacit understanding that the aged was not in a presentable state, and was therefore considered invisible. I made a pretence of being in complete ignorance of these proceedings. This watching of me at my chambers, which I have once had reason to suspect, I said to Wemmick when he came back, is inseparable from the person to whom you have averted, is it? Wemmick looked very serious. I couldn't undertake to say that of my own knowledge. I mean, I couldn't undertake to say it was at first, but it either is, or it will be, or it's in great danger of being. As I saw that he was restrained by fealty to Little Britain from saying as much as he could, and as I knew with thankfulness to him how far out of his way he went to say what he did, I could not press him. But I told him, after a little meditation over the fire, that I would like to ask him a question, subject to his answering or not answering as he deemed right and sure that his course would be right. He paused in his breakfast and crossing his arms and pinching his shirt sleeve, his notion of indoor comfort was to sit without any coat. He nodded to me once to put my question. You have heard of a man of bad character whose true name is Compison. He answered with one other nod. Is he living? One other nod. Is he in London? He gave me one other nod, compressed the post office exceedingly, gave me one last nod, and went on with his breakfast. Now, said Wemmick, questioning being over, which he emphasised and repeated for my guidance, I come to what I did after hearing what I heard. I went to Garden Court to find you. Not finding you, I went to Claricus to find Mr. Herbert. And him you found, said I, with great anxiety. And him I found. Without mentioning any names or going into any details, I gave him to understand that if he was aware of anybody, Tom, Jack or Richard, 
being about the chambers or about the immediate neighbourhood, he had better get Tom, Jack, or Richard out of the way while you were out of the way. He would be greatly puzzled what to do. He was puzzled what to do, not the less, because I gave him my opinion that it was not safe to try and get Tom, Jack, or Richard too far out of the way at present. Mr. Pip, I'll tell you something. Under existing circumstances, there is no place like a great city when you are once in it. Don't break cover too soon. Lie close. Wait till things slacken before you try the open, even for foreign air. I thanked him for his valuable advice, and asked him what Herbert had done. Mr. Herbert, said Wemmick, after being all of a heap for half an hour, struck out a plan. He mentioned to me as a secret that he is courting a young lady, who has, as no doubt you are aware, a bedridden pa, which pa, having been in the purser line of life, lies a bed in a bow window where you can see the ship sail up and down the river. You are acquainted with the young lady, most probably. Not personally, said I. The truth was that she had objected to me as an expensive companion who did Herbert no good, and that when Herbert had first proposed to present me to her, she had received the proposal with such very moderate warmth that Herbert had felt himself obliged to confide the state of the case to me, with a view to the lapse of a little time before I made her acquaintance. When I had begun to advance Herbert's prospects by stealth, I had been able to bear this with cheerful philosophy. He and his affianced, for their part, had naturally not been very anxious to introduce a third person into their interviews, and thus, although I was assured that I had risen in Clara's esteem, and although the young lady and I had long regularly interchanged messages and remembrances by Herbert, I had never seen her. However, I did not trouble Wemmick with these particulars. The house with the bow window, said Wemmick, being by the riverside down the pool between Limehouse and Greenwich, and being kept, it seems, by a very respectable widow who has a furnished upper floor to let, Mr. Herbert put it to me, what did I think of that as a temporary tenement for Tom, Jack, or Richard? Now I thought very well of it, for three reasons I'll give you. That is to say, firstly, it's altogether out of all your beats, and is well away from the usual heap of streets, great and small. Secondly, without going near it yourself, you could always hear of the safety of Tom, Jack, or Richard through Mr. Herbert. Thirdly, after a while, and when it might be prudent, if you should want to slip Tom, Jack, or Richard on board a foreign packet-boat, there he is, ready. Much comforted by these considerations, I thanked Wemmick again and again, and begged him to proceed. Well, sir, Mr. Herbert threw himself into the business with a will, and by nine o'clock last night he housed Tom, Jack, or Richard, whichever it may be, you and I don't want to know, quite successfully. At the old lodgings it was understood that he was summoned to Dover, and in fact he was taken down the Dover Road and cornered out of it. Now, another great advantage of all this is that it was done without you, and when, if any one was concerning himself about your movements, you must be known to be ever so many miles off and quite otherwise engaged. This diverts suspicion and confuses it, and for the same reason I recommended that even if you came back last night, you should not go home. It brings in more confusion and you want confusion. Wemmick, having finished his breakfast, here looked at his watch and began to get his coat on. And now, Mr. Pip, said he, with his hands still in the sleeves, I have probably done the most I can do, but if I can ever do more, from a Walworth point of view, and in a strictly private and personal capacity, I shall be glad to do it. Here's the address. There can be no harm in your going here tonight, and seeing for yourself that all is well with Tom, Jack, or Richard, before you go home, which is another reason for your not going home last night. But after you have gone home, don't go back here. You are very welcome, I am sure, Mr. Pip. His hands were now out of his sleeves, and I was shaking them. And let me finally impress one important point upon you. He laid his hands upon my shoulders, and nodded in a solemn whisper. Avail yourself of this evening to lay hold of his portable property. You don't know what might happen to him. Don't let anything happen to the portable property. Quite despairing of making my mind clear to Wemmick on this point, I forbore to try. Time's up, said Wemmick, and I must be off. If you had nothing more pressing to do than to keep here till dark, that's what I should advise. 
You look very much worried, and it would do you good to have a perfectly quiet day with the aged. He'll be up presently, and a little bit of... You remember the pig? Of course, said I. Well, and a little bit of him, that sausage you toasted was his, and he was in all respects a first-rater. Do try him, if it's only for an old acquaintance's sake. Goodbye, aged parent, in a cheery shout. All right, John, all right, my boy, piped the old man from within. I soon fell asleep before Wemmick's fire, and the aged and I enjoyed one another's society by falling asleep before it more or less all day. We had a loin of pork for dinner, and greens grown on the estate, and I nodded at the aged with good intention whenever I failed to do it drowsily. When it was quite dark, I left the aged preparing the fire for toast, and I inferred from the number of teacups as well from his glances at the two little doors in the wall that Miss Skiffkins was expected. Chapter 46 Eight o'clock had struck before I got into the air that was scented, not disagreeably, by the chips and shavings of the longshore boat builders and mast oar and block makers. All that waterside region of the upper and lower pool below bridge was unknown ground to me, and when I struck down by the river I found that the spot I wanted was not where I had supposed it to be, and was anything but easy to find. It was called Mill Pond Bank, Chink's Basin, and I had no other guide to Chink's Basin than the old green copper rope walk. It matters not what stranded ships repairing in dry docks I lost myself among, what old hulls of ships in course of being knocked to pieces, what ooze and slime and other dregs of tide, what yards of shipbuilders and shipbreakers, what rusty anchors blindly biting into the ground, though for years off duty, what mountainous country of accumulated casks and timber, how many rope works that were not the old green copper, after several times falling short of my destination, and as often overshooting it, I came unexpectedly round a corner upon Mill Pond Bank. It was a fresh kind of place all circumstances considered, where the wind from the river had room to turn itself round, and there were two or three trees in it, and there was the stump of a ruined windmill, and there was the old green copper rope walk, whose long and narrow vista I could trace in the moonlight, along a series of wooden frames set in the ground, that looked like superannuated haymaking rakes, which had grown old and lost most of their teeth. Selecting from the few queer houses upon Mill Pond Bank, a house with a wooden front and three storeys of bow window, not bay window, which is another thing, I looked at the plate upon the door and read there, Mrs. Wimple. That being the name I wanted, I knocked, and an elderly woman of a pleasant and thriving appearance responded. She was immediately deposed, however, by Herbert, who silently led me into the parlour and shut the door. It was an odd sensation to see his very familiar face established quite at home in that very unfamiliar room and region, and I found myself looking at him, much as I looked at the corner cupboard with the glass and china, the shells upon the chimney-piece, and the coloured engravings on the wall, representing the death of Captain Cook, a ship launch, and His Majesty King George III in a state coachman's wig, leather breeches, and top-boats on the terrace at Windsor. All is well handled, said Herbert, and he's quite satisfied, though eager to see you. My dear girl is with her father, and if you'll wait till she comes down, I'll make you known to her, and then we'll go upstairs. That's her father. I had become aware of an alarming growling overhead, and had probably expressed the fact in my countenance. I'm afraid he's a sad old rascal, said Herbert, smiling, but I have never seen him. Don't you smell rum? He's always at it. At rum, said I. Yes, returned Herbert, and you may suppose how mild it makes his gout. He persists, too, in keeping all the provisions upstairs in his room, and serving them out. He keeps them on shelves over his head, and will weigh them all. His room must be like a chandler's shop. While he thus spoke, the growling noise became a prolonged roar, and then died away. What else can be the consequence, said Herbert in explanation, if he will cut the cheese? A man with a gout in his right hand, and everywhere else, can't expect to get through a double Gloucester without hurting himself. He seemed to have hurt himself very much, for he gave another furious roar, 
to have provis for an upper lodger is quite a godsend to mrs wimple said herbert for of course people in general won't stand that noise curious place handle isn't it it was a curious place indeed but remarkably well kept and clean mrs wimple said herbert when i told him so is the best of housewives and i really do not know what my clara would do without her motherly help for clara has no mother of her own handel and no relation in the world but old gruff and grim surely that's not his name herbert no no said herbert that's my name for him his name is mr barley but what a blessing it is for the son of my father and mother to love a girl who has no relations and who can never bother herself or anybody else about her family herbert had told me on former occasions and now reminded me that he first knew miss clara barley when she was completing her education at an establishment in hammersmith and that on her being recalled home to nurse her father he and she had confided their afternoon to the motherly mrs wimple by whom it had been fostered and regulated with equal kindness and discretion ever since it was understood that nothing of a tender nature could possibly be confided to old barley by reason of his being totally unequal to the consideration of any subject more psychological than gout rum and purser's stores as we were thus conversing in a low tone while old barley's sustained growl vibrated in the beam that crossed the ceiling the room door opened and a very pretty slight dark-eyed girl of twenty or so came in with a basket in her hand whom herbert tenderly relieved of the basket and presented blushing as clara she really was a most charming girl and might have passed for a captive fairy whom that truculent ogre old barley had pressed into his service look here said herbert showing me the basket with a compassionate and tender smile after we had talked a little here's poor clara's supper served out every night here's her allowance of bread and here's her slice of cheese and here's her rum which i drink this is mr barley's breakfast for to-morrow served out to be cooked two mutton chops three potatoes some split peas a little flour two ounces of butter a pinch of salt and all this black pepper it's stewed up together and taken hot and it's a nice thing for the gout i should think there was something so natural and winning in clara's resigned way of looking at these stores in detail as herbert pointed them out and something so confiding loving and innocent in her modest manner of yielding herself to herbert's embracing arm and something so gentle in her so much needing protection on mill pond bank by chink's basin and the old green copper rope walk with old barley growling in the beam that i would not have undone the engagement between her and herbert for all the money in the pocket-book i had never opened i was looking at her with pleasure and admiration when suddenly the growl swelled into a roar again and a frightful bumping noise was heard above as if a giant with a wooden leg were trying to bore it through the ceiling to come at us upon this clara said to herbert papa wants me darling and ran away there's an unconscionable old shark for you said herbert what do you suppose he wants now handel i don't know said i something to drink that's it cried herbert as if he had made a guess of extraordinary merit he keeps his grog ready mixed in a little tub on the table wait a moment and you'll hear clara lift him up to take some there he goes another roar with a prolonged shake at the end now said herbert as it was succeeded by silence he's drinking now said herbert as the growl resounded in the beam once more he's down again on his back clara returned soon afterwards and herbert accompanied me upstairs to see our charge as we passed mr barley's door he was heard hoarsely muttering within in a strain that rose and fell like the wind the following refrain in which i substitute good wishes for something quite the reverse oh hoy bless your eyes here's old bill barley here's old bill barley bless your eyes here's old bill barley on the flat of his back by lord lying on the flat of his back like a drifting old dead flounder is your old bill barley bless your roys ahoy bless you at this strain of consolation herbert informed me the invisible barley would commune with himself by the day and night together often while it was light having at the same time one eye at a telescope which was fitted on his bed for the convenience of sweeping the river 
in his two cabin rooms at the top of the house which were fresh and airy and in which mr barley was less audible than below i found provis comfortably settled he expressed no alarm and seemed to feel none that was worth mentioning but it struck me that he was softened indefinably for i could not have said how and could never afterwards recall how when i tried but certainly the opportunity that the day's rest had given me for reflection had resulted in my fully determining to say nothing to him respecting Compeyson, for anything I knew his animosity towards the man might otherwise lead to his seeking him out and rushing on his own destruction. Therefore when Herbert and I sat down with him by his fire, I asked him first of all whether he relied on Wemmick's judgment and sources of information. Ay, dear boy, he answered with a grave nod. Jaggers knows. Then I have talked with Mr. Wemmick, said I, and I have come to tell you what caution he gave me and what advice. This I did accurately, with the reservation just mentioned, and I told him how Wemmick had heard in Newgate Prison, whether from officers or prisoners I could not say, that he was under some suspicion, and that my chambers had been watched. How Wemmick had recommended his keeping close for a time, and my keeping away from him, and what Wemmick had said about getting him abroad. I added that, of course, when the time came, I should go with him, or I should follow close upon him, as I might be safest in Wemmick's judgment. What was to follow, that I did not touch upon. Neither, indeed, was I at all clear or comfortable about it in my own mind, now that I saw him in that softer condition, and in declared peril for my sake. As to altering my way of living by enlarging my expenses, I put it to him whether in our present unsettled and difficult circumstances would it not be simply ridiculous if it were no worse. He could not deny this, and indeed was very reasonable throughout. His coming back was a venture, he said, and he had always known it to be a venture. He would do nothing to make it a desperate venture, and he had very little fear of his safety with such good help. Herbert, who had been looking at the fire and pondering, here said that something had come into his thoughts arising out of Wemmick's suggestion, which might be worth while to pursue. We are both good watermen, Handel, and could take him down the river ourselves when the right time comes. No boat would then be hired for the purpose, and no boatman. That would save at least a chance of suspicion, and any chance is worth saving. Never mind the season. Don't you think it might be a good thing if you began at once to keep a boat at the temple stairs? and were in the habit of rowing up and down the river. You fall into that habit, and then who notices or minds? Do it twenty or fifty times, and there's nothing special in your doing it. The twenty-first or fifty-first. I liked this scheme, and Provis was quite elated by it. We agreed that it should be carried into execution, and that Provis should never recognise us if we came below bridge and rowed past Mill Pond Bank but we further agreed that he should pull down the blind in that part of his window which gave upon the east whenever he saw us and was all right. Our conference now being ended and everything arranged, I rose to go, remarking to Herbert that he and I had better not go home together, and that I would take half an hour's start of him. I don't like to leave you here, I said to Provis, though I cannot doubt your being safer here than near me. Goodbye. Dear boy, he answered, clasping my hands. I don't know when we might meet again, and I don't like good-bye. Say good-night. Good-night, Herbert. Good-night. Herbert will go regularly between us, and when the time comes you may be certain I shall be ready. Good-night. Good-night. We thought it best that he should stay in his own rooms, and we left him on the landing outside his door, holding a light over the stair-rail to light us downstairs. Looking back at him, I thought of the first night of his return, when our positions were reversed and when I little supposed my heart could ever be as heavy and anxious parting from him as it was now. Old Barley was growling and swearing when we repassed his door, with no appearance of having ceased or meaning to cease. When we got to the foot of the stairs, I asked Herbert whether he had preserved the name of Provis. He replied, certainly not, and that the lodger was Mr. Campbell. He also explained that the utmost note of Mr. Campbell there was, that he, Herbert, had Mr. Campbell consigned to him, and felt a strong personal interest in his well-being cared for, and living a secluded life. So when we went into the parlour where Mrs. Wimple and Clara were seated at work, 
I said nothing of my own interest in Mr. Campbell, but kept it to myself. When I had taken leave of the pretty, gentle, dark-eyed girl, and of the motherly woman who had not outlived her honest sympathy with a little affair of true love, I felt as if the old green copper rope-walk had grown quite a different place. Old Barley might be as old as the hills, and might swear like a whole field of troopers, but there were redeeming youth and trust and hope enough in Chink's Basin to fill it to overflowing. And then I thought of Estella and of our parting, and went home very sadly. All things were as quiet in the temple as ever I had seen them. The windows of the rooms on that side lately occupied by Provis were dark and still, and there was no lounger in garden court. I walked past the fountain twice or thrice before I descended the steps that were between me and my rooms, but I was quite alone. Herbert coming to my bedside when he came in, for I went straight to bed, dispirited and fatigued, made the same report. Opening one of the windows after that, he looked out into the moonlight and told me that the pavement was as solemnly empty as the pavement of any cathedral at the same hour. Next day I set myself to get the boat, and was soon done. The boat was brought round to the temple stairs, and lay where I could reach her within a minute or two. Then I began to go out as for training and practice, sometimes alone, sometimes with Herbert. I was often out in cold rain and sleet, but nobody took much note of me after I had been out a few times. At first I kept above Blackfriars Bridge, but as the hours of the tide changed I took towards London Bridge. It was old London Bridge in those days, and at certain states of the tide there was a race and fall of water there which gave it a bad reputation. But I knew well enough how to shoot the bridge after seeing it done, and so began to row about among the shipping in the pool and down to Erith. The first time I passed Millbank Pond, Herbert and I were pulling a pair of oars, and both in going and returning we saw the blind towards the east come down. Herbert was rarely there less frequently than three times a week, and he never brought me a single word of intelligence that was at all alarming. Still, I knew that there was cause for alarm, and I could not get rid of the notion of being watched. Once received, it is a haunting idea. How many undesigning persons I suspected of watching me, it would be hard to calculate. In short, I was always full of fears for the rash man who was hiding. Herbert had sometimes said to me, that he found it pleasant to stand at one of our windows after dark, when the tide was running down, and to think that it was flowing with everything it bore towards Clara. But I thought with dread that it was flowing towards Magwitch, and that any black mark on its surface might be his pursuers going swiftly, silently, and surely to take him. Chapter 47 Some weeks passed without bringing any change. We waited for Wemmick, and he made no sign. If I had never known him out of Little Britain, and had never enjoyed the privilege of being on a familiar footing at the castle, I might have doubted him, not so for a moment, knowing him as I did. My worldly affairs began to wear a gloomy appearance, and I was pressed for money by more than one creditor. Even I myself began to know the want of money, I mean of ready money in my own pocket, and to relieve it by converting some easily spared articles of jewellery into cash. But I had quite determined it would be heartless fraud to take more money from my patron in the existing state of my uncertain thoughts and plans. Therefore I had sent him the unopened pocket book by Herbert to hold in his own keeping, and I felt a kind of satisfaction whether it was a false kind or a true, I hardly know, in not having profited by his generosity since his revelation of himself. As the time wore on, an impression settled heavily upon me that Estella was married. Fearful of having it confirmed, though it was all but a conviction, I avoided the newspapers, and begged Herbert, to whom I had confided the circumstances of our last interview, never to speak of her to me. Why I hoarded up this last wretched little rag of the robe of hope that was rent and given to the winds, how do I know? Why did you who read this commit that not dissimilar inconsistency of your own last year, last month, last week? It was an unhappy life that I lived, and its one dominant anxiety, towering over all its other anxieties, 
like a high mountain above a range of mountains, never disappeared from my view. Still, no new cause for fear arose. Let me start for my bed as I would with a terror fresh upon me that he was discovered. Let me sit listening as I would with dread for Herbert's returning step at night, lest it should be fleeter than ordinary and winged with evil news. For all that, and much more to like purpose, the round of things went on. Condemned to inaction and a state of constant restlessness and suspense, I rowed about in my boat and waited, 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 as best I could. There were states of the tide when, having been down the river, I could not get back through the eddy-chafed arches and starlings of old London Bridge. Then I left my boat at a wharf near the Custom House, to be brought up afterwards to the Temple Stairs. I was not averse to doing this, as it served to make me and my boat a commoner incident among the waterside people there. From this slight occasion sprang two meetings that I now have to tell of. One afternoon, late in the month of February, I came ashore at the wharf at dusk. I had pulled down as far as Greenwich with the ebb tide, and had turned with the tide. It had been a fine bright day, but had become foggy as the sun dropped, and I had to feel my way back among the shipping pretty carefully. Both in going and returning I had seen the signal at his window. All well. As it was a raw evening and I was cold, I thought I would comfort myself with dinner at once, and as I had the hours of dejection and solitude before me if I went home to the temple, I thought I would afterwards go to the play. The theatre where Mr. Wopsle had achieved his questionable triumph was in that waterside neighbourhood. It is nowhere now, and to that theatre I resolved to go. I was aware that Mr. Wopsle had not succeeded in reviving the drama, but, on the contrary, had rather partaken of its decline. He had been ominously heard of through the playbills, as a faithful black in connection with a little girl of noble birth and a monkey, and Herbert had seen him as a predatory tartar of comic propensities, with a face like a red brick and an outrageous hat all over bells. I dined at what Herbert and I used to call a geographical chop-house, where there were maps of the world in porter pot rims on every half yard of the tablecloths, and charts of gravy on every one of the knives. To this day there is scarcely a single chop house within the Lord Mayor's dominions which is not geographical, and wore out the time dozing over crumbs, staring at gas, and baking in a hot blast of dinners. By and by I roused myself and went to the play. There I found a virtuous boatswain in His Majesty's service. A most excellent man, though I could have wished his trousers were not quite so tight in some places, and not quite so loose in others, who knocked off all the little men's hats over their eyes, though he was very generous and brave, and who wouldn't hear of anybody's paying taxes, though he was very patriotic. He had a bag of money in his pocket like a pudding in a cloth, and on that property married a young person, in bed furniture, with great rejoicings. The whole population of Portsmouth, nine in number at the last census, turning out on the beach to rub their own hands and shake everybody else's and sing, fill, fill. A certain dark-complexioned swab, however, who wouldn't fill or do anything else that was proposed to him, and whose heart was openly stated by the boatswain to be as black as his figurehead, proposed to two other swabs to get all mankind into difficulties, which was so effectually done, the swab family having considerable political influence, that it took half the evening to set things right, and then it was only brought about through an honest little grocer with a white hat, black gaiters and a red nose getting into a clock with a gridiron and listening and coming out and knocking everybody down from behind with a gridiron whom he couldn't confute with what he had overheard. This led to Mr. Wopsle's, who had never been heard of before, coming in with a star and garter on as a plenipotentiary of a great power direct from the Admiralty to say that the swabs were all to go to prison on the spot, and that he had brought the boatswain down the Union Jack as a slight acknowledgment of his public services. The boatswain, unmanned for the first time, respectfully dried his eyes on the Jack, and then cheering up and addressing Mr. Wopsle as your honour, solicited permission to take him by the fin. Mr. Wopsle, conceding his fin with a gracious dignity, was immediately shoved into a dusty corner, while everybody danced a hornpipe, and from that corner, surveying the public with a discontented eye, became aware of me. 
The second piece was the last new grand comic Christmas pantomime, in the first scene of which it pained me to suspect that I detected Mr. Wopsle with red worsted legs under a highly magnified phosphoric countenance and a shock of red curtain fringe for his hair engaged in the manufacture of thunderbolts in a mine and displaying great cowardice when his gigantic master came home very hoarse to dinner but he presently presented himself under worthier circumstances for the genius of youthful love being in want of assistance on account of the parental brutality of an ignorant farmer who opposed the choice of his daughter's heart by purposely falling upon the object in a flour sack out of the first floor window summoned a sensuous enchanter and he coming up from the antipodes rather unsteadily after an apparently violent journey proved to be mr wopsle in a high-crowned hat with a necromantic work in one volume under his arm the business of this enchanter on earth being principally to be talked at sung at butted at danced at and flashed at with fires of various colours he had a good deal of time on his hands and I observed with great surprise that he devoted it to staring in my direction as if he were lost in amazement. There was something so remarkable in the increasing glare of Mr. Wopsle's eye, and he seemed to be turning so many things over in his mind, and to grow so confused, that I could not make it out. I sat thinking of it long after he had ascended to the clouds in a large watch-case, and still I could not make it out. I was still thinking of it when I came out of the theatre an hour afterwards, and found him waiting for me near the door. "'How do you do?' said I, shaking hands with him as we turned down the street together. "'I saw that you saw me.' "'Saw you, Mr. Pip,' he returned. "'Yes, of course I saw you. But who else was there?' "'Who else?' "'It's the strangest thing,' said Mr. Wopsle, drifting into his lost look again. "'And yet I could swear to him.' Becoming alarmed, I entreated Mr. Wopsle to explain his meaning. Whether I should have noticed him at first, but for your being there, said Mr. Wopsle, going on in the same lost way, I can't be positive, yet I think I should. Involuntarily I looked around me, as I was accustomed to look around me when I went home, for these mysterious words gave me a chill. Oh, he can't be in sight, said Mr. Wopsle. He went out before I went off. I saw him go. Having the reason that I had for being suspicious, I even suspected this poor actor. I mistrusted a design to entrap me into some admission. Therefore I glanced at him as we walked together, but said nothing. I had a ridiculous fancy that he must be with you, Mr. Pip, till I saw that you were quite unconscious of him sitting behind you there like a ghost. My former chill crept over me again, but I was resolved not to speak, for it was quite consistent with his words that he might be set on to induce me to connect these references with Provis. Of course, I was perfectly sure and safe that Provis had not been there. I dare say you wonder at me, Mr. Pip. Indeed, I see you do, but it is so very strange. You'll hardly believe what I'm going to tell you. I could hardly believe it myself, if you told me. Indeed, said I. No, indeed, Mr. Pip. You remember in old times a certain Christmas day, when you were quite a child, and I dined at Gargery's, and some soldiers came to the door to get a pair of handcuffs mended. I remember it very well, and you remember that there was a chase after two convicts, and that we joined in it, and that Gargery took you on his back, and that I took the lead, and you kept up with me as well as you could. I remember it all very well, better than he thought, except the last clause, and you remember that we came up with the two in a ditch, and there was a scuffle between them, and one of them had been severely handled and much mauled about the face by the other. I see it all before me and that the soldiers lighted torches and put the two in the centre, and we went on to see the last of them over the black marches, with the torchlight shining on their faces. I am particular about that, with the torchlight shining on their faces, when there was an outer ring of dark night all about us. Yes, said I, I remember all that. Then, Mr. Pip, one of those two prisoners sat behind you tonight. I saw him over your shoulder. Steady, I thought. I asked him then, which of the two do you suppose you saw? The one who had been mauled, he answered readily. And I'll swear I saw him. The more I think of him, the more certain I am of him. This is very curious, said I, with the best assumption I could put on its being nothing more to me. Very curious indeed. I cannot exaggerate the enhanced disquiet into which this conversation threw me, or the special and peculiar terror I felt at Compeyson's having been behind me. 
like a ghost for if he had ever been out of my thoughts for a few moments together since the hiding had begun it was in those very moments when he was closest to me and to think that i should be so unconscious and off my guard after all my care was as if i had shut an avenue of a hundred doors to keep him out and then had found him at my elbow i could not doubt either that he was there because i was there and that however slight an appearance of danger there might be about us danger was always near and active i put such questions to mr wopsle as when did the man come in he could not tell me that he saw me and over my shoulder he saw the man it was not until he had seen him for some time that he began to identify him but he had from the first vaguely associated him with me and known him as somehow belonging to me in the old village time how was he dressed prosperously but not noticeably otherwise he thought in black was his face at all disfigured no he believed not i believed not too for although in my brooding state i had taken no especial notice of the people behind me i thought it likely that a face at all disfigured would have attracted my attention when mr wopsle had imparted to me all that he could recall or, or i extract and when i had treated him to a little appropriate refreshment after the fatigues of the evening we parted it was between twelve and one o'clock when i reached the temple and the gates were shut no one was near me when i went in and went home herbert had come in and we held a very serious council by the fire but there was nothing to be done saving to communicate to wemmick what i had that night found out and to remind him that we waited for his hint as i thought that i might compromise him if i went too often to the castle i made this communication by letter i wrote it before i went to bed and went out and posted it and again no one was near me herbert and i agreed that we could do nothing else but be very cautious and we were very cautious indeed more cautious than before if that were possible and i for my part never went near chink's basin except when i rode by and then only looked at mill pond bank as i looked at anything else chapter forty eight the second of the two meetings referred to in the last chapter occurred about a week after the first i had again left my boat at the wharf below bridge the time was an hour earlier in the afternoon and undecided where to dine i had strolled up into cheapside and was strolling along it surely the most unsettled person in all the busy concourse when a large hand was laid upon my shoulder by someone overtaking me it was mr jagger's hand and he passed it through my arm are we going in the same direction pip may we walk together where are you bound for for the temple i think said i don't you know said mr jaggers well i returned glad for once to get the better of him in cross-examination i do not know for i have not made up my mind you're going to dine said mr jaggers you don't mind admitting that i suppose no i returned i don't mind admitting that and are you not engaged i don't mind admitting also that i am not engaged then said mr jaggers come dine with me i was going to excuse myself when he added wemmick's coming so i changed my excuse into an acceptance the few words i had uttered serving for the beginning of either and we went along cheapside and slanted off to little britain while the lights were springing up brilliantly in the shop windows and the street lamp lighters scarcely finding ground enough to plant their ladders on in the midst of the afternoon bustle were skipping up and down and running in and out opening more red eyes in the gathering fog than my rushlight tower at the hum hums had opened white eyes in the ghostly wall at the office in little britain there was the usual letter writing hand washing candle snuffing and safe locking that closed the business of the day as i stood idle by mr jaggers fire its rising and falling flame made the two casts on the shelf look as if they were playing a diabolical game at bo peep with me while the pair of coarse fat office candles that dimly lighted mr jaggers as he wrote in a corner were decorated with dirty winding sheets as if in remembrance of a ghost of hanged clients we went to gerrard street all three together in a hackney coach and as soon as we got there dinner was served 
although I should not have thought of making in that place the most distant reference by so much as a look to Wemmick's Walworth sentiments, yet I should have no objection to catching his eye now and then in a friendly way. But it was not to be done. He turned his eyes on Mr. Jaggers whenever he raised them from the table, and was as dry and distant to me as if there were twin Wemmicks, and this was the wrong one. "'Did you send that note of Miss Havisham's to Mr. Pip, Wemmick?' Mr. Jaggers asked, soon after we began dinner. "'No, sir,' returned Wemmick. "'It was going by post when you brought Mr. Pip into the office. Here it is. He handed it to his principal instead of to me.' "'It's a note of two lines, Pip,' said Mr. Jaggers, handing it on. "'Sent up to me by Miss Havisham, on account of her not being sure of your address. She tells me that she wants to see you on a little matter of business you mentioned to her. You'll go down?' "'Yes,' said I, casting my eyes over the note, which was exactly in those terms. "'When do you think of going down?' "'I have an impending engagement,' said I, glancing at Wemmick, who was putting fish into the post-office. That renders me rather uncertain of my time. That once, I think. If Mr. Pip has the intention of going at once, said Wemmick to Mr. Jaggers, he needn't write an answer, you know. Receiving this as an intimation that it was best not to delay, I settled that I would go to-morrow and said so. Wemmick drank a glass of wine and looked with a grimly satisfied air at Mr. Jaggers, but not at me. "'So, Pip, our friend the Spider,' said Mr. Jaggers, "'has played all his cards. He has won the pool.' It was as much as I could do to assent. "'Ah, he's a promising fellow in his way, but he may not have it all his own way. The stronger will win in the end, but the stronger has to be found out first. If he should turn to and beat her—' "'Surely,' I interrupted with a burning face and heart, "'you do not seriously think that he is scoundrel enough for that, Mr. Jaggers?' I didn't say so, Pip. I am putting a case. If he should turn to and beat her, he may possibly get strength on his side. If it should be a question of intellect, he certainly will not. It would be chance work to give an opinion of how a fellow of that sort will turn out in such circumstances, because it's a toss-up between two results. May I ask what they are? A fellow like our friend the Spider, answered Mr. Jaggers, either beats or cringes. He may cringe and growl, or cringe and not growl but he either beats or cringes. Ask Wemmick his opinion. Either beats or cringes, said Wemmick, not at all addressing himself to me. So here's to Mrs. Bentley Drummle, said Mr. Jaggers, taking a decanter of choice of wine from his dumb waiter, and filling for each of us and for himself. And may the question of supremacy be settled to the lady's satisfaction, to the satisfaction of the lady and gentleman. It will never be. Now, Molly, 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 how slow you are today. She was at his elbow when he addressed her, putting a dish upon the table. As she withdrew her hands from it, she fell back a step or two, nervously muttering some excuse, and a certain action of her fingers as she spoke arrested my attention. What's the matter? said Mr. Jaggers. Nothing. Only the subject we were speaking of, said I, was rather painful to me. The action of her fingers was like the action of knitting. She stood looking at her master, not understanding whether she was free to go, or whether he had more to say to her, and would call her back if she did go. Her look was very intent. Surely I had seen exactly such eyes and such hands on a memorable occasion very lately. He dismissed her, and she glided out of the room. But she remained before me as plainly as if she were still there. I looked at those hands, I looked at those eyes, I looked at that flowing hair, and I compared them with other hands, other eyes, other hair that I knew of, and with what those might be after twenty years of a brutal husband and a stormy life. I looked again at those hands and eyes of the housekeeper, and thought of the inexplicable feeling that had come over me when I last walked, not alone, in the ruined garden and through the deserted brewery. I thought how the same feeling had come back when I saw a face looking at me, and a hand waving to me from a stagecoach window, and how it had come back again and had flashed about me like lightning when I had passed it in a carriage, not alone, through a sudden glare of light in a dark street. I thought how one link of association had helped that identification in the theatre, and how such a link, wanting before, had been riveted for me now. 
when I had passed by a chance swift and Estella's name to the fingers with their knitting action and the attentive eyes, and I felt absolutely certain that this woman was Estella's mother. Mr. Jaggers had seen me with Estella, and was not likely to have missed the sentiments I had been at no pains to conceal. He nodded when I said the subject was painful to me, clapped me on the back, put round the wine again, and went on with his dinner. Only twice more did the housekeeper reappear, and then her stay in the room was very short, and Mr. Jaggers was sharp with her, but her hands were Estella's hands, and her eyes were Estella's eyes and if she had reappeared a hundred times, I could have been neither more sure nor less sure that my conviction was the truth. It was a dull evening, for Wemmick drew his wine when it came round, quite as a matter of business, just as he might have drawn his salary when that came round, and with his eyes on his chief sat in a state of perpetual readiness for cross-examination. As to the quantity of wine, his post-office was as indifferent and ready as any other post-office for its quantity of letters. From my point of view, he was the wrong twin all the time, and only externally like the Wemmick of Walworth. We took our leave early and left together. Even when we were groping among Mr. Jagger's stock of boots for our hats, I felt that the right twin was on his way back, and we had not gone half a dozen yards down Gerrard Street in the Walworth direction before I found out that I was walking arm in arm with the right twin and that the wrong twin had evaporated into the evening air. "'Well,' said Wemmick, "'that's over. He's a wonderful man without his living likeness, but I feel that I have to screw myself up when I dine with him, and I dine more comfortably unscrewed.' I felt that this was a good statement of the case, and told him so. "'Wouldn't say it to anybody but yourself,' he answered. "'I know that what it is said between you and me goes no further.' I asked him if he had ever seen Miss Havisham's adopted daughter, Mrs. Bentley Drummle. He said no. To avoid being too abrupt, I then spoke of the aged and of Miss Skiffkins. He looked rather sly when I mentioned Miss Skiffkins, and stopped in the street to blow his nose, with a roll of the head and a flourish not quite free from latent boastfulness. Wemmick, said I, do you remember telling me, before I first went to Mr. Jagger's private house, to notice that housekeeper? Did I? he replied. Ah, I dare say I did. Deuce take me, he added suddenly. I know I did. I find I am not quite unscrewed yet. A wild beast tamed, you called her. And what do you call her? The same. How did Mr. Jaggers tame her, Wemmick? That's his secret. She has been with him many a long year. I wish you would tell me her story. I feel a particular interest in being acquainted with it. You know that what is said between you and me goes no further. Well, Wemmick replied, I don't know her story, that is, I don't know all of it. But what I do know, I'll tell you. We are in our private and personal capacities, of course. Of course. A score of so years ago, that woman was tried at the Old Bailey for murder, and was acquitted. She was a very handsome young woman, and I believe had some gypsy blood in her. Anyway, it was hot enough when it was up, as you may suppose. But she was acquitted. Mr. Jaggers was for her, pursued Wemmick, with a look full of meaning, and worked the case in a way quite astonishing. It was a desperate case, and it was comparatively early days with him then, and he worked it to general admiration. In fact, it may almost be said to have made him. He worked it himself at the police office, day after day, for many days, contending against even a committal, and at the trial, where he couldn't work it himself, sat under counsel and every one knew put in all the salt and pepper. The murdered person was a woman, a woman a good ten years older, very much larger and very much stronger. It was a case of jealousy. They both led tramping lives, and this woman in Gerrard Street here had been married very young, over the broomstick, as we say, to a tramping man, and was a perfect fury in point of jealousy. The murdered woman, more a match for the man, certainly in point of years, was found dead in a barn near Hounslow Heath. There had been a violent struggle, perhaps a fight. She was bruised and scratched and torn, and had been held by the throat at last and choked. Now there was no reasonable evidence to implicate any person but this woman, and on the improbabilities of her having been able to do it, Mr. Jaggers principally rested his case. You may be sure, said Wemmick, touching me on the sleeve, 
that he never dwelt upon the strength of her hands then, although he sometimes does now. I had told Wemmick of his showing us her wrists that day of the dinner party. Well, sir, Wemmick went on, it happened, happened, don't you see, that this woman was so very artfully dressed from the time of her apprehension, that she looked much slighter than she really was. In particular, her sleeves are always remembered to have been so skilfully contrived that her arms had quite a delicate look. She only had a bruise or two about her, nothing for a tramp, but the backs of her hands were lacerated, and the question was, was it with fingernails? Now Mr. Jaggers showed that she had struggled through a great lot of brambles, which were not as high as her face, but which she could not have got through and kept her hands out of and bits of those brambles were actually found in her skin and put in evidence, as well as the fact that the brambles in question were found on examination to have been broken through, and to have little shreds of her dress and little spots of blood upon them here and there. But the boldest point he made was this. It was attempted to be set up, in proof of her jealousy, that she was under strong suspicion of having, at about the time of the murder, frantically destroyed her child by this man, some three years old, to revenge herself upon him. Mr. Jaggers worked that in this way. We say these are not the marks of fingernails, but the marks of brambles, and we show you the brambles. You say they are the marks of fingernails, and you set up the hypothesis that she destroyed her child. You must accept all the consequences of that hypothesis, for anything we know she may have destroyed her child, and the child in clinging to her may have scratched her hands. What then? You are not trying her for the murder of her child. Why don't you? As to this case, if you will have scratches, we say that for anything we know, you may have accounted for them, assuming, for the sake of argument, that you have not invented them. To sum up, sir, said Wemmick, Mr. Jaggers was altogether too many for the jury, and they gave in. Has she been in his service ever since? Yes, but not only that, said Wemmick, she went into his service immediately after her acquittal, tamed as she is now. She has since been taught one thing and another in the way of her duties, but she was tamed from the beginning. Do you remember the sex of the child? Said to have been a girl. You have nothing more to say to me tonight? Nothing. I got your letter and destroyed it. Nothing. We exchanged a cordial good night and I went home, with a new matter for my thoughts though with no relief from the old. Chapter 49 Putting Miss Havisham's note in my pocket, that it might serve as my credentials for so soon reappearing at Sartis house, in case her waywardness should lead her to express any surprise at seeing me, I went down again by the coach next day. But I alighted at the halfway house, and breakfasted there, and walked the rest of the distance for I sought to get into town quietly by the unfrequented ways, and to leave it in the same manner. The best light of the day was gone when I passed along the quiet echoing courts behind the high street. The nooks of ruin, where the old monks had once had their refectories and gardens, and where the strong walls were now pressed into the service of humble sheds and stables, were almost as silent as the old monks in their graves. The cathedral chimes had at once a sadder and more remote sound to me, as I hurried on avoiding observation, than they ever had before, so the swell of the old organ was borne to my ears like funeral music, and the rooks, as they hovered about the grey tower, and swung in the bare high trees of the priory garden, seemed to call to me that the place was changed, and that Estella was gone out of it for ever. An elderly woman, who I had seen before as one of the servants who lived in the supplementary house across the back of the courtyard, opened the gate. The lighted candle stood in the dark passage within, as of old, and I took it up and ascended the staircase alone. Miss Havisham was not in her own room, but was in the larger room across the landing. Looking in at the door after knocking in vain, I saw her sitting on the hearth in a ragged chair close before and lost in the contemplation of the ashy fire. Doing as I had often done, I went in, and stood touching the old chimney-piece, where she could see me when she raised her eyes. There was an air of utter loneliness upon her, that would have moved me to pity, though she had wilfully done me a deeper injury than I could charge her with, 
as I stood compassionating her and thinking how, in the progress of time, I too had come to be part of the wrecked fortunes of that house, her eyes rested on me. She stared and said in a low voice, Is it real? It is I, Pip. Mr. Jaggers gave me your note yesterday, and I have lost no time. Thank you, thank you. As I brought another of the ragged chairs to the hearth and sat down, I remarked a new expression on her face as if she were afraid of me. I want, she said, to pursue that subject you mentioned to me when you were last here, and to show you that I am not all stone. But perhaps you can never believe now that there is anything human in my heart. When I said some reassuring words, she stretched out her tremulous right hand, as though she was going to touch me, but she recalled it again before I understood the action or knew how to receive it. You said, speaking for your friend, that you could tell me how to do something useful and good. Something that you would like done, is it not? Something that I would like done very much. What is it? I began explaining to her that secret history of the partnership. I had not got far into it when I judged from her looks that she was thinking in a discursive way of me, rather than what I said. It seemed to be so, for when I stopped speaking, do you break off? she asked then, with her former air of being afraid of me. Because you hate me too much to bear to speak to me? No, no, I answered. How can you think so, Miss Havisham? I stopped because I thought you were not following what I said. Uh, perhaps I was not, she answered, putting her hand to her head. Begin again and let me look at something else. Stay, now tell me. She set her hand upon her stick in the resolute way that sometimes was habitual to her, and looked at the fire with a strong expression of forcing herself to attend. I went on with my explanation, and told her how I had hoped to complete the transaction out of my means, but how, in this, I was disappointed. That part of the subject, I reminded her, involved matters which could form no part of my explanation, for they were the weighty secrets of another. So, said she, assenting with her head, but not looking at me, and how much money is wanting to complete the purchase? I was rather afraid of stating it, for it sounded a large sum. Nine hundred pounds. If I give you the money for this purpose, will you keep it my secret as you have kept your own, quite as faithfully, and your mind will be more at rest, much more at rest? Are you very unhappy now? She asked this question still without looking at me but in an unwanted tone of sympathy. I could not reply at the moment, for my voice failed me. She put her left arm across the head of her stick and softly laid her forehead on it. I am far from happy, Miss Havisham, but I have other causes of disquiet than any you know of. They are the secrets I have mentioned. After a while she raised her head and looked at the fire again. It is noble in you to tell me that you have other causes of unhappiness. Is it true? Too true. Can I only serve you, Pip, by serving your friend? Regarding that as done, is there nothing I can do for you yourself? Nothing. I thank you for the question. I thank you even more for the tone of the question. But there is nothing. She presently rose from her seat and looked about the blighted room for the means of writing. There were none there, and she took from her pocket a yellow set of ivory tablets, mounted in tarnished gold, and wrote upon them with a pencil in a case of tarnished gold that hung from her neck. You are still on friendly terms with Mr. Jaggers? Quite. I dined with him yesterday. This is an authority to him to pay you that money, to lay out at your irresponsible discretion for your friend. I keep no money here, but if you would rather Mr. Jaggers knew nothing of the matter, I will send it to you. Thank you, Miss Havisham. I have not the least objection to receiving it from him. She read me what she had written, and it was direct and clear, and evidently intended to absolve me from any suspicion of profiting by the receipt of the money. I took the tablets from her hand, and it trembled again, and it trembled more as she took off the chain to which the pencil was attached, and put it in mine. All this she did without looking at me. My name is on the first leaf. You can ever write under my name, I forgive her though ever so long after my broken heart is dust, pray do it. Oh, Miss Havisham, said I, I can do it now. There have been sore mistakes, and my life has been a blind and thankless one. 
and I want forgiveness and direction far too much to be bitter with you. She turned her face to me for the first time since she had averted it, and to my amazement, I may even add to my terror, dropped on her knees at my feet, with her folded hands raised to me in the manner in which, when her poor heart was young and fresh and whole, they must often have been raised to heaven from her mother's side. To see her, with her white hair and her worn face kneeling at my feet, gave me a shock through all my frame. I entreated her to rise, and got my arms about to help her up, but she only pressed that hand of mine which was nearest to her grasp, and hung her head over it and wept. I had never seen her shed a tear before, and in the hope that the relief might do her good, I bent over her without speaking. She was not kneeling now, but was down upon the ground. Oh, she cried despairingly, what have I done, what have I done? If you mean, Miss Havisham, what have you done to injure me, let me answer. Very little. I should have loved her under any circumstances. Is she married? Yes. It was a needless question, for a new desolation in the desolate house had told me so. What have I done, what have I done? She wrung her hands and crushed her white hair, and returned to this cry over and over again. What have I done? I knew not how to answer, or how to comfort her, that she had done a grievous thing in taking an impressionable child, to mould into the form that her wild resentment spurned affection, and wounded pride found vengeance in. I knew full well, but that in shutting out the light of day she had shut out infinitely more, that in seclusion she had secluded herself from a thousand natural and healing influences, that her mind, brooding solitary, had grown diseased, as all minds do, and must and will, that reverse the appointed order of their Maker. I knew equally well, and I could look upon her without compassion, seeing her punishment in the ruin she was, in her profound unfitness for this earth on which she was placed, in the vanity of sorrow which had become a master mania like the vanity of penitence, the vanity of remorse, the vanity of unworthiness, and other monstrous vanities that have been curses in this world. Until you spoke to her the other day, and until I saw you in a looking-glass that showed me what I once felt myself, I did What have I done? What have I done? And so again, twenty, fifty times over, what had she done? Miss Havisham, I said, when her cry had died away, you may dismiss me from your mind and conscience, but Estella is a different case, and if you can ever undo any scrap of what you have done amiss in keeping a part of her right nature away from her, it will be better to do that than to bemoan the past through a hundred years. Yes, yes, I know it, but Pip, my dear, there was an earnest womanly compassion for me in her new affection. My dear, believe this, when she first came to me, I meant to save her from misery like my own. At first I meant no more. Well, well, said I, I hope so. But as she grew and promised to be very beautiful, I gradually did worse, and with my praises and with my jewels and with my teachings and with this figure of myself always before her, a warning to back and point my lessons, I stole her heart away, and put ice in its place. Better, I could not help saying, to have left her a natural heart, even to be bruised or broken. With that Miss Havisham looked distractedly at me for a while, and then burst out again. What had she done? If you knew all my story, she pleaded, you would have some compassion for me, and a better understanding of me. Miss Havisham, I answered, as delicately as I could, I believe that I may say that I do know your story, and I have known it ever since I first left this neighbourhood, and has inspired me with great commiseration, and I hope I understand it and its influences. Does what has passed between us give me any excuse for asking you a question relative to Estella? Not as she is, but as she was when she first came here. 
she was seated on the ground with her arms on the ragged chair and her head leaning on them she looked full at me when i said this and replied go on whose child was estella she shook her head you don't know she shook her head again but mr jaggers brought her here or sent her here brought her here will you tell me how that came about she answered in a low whisper and with caution i've been shut up in these rooms a long time i don't know how long you know what time the clocks keep here when i told him that i wanted a little girl to rear and love and to save from my fate i had first seen him when i sent for him to lay this place waste for me having read of him in the newspapers before i and the world parted he told me that he would look about him for such an orphan child one night he brought her here asleep and i called her estella might i ask her age then two or three she herself knows nothing but that she was left an orphan and i adopted her so convinced i was of that woman's being her mother that i wanted no evidence to establish the fact in my own mind but to any mind i thought the connection there was clear and straight what more could i hope to do by prolonging the interview i had succeeded on behalf of herbert miss havisham had told me all she knew of estella i had said and done what i could to ease her mind no matter with what other words we parted we parted twilight was closing in when i went down the stairs into the natural air i called to the woman who had opened the gate when i entered that i would not trouble her just yet but would walk around the place before leaving for i had a presentiment that i should never be there again and i felt the dying light was suited to my last view of it by the wilderness of the casks that i had walked on long ago and on which the rain of years had fallen since rotting them in many places and leaving miniature swamps and pools of water upon those that stood on end i made my way to the ruined garden i went all around it round by the corner where herbert and i had fought our battle round by the paths where estella and i had walked so cold so lonely so dreary all taking the brewery on my way back i raised the rusty latch of a little door at the garden end of it and walked through i was going out at the opposite door not easy to open now for the damp wood had started and swelled and the hinges were yielding and the threshold was encumbered with a growth of fungus when i turned my head to look back a childish association revived with wonderful force in the moment of the slight action and i fancied that i saw miss havisham hanging to the beam so strong was the impression that i stood under the beam shuddering from head to foot before i knew it was a fancy though to be sure i was there in an instant the mournfulness of the place and time and the great terror of this illusion though it was but momentary caused me to feel an indescribable awe as i came out between the open wooden gates where i had once wrung my hair after estella had wrung my heart passing on into the front courtyard i hesitated whether to call the woman to let me out at the locked gate of which she had the key or first to go upstairs and assure myself that miss havisham was safe and well as i had left her i took the latter course and went up i looked into the room where i had left her and saw her seated in the ragged chair upon the hearth close to the fire with her back towards me in the moment when i was withdrawing my head to go quietly away i saw a great flaming light spring up in the same moment i saw her running at me shrieking with a whirl of fire blazing all about her and soaring at least as many feet above her head as she was high i had a double caped great coat on and over my arm another thick coat that i got them off closed with her threw her down and got them over her that i dragged the great cloth from the table for the same purpose and with it dragged down the heap of rottenness in the midst and all the ugly things that sheltered there that we were on the ground struggling like desperate enemies and that the closer i covered her the more wildly she shrieked and tried to free herself that this had occurred i knew 
through the result, but not through anything I felt or thought or knew I did. I knew nothing until I knew that we were on the floor by the great table, and that the patches of tinder, yet alike, were floating in the smoky air, which a moment ago had been her faded bridal dress. Then I looked round and saw the disturbed beetles and spiders running away over the floor, and the servants coming in with breathless cries at the door. I still held her forcibly down with all my strength, like a prisoner who might escape, and I doubt if I even knew who she was, or why we had struggled, or that she had been in flames, or that the flames were out, until I saw the patches of tinder that had been her garments, no longer a light, but falling in a black shower around us. She was insensible, and I was afraid to have her moved, or even touched. Assistance was sent for, and I held her until it came, as if I unreasonably fancied, I think I did, that if I let her go the fire would break out again and consume her. When I got up on the surgeon's coming to her with other aid, I was astonished to see that both my hands were burnt, for I had no knowledge of it through the sense of feeling. On examination it was pronounced that she had received serious hurts, but they of themselves were far from hopeless. The danger lay mainly in the nervous shock. By the servant's directions, her bed was carried into that room and laid upon the great table, which happened to be well suited to the dressing of her injuries. When I saw her again an hour afterwards, she lay indeed where I had seen her strike her stick and heard her say she would lie one day. Though every vestige of her dress was burnt, as they told me, she still had something of her old ghastly bridal appearance, for they had covered her to the throat with white cotton wool, and as she lay with a white sheet loosely overlying that, the phantom air of something that had been and was changed was still upon her. I found, on questioning the servants, that Estella was in Paris, and I got a promise from the surgeon that he would write to her by the next post. Miss Havisham's family I took upon myself, intending to communicate with Mr. Matthew Pocket only, and leave him to do as he liked about informing the rest. This I did next day, through Herbert, as soon as I returned to town. There was a stage that evening when she spoke collectedly of what had happened, though with a certain terrible vivacity. Towards midnight she began to wander in her speech, and after that it gradually set in that she said innumerable times, in a low, solemn voice, What have I done? And then, when she first came, I meant to save her from misery like mine. And then, take the pencil and write under my name, I forgive her. She never changed the order of these three sentences, but she sometimes left out a word in one or other of them, never putting in another word, but always leaving a blank and going on to the next word. As I could do no service there, and as I had nearer home that pressing reason for anxiety and fear, which even her wanderings could not drive out of my mind, I decided in the course of the night that I would return by the early morning coach, walking on a mile or so, and being taken clear of the town. At about six o'clock of the morning, therefore, I leaned over her and touched her lips with mine, just as they said, not stopping for being touched, take the pencil and write under my name. I forgive her. Chapter 50 My hands had been dressed twice or thrice in the night, and again in the morning. My left arm was a good deal burnt to the elbow, and less severely as high as the shoulder. It was very painful, but the flames had set in that direction, and I felt thankful it was no worse. My right hand was not so badly burnt, but that I could move the fingers. It was bandaged, of course but much less inconveniently than my left hand and arm. Those I carried in a sling, and I could only wear my coat like a cloak, loose over my shoulders and fastened at the neck. My hair had been caught by the fire, but not my head or face. When Herbert had been down to Hammersmith and seen his father, he came back to me at our chambers and devoted the day to attending to me. 
he was the kindest of nurses and at stated times took off the bandages and steeped them in the cooling liquid that was kept ready and put them on again with a patient tenderness that i was deeply grateful for at first as i lay quiet on the sofa i found it painfully difficult i might say impossible to get rid of the impression of the glare of the flames their hurry and noise and the fierce burning smell if i dozed for a minute i was awakened by miss havisham's cries and by her running at me with all that height of fire above her head this pain of the mind was much harder to strive against than any bodily pain i suffered and herbert seeing that did his utmost to hold my attention engaged neither of us spoke of the boat but we both thought of it that was made apparent by our avoidance of the subject and by our agreeing without agreement to make my recovery of the use of my hands a question of so many hours not of so many weeks my first question when i saw herbert had been of course whether all was well down the river as he replied in the affirmative with perfect confidence and cheerfulness we did not resume the subject until the day was wearing away but then as herbert changed the bandages more by the light of the fire than by the outer light he went back to it spontaneously i sat with provis last night handel two good hours where was clara dear little thing said herbert she was up and down with gruff and grim all the evening he was perpetually pegging at the floor the moment she left his sight i doubt if he can hold out long though what with the rum and pepper pepper and rum i should think his pegging must be nearly over and then you will be married herbert how can i take care of the dear child otherwise lay your arm upon the back of the sofa my dear boy and i'll sit down here and get the bandage off so gradually that you shall not know when it comes i was speaking of provis do you know handel he improves i said to you i thought he was softened when i last saw him so you did and so he is he was very communicative last night and told me more of his life you remember his breaking off here about some woman that he had a great trouble with did i hurt you i had started but not under his touch his words had given me a start i had forgotten that herbert but i remember it now you speak of it well he went into that part of his life and a dark wild part it is shall i tell you or will it worry you just now tell me by all means every word herbert bent forward to look at me more nearly as if my reply had been rather more hurried or more eager than he could quite account for your head is cool he said touching it quite said i tell me what provost said my dear herbert it seems said herbert there's a bandage off most charmingly and now comes the cool one makes you shrink first my poor dear fellow don't it but it will be comfortable presently it seems that the woman was a young woman and a jealous woman and a revengeful woman revengeful handle to the last degree to what last degree murder does it strike too cold on that sensitive place i don't feel it how did she murder whom did she murder why the deed may not have merited quite so terrible a name said herbert but she was tried for it and mr jaggers defended her and the reputation of that defence first made his name known to provis it was another and stronger woman who was the victim and there had been a struggle in a barn who began it or how fair it was or how unfair may be doubtful but how it ended is certainly not doubtful for the victim was found throttled was the woman brought in guilty no she was acquitted my poor handle i hurt you it is impossible to be gentler herbert yes what else this acquitted young woman and provis had a little child the little child of whom provis was exceedingly fond on the evening of the very night when the object of her jealousy was strangled as i tell you the young woman presented herself before provis for one moment and swore that she would destroy the child which was in her possession and he should never see it again and then she vanished there's the worst arm comfortably in the sling once more and now there remains but the right hand which is a far easier job 
I can do it better by this light than by a stronger, for my hand is steadiest when I don't see the poor blistered patches too distinctly. You don't think your breathing is affected, my dear boy. You seem to breathe quickly. Perhaps I do, Herbert. Did the woman keep her oath? There comes the darkest part of Provis's life. She did. That is, he says she did. Why, of course, my dear boy, returned Herbert in a tone of surprise, and again bending forward to get a nearer look at me. He says it all. I have no other information. No, to be sure. Now whether, pursued Herbert, he had used the child's mother ill, or whether he had used the child's mother well, Provis doesn't say, but she had shared some four or five years of the wretched life he described to us at this fireside, and he seems to have felt pity for her, and forbearance towards her. Therefore, fearing he should be called upon to depose about this destroyed child, and so be the cause of her death, he hid himself much as he grieved for the child, kept himself dark, as he says, out of the way, out of the trial, and was only vaguely talked of as a certain man called Abel, out of whom the jealousy arose. After the acquittal she disappeared, and thus he lost the child and the child's mother. I want to ask a moment, my dear boy, and I have done, that evil genius, Compasson, the worst of scoundrels among many scoundrels, knowing of his keeping out of the way at that time, and of his reasons for doing so, of course afterwards held the knowledge over his head as a means of keeping him poorer and working him harder. It was clear last night that this barbed the point of Provis's animosity. I want to know, said I, and particularly Herbert, whether he told you when this happened. Particularly? Let me remember, then, what he said as to that. His expression was a round score a year ago, and almost directly after I took up with Compasson. How old were you when you came upon him in the little churchyard? I think in my seventh year. Ah, it had happened some three or four years then, he said, and you brought into his mind the little girl so tragically lost, who would have been about your age. Herbert, said I, after a short silence, in a hurried way, can you see me best by the light of the window or the light of the fire? By the firelight, answered Herbert, coming close again. Look at me. I do look at you, my dear boy. Touch me. I do touch you, my dear boy. You are not afraid that I am in any fever, or that my head is much disordered by the incident last night? N no, dear boy, said Herbert, after taking time to examine me. You are rather excited, but you are quite yourself. I know I am quite myself, and the man we have in hiding down the river is Estella's father. Chapter 51 What purpose I had in view when I was hot on tracing out and proving Estella's parentage, I cannot say. It will presently be seen that the question was not before me in a distinct shape until it was put before me by a wiser head than my own. But when Herbert and I had held our momentous conversation, I was seized with a feverish conviction that I ought to hunt the matter down, that I ought not to let it rest, but that I ought to see Mr. Jaggers and come at the bare truth. I really do not know whether I felt that I did this for Estella's sake, or whether I was glad to transfer to the man in whose preservation I was so much concerned by some rays of the romantic interest that had so long surrounded me. Perhaps the latter possibility may be nearer to the truth. Anyway, I could scarcely be withheld from going out to Gerrard Street that night. Herbert's representations that, if I did, I should probably be laid up and stricken useless when our fugitive safety would depend upon me, alone restrained my impatience. On the understanding, again and again reiterated, that come what would, I was to go to Mr. Jaggers to-morrow. I at length submitted to keep quiet, and to have my hurts looked after, and to stay at home. Early next morning we went out together, and at the corner of Giltspur Street by Smithfield, I left Herbert to go his way into the city, and took my way to Little Britain. 
There were periodical occasions when Mr. Jaggers and Wemmick went over the office accounts and checked off the vouchers, and put all things straight. On these occasions Wemmick took his books and papers into Mr. Jaggers' room, and one of the upstairs clerks came down into the outer office. Finding such a clerk on Wemmick's post that morning, I knew what was going on, but I was not sorry to have Mr. Jaggers and Wemmick together, as Wemmick would then hear for himself that I said nothing to compromise him. My appearance, with my arm bandaged and my coat loose over my shoulders, favoured my object. Although I had sent Mr. Jaggers a brief account of the accident as soon as I had arrived in town, yet I had to give him all the details now, and the speciality of the occasion caused our talk to be less dry and hard, and less strictly regulated by the rules of evidence than it had been before. While I described the disaster, Mr. Jaggers stood, according to his wont, before the fire. Wemmick leaned back in his chair, staring at me with hands in the pockets of his trousers, and his pen put horizontally into the post. The two brutal castes, always inseparable in my mind from the official proceedings, seemed to be congestively considering whether they didn't smell fire at the present moment. My narrative finished, and their questions exhausted, I then produced Miss Havisham's authority to receive the nine hundred pounds for Herbert. Mr. Jagger's eyes retired a little deeper into his head when I handed him the tablets, but he presently handed them over to Wemmick, with instructions to draw the cheque for his signature. While that was in course of being done, I looked on at Wemmick as he wrote, and Mr. Jaggers, posing and swaying himself on his well-polished boots, looked on at me. "'I'm sorry, Pip,' said he, as I put the cheque in my pocket when he had signed it, "'that we do nothing for you.' Miss Havisham was good enough to ask me, I returned, whether she could do nothing for me, and I told her no. "'Everybody should know his own business,' said Mr. Jaggers, and I saw Wemmick's lips form the words, "'Portable Property.' "'I should not have told her no if I had been you,' said Mr. Jaggers. "'But every man ought to know his own business best.' "'Every man's business,' said Wemmick, rather reproachfully towards me, "'is portable property.' As I thought the time was now come for pursuing the theme I had at heart, I said, turning on Mr. Jaggers, "'I did ask something of Miss Havisham, however, sir. I asked her to give me some information relative to her adopted daughter.' and she gave me all she possessed. Did she? said Mr. Jaggers, bending forward to look at his boots, and then straightening himself. Ha! Huh, I don't think I should have done so, if I had been Miss Havisham. But she ought to know her own business best. I know more of the history of Miss Havisham's adopted child than Miss Havisham herself does, sir. I know her mother. Mr. Jaggers looked at me inquiringly, and repeated, Mother? I have seen her mother within these three days. Yes, said Mr. Jaggers. And so have you, sir, and you have seen her still more recently. Yes, said Mr. Jaggers. Perhaps I know more of Estella's history than even you do, said I. I know her father, too. A certain stop that Mr. Jaggers came to in his manner, he was too self-possessed to change his manner, but he could not help its being brought to an indefinably attentive stop, assured me that he did not know who her father was. This I had strongly suspected from Provis's account, as Herbert had repeated it, of his having kept himself dark, which I pieced on to the fact that he himself was not Mr. Jagger's client until some four years later, and when he could have no reason for claiming his identity. But I could not be sure of this unconsciousness on Mr. Jagger's part before, though I was quite sure of it now. "'So you know the young lady's father, Pip?' said Mr. Jaggers. "'Yes,' I replied, "'and his name is Provis, from New South Wales.' Even Mr. Jaggers started when I said those words. It was the slightest start that could escape a man, the most carefully repressed and the sooner checked, but he did start, though he made it a part of the action of taking out his pocket-handkerchief. How Wemmick received the announcement I am unable to say, for I was afraid to look at him just then, lest Mr. Jagger's sharpness should detect that there had been some communication unknown to him between us. 
"'And on what evidence, Pip?' asked Mr. Jaggers very coolly, as he paused with his handkerchief halfway to his nose. "'Does Provis make this claim?' "'He does not make it,' said I, "'and he has never made it, and he has no knowledge or belief that his daughter is in existence.' For once the powerful pocket-handkerchief failed. My reply was so unexpected that Mr. Jaggers put the handkerchief back into his pocket without completing the usual performance, folded his arms, and looked with stern attention at me, though with an immovable face. Then I told him all I knew, and how I knew it, with the one reservation that I left him to infer that I knew from Miss Havisham what I in fact knew from Wemmick. I was very careful indeed as to that, nor did I look towards Wemmick until I had finished all I had to tell, and had been for some time silently meeting Mr. Jagger's look. When I did at last turn my eyes in Wemmick's direction, I found that he had unposted his pen, and was intent upon the table before him. Ha! said Mr. Jaggers at last, and he moved towards the papers on the table. What item was it you were at, Wemmick, when Mr. Pip came in? But I could not submit to being thrown off in that way, and I made a passionate, almost indignant appeal to him to be more frank and manly with me. I reminded him of the false hopes into which I had lapsed, the length of time they had lasted, and the discovery I had made, and hinted at the danger that weighed upon my spirits. I represented myself as being surely worthy of some little confidence from him, in return for the confidence I had just now imparted. I said that I did not blame him, or suspect him, or mistrust him, but I wanted assurance of the truth from him, and if he asked me why I wanted it, and why I thought I had any right to it, I would tell him, little as he cared for such poor dreams that I had loved Estella dearly and long, and that although I had lost her and must live a bereaved life, whatever concerned her was still nearer and dearer to me than anything else in the world. And seeing that Mr. Jaggers stood quite still and silent, and apparently quite obdurate under this appeal, I turned to Wemmick and said, Wemmick, I know you to be a man with a gentle heart. I have seen your pleasant home, and your old father, and all the innocent, cheerful, playful ways with which you refresh your business life, and I entreat you to say a word for me to Mr. Jaggers, and to represent to him that, all circumstances considered, he ought to be more open with me. I have never seen two men look more oddly at one another than Mr. Jaggers and Wemmick did after this apostrophe. At first a misgiving crossed me that Wemmick would be instantly dismissed from his employment, but it melted as I saw Mr. Jaggers relax into something like a smile, and Wemmick become bolder. "'What's all this?' said Mr. Jaggers. You with an old father, and you with a pleasant and playful ways. Well, returned Wemmick, if I don't bring em here, what does it matter? Pip, said Mr. Jaggers, laying his hand upon my arm, and smiling openly. This man must be the most cunning impostor in all London. Not a bit of it, returned Wemmick, growing bolder and bolder. I think you're another, and they exchanged their former odd looks, each apparently still distrustful, that the other was taking him in. "'You with a pleasant home,' said Mr. Jaggers. "'Since it don't interfere with business,' returned Wemmick, "'let it be so. Now I look at you, sir, I shouldn't wonder if you might be planning and conniving to have a pleasant home of your own one of these days, when you're tired of all this work.' Mr. Jaggers nodded his head retrospectively two or three times, and actually drew a sigh. "'Pip,' said he, "'we won't talk about poor dreams. You know more about such things than I having much fresher experience of that kind. But now about this other matter. I'll put a case to you. Mine, I admit nothing. He waited for me to declare that I quite understood that he expressly said that he admitted nothing. Now, Pip, said Mr. Jaggers, put this case. Put the case that a woman, under such circumstances as you have mentioned, held her child concealed and was obliged to communicate the fact to her legal adviser on his representing to her that he must know, with an eye to the latitude of his defence, how the fact stood about that child, put the case that at the same time he held a trust to find a child for an eccentric rich lady to adopt and bring up. I follow you, sir. Put the case that he lived in an atmosphere of evil, and that all he saw of children, 
was their being generated in great numbers for certain destruction. Put the case that he often saw children solemnly tried at a criminal bar where they were held up to be seen. Put the case that he habitually knew of their being imprisoned, whipped, transported, neglected, cast out, qualified in all ways for the hangman, and growing up to be hanged. Put the case that pretty nigh all the children he saw in his daily business life he had reason to look upon as so much spawn, to develop into the fish that were to come into his net, to be prosecuted, defended, forsworn, made orphans, bedeviled somehow. I follow you, sir. Put the case, Pip, that here was one pretty little child out of the heap who could be saved, whom the father believed dead and dared make no stir about, as to whom over the mother the legal adviser had this power. I know what you did and how you did it. You came so and so, you did such and such things to divert suspicion. I have tracked you through it all, and I tell it you all. Part with the child, unless it should be necessary to produce it clear to you, and then it shall be produced. Give the child into my hands, and I will do my best to bring you off. If you are saved, your child is saved too. If you are lost, your child is still saved. Put the case that this was done, and that the woman was cleared. I understand you perfectly, but that I make no admissions, that you make no admissions, and Wemmick repeated, no admissions. Put the case, Pip, that passion and the terror of death had a little shaken the woman's intellects, and that when she was set at liberty, she was scared out of the ways of the world, and went to him to be sheltered. Put the case that he took her in, and that he kept down the old, wild, violent nature whenever he saw an inkling of its breaking out, by asserting his power over her in the old way. Do you comprehend the imaginary case? Quite. Put the case that the child grew up and was married for money, that the mother was still living, that the father was still living, that the mother and father, unknown to one another, were dwelling within so many miles, furlongs, yards, if you like, of one another, that the secret was still a secret, except that you had got wind of it. Put that last case to yourself very carefully. I do. I asked Wemmick to put it to himself very carefully, and Wemmick said, I do. For whose sake would you reveal the secret? For the father's? I think he would not be much better for the mother. For the mother's? I think if she had done such a deed she would be safer where she was. For the daughter's? I think it would hardly serve her to establish her parentage for the information of her husband, and to drag her back to disgrace, after an escape of twenty years, pretty secure to last for life. But add the case that you had loved her, Pip, and made her the subject of those poor dreams, which have at one time or another been in the heads of more men than you think likely, then I tell you that you had better and would much sooner, when you had thought well of it, chop off that bandaged left hand of yours with your bandaged right hand, and then pass the chopper on to Wemmick there to cut that off too. I looked at Wemmick, whose face was very grave. He gravely touched his lips with his forefinger. I did the same. Mr. Jaggers did the same. Now, Wemmick, said the latter then, resuming his usual manner, what item was it you were at when Mr. Pip came in? Standing by for a little while they were at work, I observed that the odd looks they had cast at one another were repeated several times, with this difference now that each of them seemed suspicious, not to say conscious, of having shown himself in a weak and unprofessional light to the other. For this reason, I suppose, they were now inflexible with one another, Mr. Jaggers being highly dictatorial, and Wemmick obstinately justifying himself whenever there was the smallest point in abeyance for a moment. I have never seen them on such ill terms, for generally they got on very well indeed together. But they were both happily relieved by the opportune appearance of Mike, the client with the fur cap and the habit of wiping his nose on his sleeve, whom I had seen on the very first day of my appearance within those walls. This individual, who either in his own person or in that of some other member of his family, seemed to be always in trouble, 
which in that place meant Newgate, called to announce that his eldest daughter was taken up on suspicion of shoplifting. As he imparted this melancholy circumstance to Wemmick, Mr. Jaggers, standing magisterially before the fire, and taking no share in the proceedings, Mike's eye happened to twinkle with a tear. "'What are you about?' demanded Wemmick, with the utmost indignation. "'What do you come snivelling here for?' "'I didn't go to do it, Mr. Wemmick.' "'You did,' said Wemmick. "'How dare you? You're not in a fit state to come here. If you can't come here without spluttering like a bad pen, what do you mean by it?' "'A man can't help his feelings, Mr. Wemmick,' pleaded Mike. "'Is what?' demanded Wemmick, quite savagely. "'Say that again.' "'Now look here, my man,' said Mr. Jaggers, advancing a step and pointing to the door. "'Get out of this office. I'll have no feelings here. Get out.' "'Serves you right,' said Wemmick. "'Get out.' So the unfortunate Mike very humbly withdrew, and Mr. Jaggers and Wemmick appeared to have re-established their good understanding and went to work again, with an air of refreshment upon them, as if they had just had lunch. Chapter 52 From Little Britain I went with my cheque in my pocket to Miss Skiffkin's brother, the accountant, and Miss Skiffkin's brother, the accountant, going straight to Clarica's and bringing Clarica to me, I had the great satisfaction of concluding that arrangement. It was the only good thing I had done and the only completed thing I had done since I was first apprised of my great expectations. Clarica informing me on that occasion that the affairs of the house were steadily progressing, that he would now be able to establish a small branch house in the east, which was much wanted for the extension of the business, and that Herbert, in his new partnership capacity, would go out and take charge of it. I found that I must have prepared for a separation from my friend, even though my own affairs had been more settled. And now, indeed, I felt as if my last anchor were loosening its hold, and I should soon be driving with the winds and waves. But there was recompense in the joy with which Herbert would come home of a night and tell me of these changes, little imagining that he told me no news, and would sketch airy pictures of himself conducting Clara Barley to the land of the Arabian Nights, and of me going out to join them, with a caravan of camels, I believe, and of our all going up the Nile and seeing wonders. Without being sanguine as to my own part in those bright plans, I felt that Herbert's way was clearing fast, and that old Bill Barley had but to stick to his pepper and rum, and his daughter would soon be happily provided for. We had now got into the month of March. My left arm, though it presented no bad symptoms, took, in the natural course, so long to heal that I was unable to get a coat on. My right arm was tolerably restored, disfigured but fairly serviceable. On a Monday morning, when Herbert and I were at breakfast, I received the following letter from Wemmick by the post. Walworth. Burn this as soon as read. Early in the week, or say Wednesday, you might do what you know of, if you felt disposed to try it. Now burn. When I had shown this to Herbert, and had put it in the fire, but not before we had both got it by heart, we considered what to do. For, of course, my being disabled could now be no longer kept out of view. I have thought it over and over again, said Herbert, and I think I know a better course than taking a Thames waterman. Take Startop, a good fellow, a skilled hand, fond of us, and enthusiastic and honourable. I had thought of him more than once. But how much would you tell him, Herbert? It is necessary to tell him very little. Let him suppose it a mere freak, but a secret one. Until the morning comes, then let him know that there is urgent reason for your getting Provis aboard and away. You go with him, no doubt. Where? It had seemed to me, in the many anxious considerations I had given the point, almost indifferent to what port we made, for Hamburg, Rotterdam, Antwerp, the place signified little so that he was out of England. Any foreign steamer that fell in our way and would take us up would do. I had always proposed to myself to get him well down the river in a boat, certainly well beyond Gravesend which was a critical place for search or inquiry if suspicion were afoot. 
as foreign steamers would leave london at about the time of high water our plan would be to get down to the river by a previous ebb tide and lie by in some quiet spot until we could pull off to one the time when one would be due where we lay wherever that might be could be calculated pretty nearly if we made inquiries beforehand herbert assented to all this and we went out immediately after breakfast to pursue our investigations we found that a steamer for hamburg was likely to suit our purpose best we directed our thoughts chiefly to that vessel but we noted down what other foreign steamers would leave london with the same tide and we satisfied ourselves that we knew the build and colour of each we then separated for a few hours i to get at once such passports as were necessary herbert to see start up at his lodgings we both did what we had to do without any hindrance and when we met again at one o'clock reported it done i for my part was prepared with passports herbert had seen start up and he was more than ready to join those two should pull a pair of oars we settled and i would steer our charge would be sitter and keep quiet as speed was not our object we should make way enough we arranged that Herbert should not come home to dinner before going to Mill Pond Bank that evening, that he should not go there at all tomorrow evening, Tuesday, that he should prepare Provis to come down to some stairs hard by the house on Wednesday when he saw us approach, and not sooner, that all the arrangements with him should be concluded that Monday night, and that he should be communicated with no more in any way until we took him on board. These precautions well understood by both of us, I went home. On opening the outer door of our chambers with my key, I found a letter in the box, directed to me, a very dirty letter, though not ill-written, and had been delivered by hand, of course since I left home, and its contents were these. If you are not afraid to come out to the old marshes tonight or tomorrow night at nine, and to come to the little sluice-house by the lime-kiln, you had better come. If you want information regarding your uncle Provis, you had much better come and tell no one and lose no time. You must come alone. Bring this with you. I had a load enough upon my mind before the receipt of this strange letter. What to do now I could not tell, and the worst was that I must decide quickly, or I should miss the afternoon coach, which would take me down in time for tonight. Tomorrow night I could not think of going, for it would be too close upon the time of the flight, and again, for anything I knew, the proffered information might have some important bearing on the flight itself. If I had ample time for consideration, I believe I should have still gone, having hardly any time for consideration, my watch showing me that the coach started within half an hour, I resolved to go. I should certainly not have gone but for the reference to my Uncle Provis, that coming on Wemmick's letter and the morning's busy preparation turned the scale. It is so difficult to become clearly possessed of the contents of almost any letter, in a violent hurry, that I had to read this mysterious epistle again twice, before its injunction to me to be secret got mechanically into my mind. Yielding to it in the same mechanical kind of way, I left a note in pencil for Herbert, telling him that as I should be soon going away, I knew not for how long, I had decided to hurry down and back to ascertain for myself how Miss Havisham was faring. I had then barely time to get my greatcoat, lock up the chambers, and make for the coach office by the short byways. If I had taken a hackney chariot and gone by the streets, I should have missed my aim. Going as I did, I caught the coach just as it came out of the yard. I was the only inside passenger jolting away knee-deep in straw when i came to myself for i really had not been myself since the receipt of the letter it had so bewildered me ensuing on the hurry of the morning the morning hurry and flutter had been great for long and anxiously as i had waited for wemmick his hint had come like a surprise at last and now i began to wonder at myself for being in the coach and to doubt whether i had sufficient reason for being there and to consider whether I should get out presently and go back, and to argue against ever heeding an anonymous communication, and, in short, to pass through all those phases of contradiction 
and indecision to which, I suppose, very few hurried people are strangers. Still, the reference to Provis by name mastered everything. I reasoned, as I had reasoned already without knowing it, if that be reasoning, in case any harm should befall him through my not going, how could I ever forgive myself? It was dark before we got down, and the journey seemed long and dreary to me, who could see little of it inside, and who could not go outside in my disabled state. Avoiding the Blue Boar, I put up at an inn of minor reputation down the town, and ordered some dinner. While it was preparing, I went to Sartis' house and inquired for Miss Havisham. She was still very ill, though considered something better. My inn had once been a part of an ancient ecclesiastical house, and I dined in a little octagonal common room like a font. As I was not able to cut my dinner, the old landlord with a shining bald head did it for me. This bringing us into conversation, he was so good as to entertain me with my own story, and of course with the popular feature that Pumblechook was my earliest benefactor and the founder of my fortunes. "'Do you know the young man?' said I. "'Know him?' repeated the landlord. "'Ever since he was no height at all. Does he ever come back to this neighbourhood? Ah, oh, he comes back, said the landlord, to his great friends now and again, and gives a cold shoulder to the man that made him. What man is that? Him that I speak of, said the landlord, Mr. Pumblechook. Is he ungrateful to no one else? No doubt he would be if he could, returned the landlord, but he can't, and why? Because Pumblechook done everything for him. Does Pumblechook say so? Say so, replied the landlord. He ain't no call to say so. But does he say so? It would turn a man's blood to white wine vinegar to hear him tell of it, sir, said the landlord. I thought, yet Joe, dear Joe, you never tell of it. Long-suffering and loving Joe, you never complain, nor you, sweet-tempered Biddy. Your appetite's been touched like by your accident, said the landlord, glancing at the bandaged arm under my coat. Try a tender a bit. No, thank you, I replied, turning from the table to brood over the fire. I can eat no more. Please take it away. I had never been struck so keenly for my thanklessness to Joe, as through the brazen impostor Pumblechook, the falser he, the truer Joe, the meaner he, the nobler Joe. My heart was deeply and most deservedly humbled as I mused over the fire for an hour or more. The striking of the clock aroused me but not from my dejection or remorse, and I got up and had my coat fastened around my neck and went out. I had previously sought in my pockets for the letter that I might refer to it again, but I could not find it and was uneasy to think that it must have been dropped in the straw of the coach. I knew very well, however, that the appointed place was the little sluice house by the lime kiln on the marshes and the hour nine. Towards the marshes I now went straight, having no time to spare. Chapter 53 It was a dark night, though the full moon rose as I left the enclosed lands and passed out upon the marshes. Beyond their dark line there was a ribbon of clear sky, hardly broad enough to hold the red large moon. In a few minutes she had ascended out of that clear field in among the piled mountains of cloud. There was a melancholy wind, and the marshes were very dismal. A stranger would have found them insupportable, and even to me they were so oppressive that I hesitated, half inclined to go back, but I knew them well and could have found my way on a far darker night, and had no excuse for returning, being there. So, having come there against my inclination, I went on against it. The direction that I took was not that in which my old home lay, nor that in which we had pursued the convicts. My back was turned towards the distant hulks as I walked on, and though I could see the old lights away on the spits of sand, I saw them over my shoulder. I knew the lime kiln as well as I knew the old battery, but they were miles apart, so that if a light had been burning at each point that night, there would have been a long strip of the blank horizon between the two bright specks. At first I had to shut some gates after me, and now and then to stand still while the cattle were lying in the banked-up pathway arose and blundered down among the grass and reeds. 
but after a little while I seemed to have the whole flats to myself. It was another half-hour before I drew near to the kiln. The lime was burning with a sluggish stifling smell, but the fires were made up and left, and no workmen were visible. Hard by was a small stone quarry. It lay directly in my way and had been worked that day, as I saw by the tools and barrows that were lying about. Coming up again to the marsh level out of this excavation, for the rude path lay through it, I saw a light in the old slew's house. I quickened my pace and knocked at the door with my hand. Waiting for some reply, I looked about me, noticing how the sluice was abandoned and broken, and how the house, of wood with a tiled roof, would not be proof against the weather much longer, if it were so even now, and how the mud and ooze were coated with lime, and how the choking vapour of the kiln crept in a ghostly way towards me. Still there was no answer, and I knocked again. No answer still, and I tried the latch. It rose under my hand, and the door yielded. Looking in, I saw a lighted candle on the table, a bench, and a mattress on a truckle bedstead. As there was a loft above, I called, Is there anyone here? But no voice answered. Then I looked at my watch, and finding that it was past nine, called again. Is there any one here? There still being no answer, I went out at the door, irresolute what to do. It was beginning to rain fast. Seeing nothing save what I had seen already, I turned back into the house, and stood just within the shelter of the doorway, looking out into the night. While I was considering that someone must have been there lately, and must soon be coming back, or the candle would not be burning, it came into my head to look if the wick were long. I turned round to do so, and had taken up the candle in my hand, when it was extinguished by some violent shock, and the next thing I comprehended was that I had been caught in a strong running noose thrown over my head from behind. Now, said a suppressed voice with an oath, I've got you. What is this? I cried, struggling. Who is it? Help! 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 Not only were my arms pulled close to my sides, but the pressure on my bad arm caused me exquisite pain. Sometimes a strong man's hand, sometimes a strong man's breast, was set against my mouth to deaden my cries, and with a hot breath always close to me I struggled ineffectually in the dark while I was fastened tight to the wall. And now, said the suppressed voice with another oath, call out again and I'll make short work of you. Faint and sick with the pain of my injured arm, bewildered by the surprise, and yet conscious of how easily this threat could be put in execution, I desisted and tried to ease my arm, were it ever so little. But it was bound too tight for that. It felt as if, having been burnt before, it were now being boiled. The sudden exclusion of the night, and the substitution of black darkness in its place, warned me that the man had closed a shutter. After groping about for a little, he found the flint and steel he wanted, and began to strike a light. I strained my sight upon the sparks that fell among the tinder, and upon which he breathed and breathed, match in hand, but I could only see his lips and the blue point of the match, even those but fitfully. The tinder was damp, no wonder there, and one after another the sparks died out. The man was in no hurry, and struck again with the flint and steel. As the sparks fell thick and bright about him, I could see his hands, and touches of his face, and could make out that he was seated, and bending over the table, but nothing more. Presently I saw his blue lips again, breathing on the tinder, and then a flare of light flashed up, and showed me Orlick. Whom I had looked for, I don't know. I had not looked for him. Seeing him, I felt that I was in a dangerous strait indeed, and kept my eyes upon him. He lighted the candle from the flaring match with great deliberation, and dropped the match and trod it out. Then he put the candle away from him on the table so that he could see me, and sat with his arms folded on the table and looked at me. I made out that I was fastened to a stout perpendicular ladder a few inches from the wall, a fixture there the means of ascent to the loft above. Now, said he, when we had surveyed one another for some time, I've got you. Unbind me, let me go. 
ah he returned i'll let you go i'll let you go to the moon i'll let you go to the stars all in good time why have you lured me here don't you know said he with a deadly look why have you set upon me in the dark because i mean to do it all myself one keeps a secret better than two. Oh, you enemy you enemy his enjoyment of the spectacle i furnished as he sat with his arms folded on the table shaking his head at me and hugging himself had a malignity in it that made me tremble as i watched him in silence he put his hand into the corner at his side and took up a gun with a brass-bound stock do you know this said he making as if he would take aim at me do you know where you saw it afore speak out wolf yes i answered you cost me that place you did speak what else could i do you did that and that would be enough without more how dared you come betwixt me and a young woman i liked when did i when didn't you it was you as always give old orlick a bad name to her you gave it to yourself you gained it for yourself i could have done you no harm if you had done yourself none you're a liar and you'll take any pains and spend any money to drive me out of this country will you said he repeating my words to biddy in the last interview i'd had with her now i'll tell you a piece of information it was never so well worth your while to get me out of this country as it is to-night ah if it was all your money twenty times told to the last brass farden as he shook his heavy hand at me with his mouth snarling like a tiger's i felt that it was true what are you going to do to me i'm a-going said he bringing his fist down upon the table with a heavy blow and rising as the blow fell to give it a greater force i'm a-going to have your life he leaned forward staring at me slowly unclenched his hand and drew it across his mouth as if his mouth watered for me and sat down again you was always in old orlick's way ever since you was a child you goes out of his way this present night he'll have no more of you you're dead i felt i had come to the brink of my grave for a moment i looked wildly round my trap for any chance of escape but there was none more than that said he folding his arms on the table again i won't have a rag of you i won't have a bone of you left on earth i'll put your body in the kiln i'll carry two such to it on my shoulders and let people suppose what they may of you they shall never know nothing my mind with inconceivable rapidity followed out all the consequences of such a death estella's father would believe i had deserted him would be taken would die accusing me even herbert would doubt me when he compared the letter i had left for him with the fact that i had called at miss havisham's only for a moment joe and biddy would never know how sorry i had been that night none would ever know what i had suffered how true i had meant to be what an agony i had passed through the death close before me was terrible but far more terrible than death was the dread of being misremembered after death and so quick were my thoughts that i saw myself despised by unborn generations estella's children and their children while the wretch's words were yet on his lips now wolf said he afore i kill you like any other beast which is what i mean to do and what i have tied you up for i have a good look at you and a good goad at you o oh, you enemy it had passed through my thoughts to cry out for help again though few could know better than i the solitary nature of the spot and the hopelessness of aid but as he sat gloating over me i was supported by a scornful detestation of him that sealed my lips above all things i resolved that i would not entreat him and that i would die making some last poor resistance to him softened as my thoughts of all the rest of men were in that dire extremity humbly beseeching pardon as i did of heaven melted at heart as i was by the thought that i had taken no farewell and never now could take farewell of those who were dear to me or could explain myself to them or ask for their compassion on my miserable errors still if i could have killed him even in dying i would have done it he had been drinking and his eyes were red and bloodshot around his neck was slung a tin bottle 
as I had often seen his meat and drink slung about him in other days. He brought the bottle to his lips and took a fiery drink from it, and I smelt the strong spirits that I saw flash into his face. Wolf, said he, folding his arm again, old Orlick's going to tell you something. It was you as did for your shrew sister. Again my mind, with its former inconceivable rapidity, had exhausted the whole subject of the attack upon my sister, her illness and her death, before his slow and hesitating speech had formed these words. It was you, villain, said I. I tell you it was your doing. I tell you it was done through you, he retorted, catching up the gun and making a blow with a stock at the vacant air between us. I come upon her from behind as I come upon you tonight. I give it her, I left her for dead. And if there'd been a lime kiln, as nigh her as there is now nigh you, she shouldn't have come to life again. But it weren't old Orlick as did it, it was you. You was favoured, and he was bullied and beat. Old Orlick bullied and beat her. Now you pays for it, you done it, now you pays for it. He drank again and became more ferocious. I saw by his tilting of the bottle that there was no great quantity left in it. I distinctly understood that he was working himself up with its contents to make an end of me. I knew that every drop it held was a drop of my life. I knew that when I was changed into a part of the vapour that had crept towards me but a little while before, like my own warning ghost, he would do as he had done in my sister's case, and make all haste to the town, and he'd be seen slouching about there drinking at the alehouses. My rapid mind pursued him to the town, made a picture of the street with him in it, and contrasted its lights and life with the lonely marsh and the white vapour creeping over it, into which I should have dissolved. It was not only that I could have summoned up years and years while he said a dozen words, but that what he did say presented pictures to me and not mere words in the excited and exalted state of my brain. I could not think of a place without seeing it or of persons without seeing them. It is impossible to overstate the vividness of these images, and yet I was so intent all the time upon himself, who would not be intent on the tiger crouching to spring, that I knew of the slightest action of his fingers. When he had drunk this second time, he rose from the bench on which he sat, and pushed the table aside. Then he took up the candle, and shading it with his murderous hand, so as to throw its light on me, stood before me, looking at me and enjoying the sight. Wolf, I'll tell you something more. It was old Orlick you tumbled over on your stairs that night. I saw the staircase with its extinguished lamps. I saw the shadows of the heavy stair rails thrown by the watchman's lantern on the wall. I saw the rooms that I was never to see again. Here a door half open, there a door closed, all the articles of furniture around. And why was old Orlick there? I'll tell you something more, Wolf. You and her have pretty well hunted me out of this country, so far as getting an easy living in it goes, and I've took up with new companions and new masters. Some of them writes my letters when I want some wrote. Do you mind? Writes my letters, Wolf. They writes fifty hands. They're not like sneaking you as writes but one. I've had a firm mind and a firm will to have your life since you was down here at your sister's burying. I hence in a way to get you safe, and I've looked arter you to know your ins and outs. For, says old Orlick to himself, somehow or another I'll have him. What, when I looks for you, I finds your uncle Provisor, Mill Pond Bank and Chink's Basin, and the old green copper rope work, all so clear and plain. Provis in his rooms, the signal whose use was over, pretty Clara, the good motherly woman, old Bill Barley on his back, all drifting by, as on the swift stream of my life, fast running out to sea. You with an uncle, too, why I'd a knowed you at Gargery's when you was so small a wolf that I could have took your weasen betwixt this finger and thumb and chucked you away dead, as I had thoughts of doing odd times when I see you loitering among the pollards on a Sunday. And you hadn't found no uncles then, no, not you, but when old Orlick came for to hear that your uncle Provis had most like wore the leg iron what old Orlick had picked up filed asunder on these meshes ever so many years ago, 
and what he kept by him till he dropped your sister with it like a bullock as he means to drop you hey when he come for to hear that eh in his savage taunting he flared the candle so close at me that i turned my face aside to save it from the flame ah he cried laughing after doing it again the burnt child dreads of fire old orlick knowed you was burnt old orlick knowed you was smuggling your uncle provis away old orlick's a match for you and knowed you'd come to-night now i'll tell you something more wolf and this ends it there's them that's a good match for your uncle provis as old orlick has been for you let him wear them when he's lost his nevy let him wear them when no man can't find a rag of his dear relation's clothes nor yet a bone of his body there's them that can't and won't have magwitch yes i know the name alive in the same land with them and that's had such sure information of him when he was alive in another land that he couldn't and shouldn't leave it unbeknown and put them in danger perhaps it's them that writes fifty hands and that's not like sneaking as you at writes but one wear compass and magwitch and the gallows he flared the candle at me again smoking my face and hair and for an instant blinding me and turned his powerful back as he replaced the light on the table i had thought a prayer and had been with joe and biddy and herbert before he turned towards me again there was a clear space of a few feet between the table and the opposite wall within this space he now slouched backwards and forwards his great strength seemed to sit stronger upon him than ever before as he did this with his hands hanging loose and heavy at his sides and with his eyes scowling at me i had no grain of hope left wild as my inward hurry was and wonderful the force of the pictures that rushed by me instead of thoughts i could yet clearly understand that unless he had resolved that i was within a few moments of surely perishing out of all human knowledge he would never have told me what he had told of a sudden he stopped, took the cork out of his bottle and tossed it away. Light as it was, I heard it fall like a plummet. He swallowed slowly, tilting up the bottle by little and little, and now he looked at me no more. The last few drops of liquor he poured into the palm of his hand and licked up. Then, with a sudden hurry of violence and swearing horribly, he threw the bottle from him and stooped, and I saw in his hand a stone hammer with a long heavy handle the resolution i had made did not desert me for without uttering one vain word of appeal to him i shouted out with all my might and struggled with all my might it was only my head and legs that i could move but to that extent i struggled with all the force until then unknown that was within me in the same instant i heard responsive shouts saw figures and a gleam of light dash at the door heard voices and tumult and saw Orlick emerge from a struggle of men as if it were tumbling water, clear the table at a leap and fly out into the night. After a blank I found that I was lying unbound on the floor, in the same place with my head on someone's knee. My eyes were fixed on the ladder against the wall when I came to myself. I had opened on it before my mind saw it, and thus as I recovered consciousness I knew that I was in the place where I had lost it. Too indifferent at first even to look around and ascertain who supported me, I was lying looking at the ladder when there came between me and it a face, the face of Trab's boy. I think he's all right, said Trab's boy in a sober voice, but ain't he just pale though? At these words the face of him who supported me looked over into mine, and I saw my supporter to be Herbert! great heaven softly said herbert gently handle don't be too eager and our old comrade start up i cried as he too bent over me remember what he is going to assist us in said herbert and be calm the illusion made me spring up though i dropped again from the pain in my arm the time has not gone by herbert has it what night is to-night how long have i been here for i had a strange and strong misgiving i have been lying there a long time a day and a night two days and nights more the time has not gone by it's still monday night thank god and you have all to-morrow tuesday to rest in said herbert but you can't help groaning my dear handel what hurt have you got can you stand 
"'Yes, yes,' said I, "'I can walk. I have no hurt but this throbbing arm.' They laid it bare and did what they could. It was violently swollen and inflamed, and I could scarcely endure to have it touched. But they tore up their handkerchiefs to make fresh bandages, and carefully replaced it in the sling until we could get to the town and obtain some cooling lotion to put upon it. In a little while we had shut the door of the dark and empty sluice-house, and were passing through the quarry on our way back. Trab's boy, Trab's overgrown young man now, went before us with a lantern, which was the light I had seen come in at the door. But the moon was a good two hours higher than when I had last seen the sky, and the night, though rainy, was much lighter. The white vapour of the kiln was passing from us as we went by, and as I had thought a prayer before, I thought of thanksgiving now. Entreating Herbert to tell me how he had come to my rescue, which at first he had flatly refused to do, but had insisted on my remaining quiet, I learnt that I had, in my hurry, dropped the letter open in our chambers, where he, coming home, to bring with him Startop, who he had met in the street on his way to me, found it very soon after I was gone. Its tone made him uneasy, and the more so because of the inconsistency between it and the hasty letter I had left for him, his uneasiness increasing instead of subsiding after a quarter of an hour's consideration, he set off for the coach office with Startop, who volunteered his company, to make inquiry when the next coach went down. Finding that the afternoon coach was gone, and finding that his uneasiness grew into positive alarm, as obstacles came in his way, he resolved to follow in a post-chase. So he and Startop arrived at the Blue Boar, fully expecting there to find me, or tidings of me, but finding neither went on to Miss Havisham's, where they lost me. Hereupon they went back to the hotel, doubtless at about the time when I was hearing the popular local version of my own story, to refresh themselves and to get someone to guide them out upon the marshes. Among the loungers under the Boar's archway happened to be Trab's boy. True to his ancient habit of happening to be everywhere where he had no business, and Trab's boy had seen me passing from Miss Havisham's in the direction of my dining place. Thus Trab's boy became their guide, and with him they went out to the sluice house, though by the town way to the marshes which I had avoided. Now as they went along, Herbert reflected that I might, after all, have been brought there on some genuine serviceable errand tending to Provis's safety, and bethinking himself in that case interruption must be mischievous, left his guide and start up on the edge of the quarry, and went on by himself, and stole round the house two or three times, endeavouring to ascertain whether all was right within. As he could hear nothing but indistinct sounds of one deep rough voice, this was while my mind was so busy, he even at last began to doubt whether I was there, when suddenly I cried out loudly, and he answered the cries and rushed in, closely followed by the other two. When I told Herbert what had passed within the house, he was for our immediately going before a magistrate in the town, late at night as it was, and getting out a warrant, but I had already considered that such a course, by detaining us there, or binding us to come back, might be fatal to Provis. There was no gainsaying this difficulty, and we relinquished all thoughts of pursuing Orlick at that time. For the present, under the circumstances, we deemed it prudent to make rather light of the matter to Trab's boy, who, I am convinced, would have been much affected by disappointment if he had known that his intervention had saved me from the lime kiln. Not that Trab's boy was of a malignant nature, but that he had too much spare vivacity and that it was in his constitution to want variety and excitement at anybody's expense. When we parted, I presented him with two guineas, which seemed to meet his views, and told him that I was sorry to ever have had an ill opinion of him, which made no impression on him at all. Wednesday, being so close upon us, we determined to go back to London that night, three in the post-chase the rather as we should then be clear away before the night's adventure began to be talked of. Herbert got a large bottle of stuff for my arm, and by dint of having this stuff dropped over it all the night through, I was just able to bear its pain on the journey. It was daylight when we reached the temple, 
and we went at once to bed, and lay in bed all day. My terror as I lay there of falling ill and being unfitted for tomorrow was so besetting that I wonder it did not disable me of itself. It would have done so pretty surely in conjunction with the mental wear and tear I had suffered, but for the unnatural strain upon me that tomorrow was. So anxiously looked forward to, charged with such consequences, its results so impenetrably hidden, though so near. No precaution could have been more obvious than our refraining from communication with him that day. Yet this again increased my restlessness. I started at every footstep and every sound, believing that he was discovered and taken, and this was the messenger to tell me so. I persuaded myself that I knew he was taken, that there was something more upon my mind than a fear or a presentiment, that the fact had occurred, and I had a mysterious knowledge of it. As the days wore on and no ill news came, as the day closed in and the darkness fell, my overshadowing dread of being disabled by illness before tomorrow morning altogether mastered me. My burning arm throbbed and my burning head throbbed, and I fancied I was beginning to wander. I counted up to high numbers to make sure of myself, and repeated passages that I knew in prose and verse. It happened sometimes that in the mere escape of a fatigued mind, I dozed for some moments or forgot. Then I would say to myself with a start, now it has come and I am turning delirious. They kept me very quiet all day, and my arm constantly dressed, and gave me cooling drinks. Whenever I fell asleep, I awoke with the notion I had in the sluice house, that a long time had elapsed, and the opportunity to save him was gone. About midnight I got out of bed and went to Herbert with the conviction that I had been asleep for four and twenty hours, and that Wednesday was past. It was the last self-exhausting effort of my fretfulness, for after that I slept soundly. Wednesday morning was dawning when I looked out of the window. The winking lights upon the bridges were already pale. The coming sun was like a marsh of fire on the horizon. The river, still dark and mysterious, was spanned by bridges that were turning coldly grey, with here and there at top a warm touch from the burning in the sky. As I looked along the clustered roofs, with church towers and spires shooting into the unusually clear air, the sun rose up, and a veil seemed to be drawn from the river, and millions of sparkles burst out upon its waters. From me, too, a veil seemed to be drawn, and I felt strong and well. Herbert lay asleep in his bed, and our old fellow student lay asleep on the sofa. I could not dress myself without help, but I made up the fire which was still burning, and got some coffee ready for them. In good time they two started up strong and well, and we admitted the sharp morning air at the windows, and looked at the tide that was still flowing towards us. "'When it turns at nine o'clock,' said Herbert cheerfully, "'look out for us, and stand ready, you over there at Mill Pond Bank.'" Chapter 54 It was one of those March days when the sun shines hot and the wind blows cold, when it's summer in the light and winter in the shade. We had our peacoats with us, and I took a bag. Of all my worldly possessions, I took no more than the few necessaries that filled the bag. Where I might go, what I might do, or when I might return, were questions utterly unknown to me. Nor did I vex my mind with them, for it was wholly set on Provis's safety. I only wondered for the passing moment, as I stopped at the door and looked back, under what altered circumstances I should next see those rooms, if ever. We loitered down to the temple stairs, and stood loitering there, as if we were not quite decided to go upon the water at all. Of course I had taken care that the boat should be ready, and everything in order. After a little show of indecision, which there was none to see but the two or three amphibious creatures belonging to our temple stairs, we went on board and cast off, Herbert in the bow, I steering. It was then about high water, half past eight. Our plan was this. The tide, beginning to run down at nine, and being with us until three, we intended still to creep on after it had turned, and row against it until dark. We should then be well in those long reaches below Gravesend, between Kent and Essex, where the river is broad and solitary. 
where the waterside inhabitants are very few, and where lone public houses are scattered here and there, of which we could choose one for a resting place. There we meant to lie by all night. The steamer for Hamburg and the steamer for Rotterdam would start from London at about nine on Thursday morning. We should know at what time to expect them according to where we were and would hail the first, so that if by any accident we were not taken aboard we should have another chance. We knew the distinguishing marks of each vessel. The relief of being at last engaged in the execution of the purpose was so great to me that I felt it difficult to realise the condition in which I had been a few hours before. The crisp air, the sunlight, the movement on the river, and the moving river itself. The road that ran with us, seeming to sympathise with us, animate us, and encourage us on, freshened me now with new hope. I felt mortified to be of so little use in the boat, but there were few better oarsmen than my two friends, and they rowed with a steady stroke that was to last all day. At that time the steam traffic on the Thames was far below its present extent, and watermen's boats were far more numerous. Of barges, sailing colliers and coasting traders there were perhaps as many as now, but of steamships great and small not a tithe or a twentieth part of so many. Early as it was, there were plenty of scullers going here and there that morning, and plenty of barges dropping down with the tide. The navigation of the river between bridges in an open boat was a much easier and commoner matter in those days than it is in these, and we went ahead among many skiffs and wherries briskly. Old London Bridge was soon passed, and Old Billingsgate Market with its oyster boats and Dutchmen, and the White Tower and Traitor's Gate, and we were in among the tiers of shipping. Here were the Leith, Aberdeen and Glasgow steamers, loading and unloading goods, and looking immensely high out of the water as we passed alongside. Here were colliers by the score and score, with the coal whippers plunging off stages on deck as counterweights to measures of coal swinging up, which were then rattled over the side into barges. Here at her moorings, was tomorrow's steamer for Rotterdam, of which we took good notice, and here tomorrow's for Hamburg, under whose bowsprit we crossed, and now I, sitting in the stern, could see with a faster beating heart Mill Pond Bank and Mill Pond Stairs. Is he there? said Herbert. Not yet. Right, he was not to come down till he saw us. Can you see his signal? Not well from here, but I think I see it. Now I see him, pull both, easy Herbert, oars. We touched the stairs lightly for a single moment and he was on board, and we were off again. He had a great boat cloak with him and a black canvas bag, and he looked as like a river pilot as my heart could have wished. Dear boy, he said, putting his arm on my shoulder as he took his seat. Faithful dear boy, well done, thank ye, thank ye. Again among the tiers of shipping, in and out, avoiding rusty chain cables, frayed hempen hawsers, and bobbing boys, sinking for the moment floating broken baskets, scattering floating chips of wood and shaving, cleaving floating scum of coal, in and out under the figurehead of the John of Sunderland making a speech to the winds, as is done by many Johns, and the Betsy of Yarmouth with a firm formality of bosom, and her knobby eyes starting two inches out of her head. In and out, hammers going in shipbuilders' yards, saws going at timber, clashing engines going at things unknown, pumps going in leaky ships, capstans going, ships going out to sea, and unintelligible sea creatures roaring curses over the bullocks at respondent lightermen. In and out, out at last upon the clearer river, where the ship's boys might take their fenders in, no longer fishing in troubled waters with them over the side, and where the festooned sails might fly out into the wind. At the stairs where we had taken him aboard, and ever since I had looked warily for any token of our being suspected, I had seen none. We certainly had not been, and at that time as certainly we were not either attended or followed by any boat. If we had been waited on by any boat, I should have run into shore, and have obliged her to go on or to make her purpose evident but we held our own without any appearance of molestation. He had his boat cloak on him, and looked, as I have said, a natural part of the scene. It was remarkable, but perhaps the wretched life he had led accounted for it, 
that he was the least anxious of any of us. He was not indifferent, for he told me that he hoped to live to see his gentleman one of the best of gentlemen in a foreign country. He was not disposed to be passive or resigned, as I understood it, but he had no notion of meeting danger halfway. When it came upon him, he confronted it, but it must come before he troubled himself. If you know, dear boy, he said to me, what it is to sit here along of my dear boy and have my smoke, after having been day by day betwixt four walls, you'd envy me, but you don't know what it is. I think I know the delights of freedom, I answered. Ah, said he, shaking his head gravely, but you don't know it equal to me. You must have been under lock and key, dear boy, to know it equal to me, but I ain't going to be low. It occurred to me as inconsistent that for any mastering idea he should have endangered his freedom, and even his life. But I reflected that perhaps freedom without danger was too much apart from all the habit of his existence to be to him what it would be to another man. I was not far out, since he said after smoking a little, You see, dear boy, when I was over yonder, t'other side of the world, I was always a-looking to this side, and it come flat to be there, for all I was growing rich. Everybody knowed Magwitch, and Magwitch would come, and Magwitch would go, and nobody's head would be troubled about him. They ain't so easy concerning me here, dear boy. Wouldn't be leastwise if they knowed where I was. If it all goes well, said I, you will be perfectly free and safe again within a few hours. Well, he returned, drawing a long breath, I hope so, and think so. He dipped his hand in the water over the boat's gunwale, and said, smiling with that softened air upon him which was not new to me, Ah, I suppose I think so, dear boy. We'd be puzzled to be more quiet and easy going than we are at present. But it's a flowing so soft and pleasant through the water, perhaps it as makes me think it. I was thinking through my smoke just then, that we can no more see to the bottom of the next few hours than we can see to the bottom of the river what I catches hold of. Nor yet we can't no more hold their tide than I can hold this. And it's run through my fingers and gone, you see, holding up his dripping hand. But for your face, I should think you're a little despondent, said I. Not a bit on it, dear boy. Comes a flowing on so quiet, and of that there rippling at the boat's head, making a sort of Sunday tune. Maybe I'm growing a trifle old besides. He put his pipe back in his mouth with an undisturbed expression of face, and sat as composed and contented as if we were already out of England. Yet he was as submissive to a word of advice as if he had been in constant terror. For when we ran ashore to get some bottles of beer into the boat, and he was stepping out, I hinted that I thought he would be safest where he was, and he said, Do you, dear boy? and quietly sat down again. The air felt cold upon the river, but it was a bright day, and the sunshine was very cheering. The tide ran strong. I took care to lose none of it, and our steady stroke carried us on thoroughly well. By imperceptible degrees, as the tide ran out, we lost more and more of the nearer woods and hills, and dropped lower and lower between the muddy banks. But the tide was yet with us when we were off Gravesend. As our charge was wrapped in his cloak, I purposely passed within a boat or two's length of the floating custom house, and so out to catch the stream, alongside of two emigrant ships, and under the bows of a large transport with troops on the forecastle, looking down at us, and soon the tide began to slacken, and the craft lying at anchor to swing, and presently they had all swung round, and the ships that were taking advantage of the new tide to get up to the pool began to crowd upon us in a fleet, and we kept under the shore as much out of the strength of the tide now as we could, standing carefully off from the low shallows and mud banks. Our oarsmen were so fresh, by dint of having occasionally let her drive with the tide for a minute or two, that a quarter of an hour's rest proved full as much as they wanted. We got ashore among some slippery stones while we ate and drank what we had with us. We looked about. It was like my own marsh country, flat and monotonous, and with a dim horizon, while the winding river turned and turned, and the great floating buoys upon it turned and turned, and everything else seemed stranded and still for now the last of the fleet of ships was round the last low point we had headed, and the last green barge, straw-laden with a brown sail, 
had followed, and some ballast lighters, shaped like a child's first rude imitation of a boat, lay low in the mud, and the little squat shoal lighthouse on open piles stood crippled in the mud on stilts and crutches, and slimy stakes stuck out of the mud, and slimy stones stuck out of the mud, and red landmarks and tide marks stuck out of the mud, and an old landing stage and an old roofless building slipped into the mud, and all about us was stagnation and mud. We pushed off again and made what way we could. It was much harder work now, but Herbert and Startop persevered, and rode and rode and rode until the sun went down. By that time the river had lifted us a little so that we could see above the bank. There was the red sun on the low level of the shore in a purple haze, fast deepening into black and there was the solitary flat marsh, and far away were the rising grounds, between which and us there seemed to be no life, save here and there in the foreground a melancholy gull. As the night was fast falling, and as the moon, being past the full, would not rise early, we held a little council, a short one, for clearly our course was to lie by at the first lonely tavern we could find. So they plied their oars once more, and I looked out for anything like a house. Thus we held on, speaking little for four or five dull miles. It was very cold, and a collier coming by us with her galley fire smoking and flaring looked like a comfortable home. The night was as dark by this time as it would be until morning, and what light we had seemed to come more from the river than the sky, as the oars in their dipping struck at a few reflected stars. At this dismal time, we were evidently all possessed by the idea that we were followed. As the tide made, it flapped heavily at irregular intervals against the shore, and whenever such a sound came, one or other of us was sure to start and look in that direction. Here and there the set of the current had worn down the bank into a little creek, and we were all suspicious of such places, and eyed them nervously. Sometimes, what was that ripple, one of us would say in a low voice, or another. Is that a boat yonder? And afterwards we would fall into a dead silence, and I would sit impatiently thinking with what an unusual amount of noise the oars worked in the tholes. At length we descried a light and a roof, and presently afterwards ran alongside a little causeway made of stones that had been picked up hard by. Leaving the rest in the boat, I stepped ashore and found the light to be in the window of a public house. It was a dirty place enough, and I dare say not unknown to smuggling adventurers. But there was a good fire in the kitchen, and there were eggs and bacon to eat, and various liquors to drink. Also there were two double-bedded rooms, such as they were, the landlord said. No other company was in the house than the landlord, his wife, and a grizzled male creature, the Jack of the Little Causeway, who was as slimy and smeary as if he had been low water mark too. With this assistant I went down to the boat again, and we all came ashore, and brought out the oars, and rudder, and boat hook, and all else, and hauled her up for the night. We made a very good meal by the kitchen fire, and then apportioned the bedrooms. Herbert and Startup were to occupy one, I and our charge the other. We found the air as carefully excluded from both, as if the air were fatal to life and there were more dirty clothes and bandboxes under the beds than I should have thought the family possessed. But we considered ourselves well off, notwithstanding, for a more solitary place we could not have found. While we were comforting ourselves by the fire after our meal, the Jack, who was sitting in a corner, and who had a bloated pair of shoes on, which he had exhibited while we were eating our eggs and bacon, as interesting relics that he had taken a few days ago from the feet of a drowned seaman washed ashore, asked me if we had seen a four-oared galley going up with the tide. When I told him no, he said she must have gone down then, and yet she took up too when she left there. He eh, must have thought better of it for some reason or other, said the Jack, and gone down. A four-oared galley, did you say, said I. A four, said the Jack, and two sitters. Did they come ashore here? They put in with a stone two-gallon jar for some beer. I'd have been glad to poison the beer myself, said the Jack, or put some rattling physic in it. Why? I know why, said the Jack. He spoke in a slushy voice, as if the mud had washed into his throat. 
he thinks said the landlord a weakly meditative man with pale eyes who seemed to rely greatly on his jack he thinks they was what they wasn't i know what i thinks observed the jack you thinks custom house jack said the landlord i do said the jack then you're wrong jack am i in the infinite meaning of his reply and his boundless confidence in his views the jack took one of his bloated shoes off looked into it knocked a few stones out of it on the kitchen floor and put it on again he did this with the air of a jack who was so right that he could afford to do anything why what do you make out that they done with their buttons then jack asked the landlord vacillating weakly done with their buttons returned the jack chucked em overboard swallowed em sewed em come up small cellar done with their buttons don't be cheeky jack remonstrated the landlord in a melancholy and pathetic way a custom house officer knows what to do with his buttons said the jack repeating the obnoxious word with the greatest contempt when they comes betwixt him and his own light a four and two sitters don't go hanging and hovering up with one tide and down with another and both with and against another without there being a custom house at the bottom of it saying which he went out in disdain and the landlord having no one to rely upon found it impracticable to pursue the subject this dialogue made us all uneasy and me very uneasy the dismal wind was muttering around the house the tide was flapping at the shore and i had a feeling that we were caged and threatened a four-oared galley hovering about in so unusual a way as to attract this notice was an ugly circumstance that i could not get rid of when i had induced provis to go up to bed i went outside with my two companions start up by this time knew the state of the case and held another council whether we should remain at the house until near the steamer's time which would be about one in the afternoon or whether we should put off early in the morning was the question we discussed on the whole we deemed it the better course to lie where we were until within an hour or so of the steamer's time and then to get out in her track and drift easily with the tide having settled to do this we returned into the house and went to bed i lay down with the greater part of my clothes on and slept well for a few hours when i awoke the wind had risen and the sign of the house the ship was creaking and banging about with noises that startled me rising softly for my charge lay fast asleep i looked out of the window it commanded the causeway where we had hauled up our boat and as my eyes adapted themselves to the light of the clouded moon i saw two men looking into her they passed by under the window looking at nothing else they did not go down to the landing place which i could discern to be empty but struck across the marsh in the direction of the nore my first impulse was to call up herbert and show him the two men going away but reflecting before i got into his room which was at the back of the house and adjoined mine that he and startup had a harder day than i and were fatigued i forbore going back to my window i could see the two men moving over the marsh in that light however i soon lost them and feeling very cold lay down to think of the matter and fell asleep again we were up early as we walked to and fro all four together before breakfast i deemed it right to recount what i had seen again our charge was the least anxious of the party it was very likely that the men belonged to the custom house he said quietly and that they had no thought of us i tried to persuade myself that it was so as indeed it might easily be however i proposed that he and i should walk away together to a distant point we could see and that the boat should take us aboard there or as near there as might prove feasible at about noon this being considered a good precaution soon after breakfast he and i set forth without saying anything at the tavern he smoked his pipe as we went along and sometimes stopped to clap me on the shoulder one would have supposed that it was i who was in danger not he and that he was reassuring me we spoke very little as we approached the point i begged him to remain in a sheltered place while i went on to reconnoitre for it was towards it that the men had passed in the night he complied and i went on alone there was no boat off the point nor any boat drawn up anywhere near it nor were there any signs of the men having embarked there but to be sure the tide was high 
and there might have been some footprints under water. When he looked out from his shelter in the distance and saw that I waved my hat for him to come up, he rejoined me, and there we waited, sometimes lying on the bank wrapped in our coats, and sometimes moving about to warm ourselves, until we saw our boat coming round. We got aboard easily and rowed out into the track of the steamer. By that time it wanted but ten minutes of one o'clock, and we began to look out for her smoke. But it was half-past one before we saw her smoke and soon afterwards we saw behind it the smoke of another steamer. As they were coming on at full speed, we got the two bags ready, and took that opportunity of saying good-bye to Herbert and Startop. We had all shaken hands cordially, and neither Herbert's eyes nor mine were quite dry, when I saw a four-oared galley shoot out from under the bank, but a little way ahead of us, and row out into the same track. A stretch of shore had been as yet between us and the steamer's smoke, by reason of the bend and the wind of the river, but now she was visible coming head on. I called to Herbert and Startop to keep before the tide, that she might see us lying by for her, and I adjured Provis to sit quite still, wrapped in his cloak. He answered cheerily, Trust to me, dear boy, and sat like a statue. Meantime the galley, which was very skilfully handled, had crossed us. Let us come up with her and fallen alongside leaving just enough room for the play of the oars she kept alongside drifting when we drifted and pulling a stroke or two when we pulled of the two sitters one held the rudder lines and looked at us attentively as did the rowers the other sitter was wrapped up much as provis was and seemed to shrink and whisper some instruction to the steerer as he looked at us not a word was spoken in either boat Startop could make out after a few minutes which steamer was first, and gave me the word Hamburg in a low voice, as we sat face to face. She was nearing us very fast, and the beating of her paddles grew louder and louder. I felt as if her shadow were absolutely upon us when the galley hailed us. I answered. You have a return transport there, said the man who held the lines. That's the man wrapped in the cloak. His name is Abel Magwitch, otherwise Provis. I apprehend that man, and call upon him to surrender, and you to assist. At the same moment, without giving any audible direction to his crew, he ran the galley abroad of us. They had pulled up one sudden stroke ahead, and got their oars in, and had run athwart us, and were holding on to our gunwale, before we knew what they were doing. This caused great confusion on board the steamer, and I heard them calling to us, and I heard the order given to stop the paddles, and I heard them stop but felt a driving down upon us irresistibly. In the same moment I saw the steersman of the galley lay his hand on his prisoner's shoulder, and saw that both boats were swinging round with the force of the tide, and saw that all hands on board the steamer were running forward quite frantically. Still, in the same moment I saw the prisoner start up, lean across his captor, and pull the cloak from the neck of the shrinking sitter in the galley. Still in the same moment I saw that the face disclosed was the face of the other convict of long ago. Still in the same moment I saw the face tilt backward with a white terror on it that I shall never forget, and heard a great cry on board the steamer, and a loud splash in the water, and felt the boat sink from under me. It was but for an instant that I seemed to struggle with a thousand mill weirs and a thousand flashes of light. That instant passed, I was taken on board the galley. Herbert was there and Startup was there, but our boat was gone, and the two convicts were gone. What with the cries aboard the steamer, and the furious blowing off of her steam, and her driving on and our driving on, I could not at first distinguish sky from water, or shore from shore. But the crew of the galley righted her with great speed, and pulling certain swift long strokes ahead, lay upon their oars, every man looking silently and eagerly at the water astern. Presently a dark object was seen in it, bearing towards us on the tide. No man spoke, but the steersman held up his hand, and all softly backed water, and kept the boat straight and true before it. As it came nearer I saw it to be Magwitch, swimming but not swimming freely. He was taken on board, and instantly manacled at the wrists and ankles. The galley was kept steady, and the silent, eager look out at the water was returned. 
but the rotterdam steamer now came up and apparently not understanding what had happened came on at speed by the time she had been hailed and stopped both steamers were drifting away from us and we were rising and falling in a troubled wake of water the lookout was kept long after all was still again and the two steamers were gone but everybody knew that it was hopeless now at length we gave it up and pulled under the shore towards the tavern we had lately left where we were received with no little surprise here i was able to get some comforts for magwitch provis no longer who had received some very severe injury in the chest and a deep cut in the head he told me that he believed himself to have gone under the keel of the steamer and to have been struck on the head in rising the injury to his chest which rendered his breathing extremely painful he thought he had received against the side of the galley he added that he did not pretend to say what he might or might not have done to compison but that in the moment of his laying hand upon his cloak to identify him that villain had staggered up and staggered back and they had both gone overboard together when the sudden wrenching of him, Magwitch, out of our boat, and the endeavour of his captor to keep him in it, had capsized us. He told me in a whisper that they had gone down fiercely locked in each other's arms, and that there had been a struggle under water, and that he had disengaged himself, struck out and swum away. I never had any reason to doubt the exact truth of what he thus told me. The officer who steered the galley gave the same account of their going overboard. When I asked this officer's permission to change the prisoner's wet clothes by purchasing any spare garments I could get at the public house, he gave it readily, merely observing that he must take charge of everything his prisoner had about him. So the pocket book which had once been in my hands passed into the officer's. He further gave me leave to accompany the prisoner to London, but declined to accord that grace to my two friends. The jack at the ship was instructed where the drowned man had gone down and undertook to search for the body, in the places where it was likeliest to come ashore. His interest in its recovery seemed to me to be much heightened when he heard that it had stockings on. Probably it took about a dozen drowned men to fit him out completely, and that may have been the reason why the different articles of his dress were in various stages of decay. We remained at the public house until the tide turned, and then Magwitch was carried down to the galley and put on board. Herbert and Startup were to get to London by land as soon as they could. We had a doleful parting, and when I took my place by Magwitch's side, I felt that it was my place henceforth while he lived. For now my repugnance to him had all melted away, and in the hunted, wounded, shackled creature who held my hand in his, I only saw a man who had meant to be my benefactor, and who had felt affectionately, gratefully and generously towards me, with great constancy through a series of years, I only saw in him a much better man than I had been to Joe. His breathing became more difficult and painful as the night drew on, and often he could not repress a groan. I tried to rest him on the arm I could use in any easy position, but it was dreadful to think that I could not be sorry at heart for his being badly hurt, since it was unquestionably the best that he should die that there were, still living, people enough who were able and willing to identify him, I could not doubt. That he would be leniently treated, I could not hope. He who had been presented in the worst light at his trial, who had since broken prison and had been tried again, who had returned from transportation under a life sentence, and who had occasioned the death of the man who was the cause of his arrest. As we returned towards the setting sun we had yesterday left behind us, and as the stream of our hope seemed all running back, I told him how grieved I was to think that he had come home for my sake. Dear boy, he answered, I'm quite content to take my chance. I've seen my boy, and he could be a gentleman without me. No, I had thought about that while we had been there side by side. No, apart from any inclinations of my own, I understood Wemmick's hint now. I foresaw that being convicted, his possessions would be forfeited to the crown. Looky here, dear boy, said he, it's best as a gentleman should not be know to belong to me now, only come to see me as if you come by chance along a Wemmick. Sit where I can see you when I'm swore to, for the last of many times, and I don't ask no more. I will never stir from your side, said I, when I am suffered to be near you, 
Please, God, I will be as true to you as you have been to me. I felt his hand tremble as it held mine, and he turned his face away as he lay in the bottom of the boat, and I heard that old sound in his throat, softened now like all the rest of him. It was a good thing that he had touched this point, for it put into my mind what I might not otherwise have thought of until too late, that he need never know how his hopes of enriching me had perished. Chapter 55 He was taken to the police court next day, and would have been immediately committed for trial, but that it was necessary to send down for an old officer of the prison ship from which he had once escaped, to speak to his identity. Nobody doubted it, but Compison, who had meant to depose to it, was tumbling on the tides, dead, and it happened that there was not at any time any prison officer in London who could give the required evidence. I had gone direct to Mr. Jaggers at his private house, on my arrival overnight, to retain his assistance, and Mr. Jaggers, on the prisoner's behalf, would admit nothing. It was the sole resource, for he told me that the case must be over in five minutes when the witness was there, and no power on earth could prevent its going against us. I imparted to Mr. Jaggers my design of keeping him in ignorance of the fate of his wealth. Mr. Jaggers was querulous and angry with me for having let it slip through my fingers, and said we must memorialise by and by and try at all events for some of it. But he did not conceal from me that although there might be many cases in which the forfeiture would not be exacted, there were no circumstances in this case to make it one of them. I understood that very well. I was not related to the outlaw, nor connected with him by any recognisable tie. He had put his hand to no writing or settlement in my favour before his apprehension, and to do so now would be idle. I had no claim, and I had finally resolved and ever afterwards abided by the resolution that my heart should never be sickened with the hopeless task of attempting to establish. There appeared to be reason for supposing that the drowned informer had hoped for a reward out of this forfeiture, and had obtained some accurate knowledge of Magwitch's affairs. When his body was found, many miles from the scene of his death, and so horribly disfigured, that he was only recognisable by the contents of his pockets, Notes were still legible, folded in a case he carried. Among these were the name of a banking house in New South Wales, where a sum of money was, and the designation of certain lands of considerable value. Both these heads of information were in a list that Magwitch, while in prison, gave to Mr. Jaggers of the possessions he supposed I should inherit. His ignorance, poor fellow, at last served him. He never mistrusted but that my inheritance was quite safe with Mr. Jagger's aid. After three days' delay, during which the Crown prosecution stood over for the production of the witness from the prison ship, the witness came and completed the easy case. He was committed to take his trial at the next sessions, which would come on in a month. It was at this dark time of my life that Herbert returned home one evening, a good deal cast down, and said, My dear Handel, I fear I shall soon have to leave you. His partner, having prepared me for that, I was less surprised than he thought. We shall lose a fine opportunity if I put off going to Cairo, and I am very much afraid I must go handle when you most need me. Herbert, I shall always need you, because I shall always love you, but my need is no greater now than at another time. You will be so lonely. I have not leisure to think of that, said I. You know that I am always with him to the full extent of the time allowed, and that I should be with him all day long if I could, and when I come away from him you know that my thoughts are with him. The dreadful condition to which he was brought was so appalling to both of us that we could not refer to it in plainer words. My dear fellow, said Herbert, let the near prospect of our separation, for it's very near, be my justification for troubling you about yourself. Have you thought of your future? No, for I have been afraid to think of any future. But yours cannot be dismissed. Indeed, my dear Handel, it must not be dismissed. I wish you would enter on it now, as far as a few friendly words go, with me. I will, said I. In this branch house of ours, Handel, we must have a... I saw that his delicacy was avoiding the right word, so I said, a clerk. 
a clerk and i hope it is not at all unlikely that he may expand as a clerk of your acquaintance has expanded into a partner now handle in short my dear boy will you come to me there was something charmingly cordial and engaging in the manner in which after saying now handle as if it were the grave beginning of a portentous business exordium he had suddenly given up that tone stretched out his honest hand and spoken like a schoolboy clara and i have talked about it again and again herbert pursued and the dear little thing begged me only this evening with tears in her eyes to say to you that if you will live with us when we come together she will do her best to make you happy and to convince her husband's friend that he is her friend too we should get on so well handel i thanked her heartily and i thanked him heartily but said i could not yet make sure of joining him as he so kindly offered firstly my mind was too preoccupied to be able to take in the subject clearly secondly yes secondly there was a vague something lingering in my thoughts that will come out very near the end of this slight narrative but if you thought herbert that you could without doing any injury to your business leave the question open for a little while for any while cried herbert six months a year not as long as that said i two or three months at most herbert was highly delighted when we shook hands on this arrangement and said he could now take courage to tell me that he believed he must go away at the end of the week and clara said i the dear little thing returned herbert holds dutifully to her father as long as he lasts but he won't last long mrs wimple confides to me that he is certainly going not to say an unfeeling thing said i he cannot do better than go i'm afraid that must be admitted said herbert and then i shall come back for the dear little thing and the dear little thing and i will walk quietly into the nearest church remember the blessed darling comes of no family my dear handel and never looked into the red book and hasn't a notion about her grandpapa what a fortune for the son of my mother on saturday in that same week i took my leave of herbert full of bright hope but sad and sorry to leave me as he sat on one of the seaport mail coaches i went into a coffee house to write a little note to clara telling her he had gone off sending his love to her over and over again and then went to my lonely home if it deserved the name for it was now no home to me and i had no home anywhere on the stairs i encountered wemmick who was coming down after an unsuccessful application of his knuckles to my door i had not seen him alone since the disastrous issue of the attempted flight and he had come in his private and personal capacity to say a few words of explanation in reference to that failure the late compison said wemmick had by little and little got at the bottom of half of the regular business now transacted and it was from the talk of some of his people in trouble some of his people always being in trouble that i heard what i did i kept my ears open seeming to have them shut until i heard that he was absent and i thought that that would be the best time for making the attempt i can only suppose now that was part of his policy as a very clever man habitually to deceive his own instruments you don't blame me i hope mr pip i'm sure i tried to serve you with all my heart i am as sure of that wemmick as you can be and thank you most earnestly for all of your interest and friendship thank you thank you very much it's a bad job said wemmick scratching his head and i assure you i haven't been so cut up for a long time what i look at is the sacrifice of so much portable property dear me what i think of wemmick is the poor owner of the property yes to be sure said wemmick of course there can be no objection to your being sorry for him and i'd put down a five pound note myself to get him out of it but what i look at is this the late compison having been beforehand with him in intelligence of his return and being so determined to bring him to book i do not think he could have been saved whereas the portable property certainly could have been saved that's the difference between the property and the owner, don't you see? I invited Wemmick to come upstairs and refresh himself with a glass of grog before walking to Walworth. He accepted the invitation. While he was drinking his moderate allowance, he said with nothing to lead up to it, and after having appeared rather fidgety, What do you think of my meaning to take a holiday on Monday, Mr. Pip? Why, I suppose you have not done such a thing these twelve months. These twelve years, more likely, said Wemmick. 
Yes, I'm going to take a holiday. More than that, I'm going to take a walk. More than that, I'm going to ask you to take a walk with me. I was about to excuse myself, as being but a bad companion just then, when Wemmick anticipated me. I know your engagement, said he, and I know you're out of sorts, Mr. Pip, but if you could oblige me, I should take it as a kindness. It ain't a long walk, and it's an early one. Say it might occupy you, including breakfast on the walk, from eight to twelve. Couldn't you stretch a point and manage it? He had done so much for me at various times that this was very little to do for him. I said I could manage it, would manage it, and he was so very much pleased by my acquiescence that I was pleased too. At his particular request I appointed to call for him at the castle at half past eight on Monday morning, and so we parted for the time. Punctual to my appointment, I rang at the castle gate on Monday morning and was received by Wemmick himself, who struck me as looking tighter than usual and having a sleeker hat on. Within there were two glasses of rum and milk prepared and two biscuits. The aged must have been stirring with a lark, for glancing into the perspective of his bedroom, I observed that his bed was empty. When we had fortified ourselves with the rum and milk and biscuits, and were going out for the walk with that training preparation on us, I was considerably surprised to see Wemmick take up a fishing rod and put it over his shoulder. "'Why, we are not going fishing,' said I. "'No,' returned Wemmick, "'but I like to walk with one.' I thought this odd. However, I said nothing, and we set off. We went towards Camberwell Green, and when we were thereabouts, Wemmick said suddenly, "Halloa! here's a church.' There was nothing very surprising in that, but again I was rather surprised, and when he said, as if he were animated by a brilliant idea, let's go in. We went in, Wemmick leaving his fishing rod in the porch, and looked all round. In the meantime, Wemmick was diving into his coat pockets, and getting something out of paper there. Halloa, said he, here's a couple of pair of gloves, let's put them on. As the gloves were white kid gloves, and as the post office was widened to its utmost extent, I now began to have my strong suspicions. They were strengthened into certainty when I beheld the aged enter at a side door, escorting a lady. Hello, said Wemmick. Here's Miss Skiffkins. Let's have a wedding. That discreet damsel was attired as usual, except that she was now engaged in substituting for her green kid gloves a pair of white. The aged was likewise occupied in preparing a similar sacrifice for the altar of Hymen. The old gentleman, however, experienced so much difficulty in getting his gloves on that Wemmick found it necessary to put him with his back against a pillar, and then to get behind the pillar himself and pull away at them, while I, for my part, held the old gentleman around the waist that he might present an equal and safe resistance. By dint of this ingenious scheme his gloves were got on to perfection. The clerk and the clergyman then appearing, we were ranged in order at those fatal rails. True to his notion of seeming to do it all without preparation, I heard Wemmick say to himself, as he took something out of his waistcoat pocket before the service began, Halloa, here's the ring. I acted in the capacity of backer, or best man to the bridegroom, while a little limp pew-opener in a soft bonnet like a baby's made a feint of being the bosom friend of Miss Skiffkin's. The responsibility of giving the lady away devolved upon the aged, which led to the clergyman's being unintentionally scandalised, and it happened thus. When he said, Who giveth this woman to be married to this man? The old gentleman, not in the least knowing what point of the ceremony we had arrived at, stood most amiably beaming at the Ten Commandments, upon which the clergyman said again, Who giveth this woman to be married to this man? the old gentleman still in a state of most estimable unconsciousness, the bridegroom cried out in his accustomed voice, Now, aged P, you know who giveth, to which the aged replied with great briskness before saying that he gave, All right, John, all right, my boy, and the clergyman came to so gloomy a pause upon it that I had doubts for the moment whether we should get completely married that day. It was completely done, however, and when we were going out of church, Wemmick took the cover off the font, and put his white gloves in it, and put the cover on again. Mrs. Wemmick, more heedful of the future, put her white gloves in her pocket, and assumed her green. Now, Mr. Pip, said Wemmick triumphantly, shouldering the fishing rod as we came out, let me ask you whether anybody would suppose this to be a wedding party. Breakfast had been ordered at a pleasant little tavern, 
a mile or so away upon the rising ground beyond the green, and there was a bagatelle board in the room, in case we should desire to unbend our minds after the solemnity. It was pleasant to observe that Mrs. Wemmick no longer unwound Wemmick's arm when it adapted itself to her figure, but sat in a high back chair against the wall like a violin cello in its case, and submitted to be embraced as that melodious instrument might have done. We had an excellent breakfast, and when anyone declined anything on the table, Wemmick said, Provided by contract, you know, don't be afraid of it. I drank to the new couple, drank to the aged, drank to the castle saluted the bride at parting, and made myself as agreeable as I could. Wemmick came down to the door with me, and again I shook hands with him and wished him joy. Thank ye, said Wemmick, rubbing his hands. She's such a manager of fowls, you have no idea. You shall have some eggs to judge for yourself. I say, Mr. Pip, calling me back and speaking low, this is altogether a Walworth sentiment, please. I understand not to be mentioned in Little Britain, said I. Wemmick nodded. After what you let out the other day, Mr. Jaggers may as well not know of it. He might think my brain was softening, or something of the kind. Chapter 56 He lay in prison very ill during the whole interval between his committal for trial and the coming round of the sessions. He had two broken ribs. They had wounded one of his lungs, and he breathed with great pain and difficulty, which increased daily. It was a consequence of his hurt that he spoke so low as to be scarcely audible. Therefore he spoke very little, but he was ever ready to listen to me, and it became the first duty of my life to say to him and read to him what I knew he ought to hear. Being far too ill to remain in the common prison, he was removed, after the first day or so, into the infirmary. This gave me opportunities of being with him that I could not have otherwise have had and but for his illness he would have been put in irons, for he was regarded as a determined prison-breaker, and I know not what else. Although I saw him every day, it was only for a short time, hence the regularly recurring spaces of our separation were long enough to record in his face any slight changes that occurred in his physical state. I do not recollect that I once saw any change in it for the better. He wasted, and became slowly weaker and worse, day by day, from the day when the prison door closed upon him. The kind of submission or resignation that he showed was that of a man who was tired out. I sometimes derived an impression, from his manner, or from a whispered word or two which escaped him, that he pondered over the question whether he might have been a better man under better circumstances. But he never justified himself by a hint tending that way, or tried to bend the past out of its eternal shape. It happened on two or three occasions in my presence that his desperate reputation was alluded to by one or other of the people in attendance on him. A smile crossed his face then, and he turned his eyes on me with a trustful look, as if he were confident that I had seen some small redeeming touch in him, even so long ago as when I was a little child. As to all the rest, he was humble and contrite, and I never knew him complain. When the sessions came round, Mr. Jaggers caused an application to be made for the postponement of his trial until the following sessions. It was obviously made with the assurance that he could not live so long, and was refused. The trial came on at once, and when he was put to the bar, he was seated in a chair. No objection was made to my getting close to the dock on the outside of it, and holding the hand that he stretched forth to me. The trial was very short and very clear. Such things as could be said for him were said. How he had taken to industrious habits, and had thrived lawfully and reputably, but nothing could unsay the fact that he had returned, and was there in the presence of the judge and jury. It was impossible to try him for that, and to do otherwise than find him guilty. At that time it was the custom, as I had learnt from my terrible experience of that sessions, to devote a concluding day to the passing of sentences, and to make a finishing effect with the sentence of death. But for the indelible picture that my remembrance now holds before me, I could scarcely believe, even as I write these words, that I saw two and thirty men and women put before the judge to receive that sentence together. Foremost among the two and thirty was he, seated that he might get breath enough to keep life in him. 
the whole scene starts out again in the vivid colours of the moment down to the drops of april rain on the windows of the court glittering in the rays of april sun penned in the dock as i again stood outside it at the corner with his hand in mine were the two and thirty men and women some defiant some stricken with terror some sobbing and weeping some covering their faces some staring gloomily about there had been shrieks from among the women convicts but they had all been stilled and a hush had succeeded the sheriffs with their great chains and nosegays other civic gewgaws and monsters criers ushers a great gallery full of people a large theatrical audience looked on as the two and thirty and the judge were solemnly confronted the judge addressed them among the wretched creatures before him whom he must single out for special address was one who had almost from his infancy had been an offender against the laws who after repeated imprisonments and punishments had been at length sentenced to exile for a term of years and who under circumstances of great violence and daring had made his escape and had been resentenced to exile for life that miserable man would seem for a time to have become convinced of his errors when far removed from the scenes of his old offences and to have lived a peaceable and honest life but in a fatal moment yielding to those propensities and passions the indulgence of which had so long rendered him a scourge to society he had quitted his haven of rest and repentance and had come back to the country where he was prescribed being here presently denounced he had for a time succeeded in evading the officers of justice but being at length seized while in the act of flight he had resisted them and had he best knew whether by express design or in the blindness of his hardihood caused the death of his denouncer to whom his whole career was known the appointed punishment for his return to the land that had cast him out being death and in his case being this aggravated case he must prepare himself to die the sun was striking in at the great windows of the court through the glittering drops of rain upon the glass and it made a broad shaft of light between the two and thirty and the judge linking both together and perhaps reminding some amongst the audience how both were passing on with absolute equality to the greater judgment that knoweth all things and cannot err rising for a moment a distinct speck of face in this way of light the prisoner said my lord i have received my sentence of death from the almighty but i bow to yours and sat down again there was some hushing and the judge went on with what he had to say to the rest they were all formally doomed and some of them were supported out and some of them sauntered out with a haggard look of bravery and a few nodded to the gallery and two or three shook hands and others went out chewing the fragments of herb they had taken from the sweet herbs lying about he went last of all because of having to be helped from his chair and to go very slowly and he held my hand while all the others were removed and while the audience got up putting their dresses right as they might at church or elsewhere and pointed down at this criminal or that and most of all at him and me i earnestly hoped and prayed that he might die before the recorder's report was made but in the dread of his lingering on i began that night to write out a petition to the home secretary of state setting forth my knowledge of him and how it was that he had come back for my sake i wrote it as fervently and pathetically as i could and when i had finished it and sent it in i wrote out other petitions to such men in authority as i hoped were the most merciful and drew up one to the crown itself for several days and nights after he was sentenced i took no rest except when i fell asleep in my chair but was wholly absorbed with these appeals and after i had sent them in i could not keep away from the places where they were but felt as if they were more hopeful and less desperate when i was near them in this unreasonable restlessness and pain of mind i would roam the streets of an evening wandering by those offices and houses where i had left the petitions to the present hour the weary western streets of london on a cold dusty spring night with their ranges of stern shut-up mansions and their long rows of lamps are melancholy to me from this association the daily visits i could make him were shortened now and he was more strictly kept seeing or fancying that i was suspected of an intention of carrying poison to him 
I was asked to be searched before I sat down at his bedside, and told the officer who was always there that I was willing to do anything that would assure him of the singleness of my designs. Nobody was hard with him or with me. There was duty to be done, and it was done, but not harshly. The officer always gave me the assurance that he was worse, and some other sick prisoners in the room, and some other prisoners who attended on them as sick nurses, malefactors, but not incapable of kindness, God be thanked, always joined in the same report. As the days went on, I noticed more and more that he would lie placidly looking at the white ceiling, with an absence of light in his face, until some word of mine brightened it for an instant, and then it would subside again. Sometimes he was almost or quite unable to speak, and then he would answer me with slight pressures on my hand, and I grew to understand his meaning very well. The number of the days had risen to ten, when I saw a greater change in him than I had seen yet. His eyes were turned towards the door, and lighted up as I entered. "'Dear boy,' he said, as I sat down by his bed, "'I thought you was late, but I knowed you couldn't be that. "'It's just the time,' said I. "'I waited for it at the gate. "'You always waits at the gate, don't you, dear boy?' "'Yes, not to lose a moment of the time.' Thank you, dear boy, thank you. God bless you. You've never deserted me, dear boy. I pressed his hand in silence, for I could not forget that I had once meant to desert him. And what's best of all, he said, you've been more comfortable along of me since I was under a dark cloud than when the sun shone. That's best of all. He lay on his back, breathing with great difficulty. Do what he would, and love me though he did, the light never left his face ever and again, and a film came over the placid look at the white ceiling. Are you in much pain today? I don't complain of none, dear boy. You never do complain. He had spoken his last words. He smiled, and I understood his touch to mean that he wished to lift my hand and to lay it on his breast. I laid it there, and he smiled again, and put both his hands upon it. The allotted time ran out while we were thus, but looking round I found the governor of the prison standing near me and he whispered, you needn't go yet. I thanked him gratefully and asked, might I speak to him if he can hear me? The governor stepped aside and beckoned the officer away. The charge, though it was made without noise, drew back the film from the placid look at the white ceiling, and he looked most affectionately at me. Dear Magwitch, I must tell you now at last, you understand what I say? A gentle pressure on my hand. You had a child once whom you loved and lost. A stronger pressure on my hand. She lived and found powerful friends. She is living now. She is a lady and very beautiful, and I love her. With a last faint effort, which had been powerless but for my yielding to it and assisting it, he raised my hand to his lips. Then he gently let it sink upon his breast again, with his own hands lying on it. The placid look at the white ceiling came back and passed away, and his head dropped quietly on his breast. Mindful then of what we had read together, I thought of the two men who went up into the temple to pray, and I knew there were no better words than I could say beside his bed than, O oh Lord, be merciful to him, a sinner. Chapter 57 Now that I was left wholly to myself, I gave notice of my intention to quit the chambers in the temple as soon as my tenancy could legally determine and in the meanwhile to underlet them. At once I put bills up in windows, for I was in debt and had scarcely any money, and began to be seriously alarmed by the state of my affairs. I ought rather to write that I should have been alarmed if I had any energy and concentration enough to help me clear the perception of any truth beyond the fact that I was falling very ill. The late stress upon me had enabled me to put off illness, but not to put it away. I knew that it was coming on me now, and I knew very little else, and was even careless as to that. For a day or two I lay on the sofa or on the floor, anywhere, according as I happened to sink down, with a heavy head and aching limbs, and no purpose and no power. Then there came one night which appeared of great duration, and which teemed with anxiety and horror, and when in the morning I tried to sit up in my bed and think of it, I found I could not do so. Whether I really had been down in Garden Court in the dead of the night, groping about for the boat that I supposed to be there, 
whether I had two or three times come to myself on the staircase with great terror, not knowing how I had got out of bed, whether I had found myself lighting the lamp, possessed by the idea that he was coming up the stairs, and that the lights were blown out, whether I had been inexpressibly harassed by the distracted talking, laughing and groaning of someone, and had half suspected those sounds to be of my own making, whether there had been a closed iron furnace in a dark corner of the room, and a voice had called out over and over again that Miss Havisham was consuming within it. These were things that I tried to settle with myself, and to get into some order, as I lay that morning on my bed. But the vapour of a lime-kiln would come between me and them, disordering them all, and it was through the vapour at last I saw two men looking at me. "'What do you want?' I asked, starting. "'I don't know you.' "'Well, sir,' returned one of them, bending down and touching me on the shoulder, "'this is a matter that you'll soon arrange, I dare say, but you're arrested.' "'What's the debt?' "'A hundred and twenty-three pounds, fifteen and six. Jeweller's account, I think. What is to be done?' "'You'd better come to my house,' said the man. "'I keep a very nice house.' I made some attempt to get up and dress myself. When I next attended to them, they were standing a little off on the bed, looking at me. I still lay there. "'You see my state,' said I. "'I would come with you if I could, but indeed I am quite unable. If you take me from here, I think I shall die by the way.' Perhaps they replied, or argued the point, or tried to encourage me to believe that I was better than I thought, for as much as they hang in my memory by only this one slender thread. I don't know what they did, except that they forbore to remove me. That I had a fever and was avoided, that I suffered greatly, that I often lost my reason, that the time seemed interminable, that I confounded impossible existences with my own identity that I was a brick in the house wall, and yet entreating to be released from the giddy place where the builders had set me, that I was a steel beam of a vast engine, clashing and whirling over a gulf, and yet that I implored in my own person to have the engine stopped, and my part in it hammered off, that I passed through these phases of disease. I know of my own remembrance, and did in some sort know at the time, that I sometimes struggled with real people, in the belief that they were murderers, and that I would at once comprehend that they had meant to do me good, and would then sink exhausted in their arms, and suffer them to lay me down. I also knew at the time, but above all, I knew that there was a constant tendency in all these people, who, when I was very ill, would present all kinds of extraordinary transformations of the human face, and would be much dilated in size. Above all, I say, I knew that there was an extraordinary tendency in all these people, sooner or later, to settle down to the likeness of Joe. After I had turned the worst point of my illness, I began to notice that while all its other features changed, this one consistent feature did not change. Whoever came about me settled down into Joe. I opened my eyes in the night, and I saw in the great chair at the bedside, Joe. I opened my eyes in the day, and sitting on the window seat smoking his pipe in the shaded open window, still I saw Joe. I asked for a cooling drink, and the dear hand that gave it me was Joe's. I sank back on my pillow after drinking, and the face that looked so hopefully and tenderly upon me was the face of Joe. At last, one day, I took courage and said, Is it Joe? And the dear old home voice answered, which it are, old chap. Oh, Joe, you break my heart. Look angry at me, Joe. Joe, strike me. Joe, tell me of my ingratitude. Don't be so good to me. For Joe had actually laid his head down on the pillow at my side, and put his arm around my neck, in his joy that I knew him. Which dear old pip, old chap, said Joe, you and me was ever friends, and when you're well enough to go out for a ride, what larks! After which Joe withdrew to the window, and stood with his back towards me, wiping his eyes, and as my extreme weakness prevented me from getting up and going to him, I lay there, penitently whispering, Oh, God bless him! God bless this gentle Christian man! Joe's eyes were red when I next found him beside me, but I was holding his hand, and we both felt happy. How long, dear Joe? Which you mean to say, Pip, how long have your illness lasted, dear old chap? 
Yes, Joe. It's the end of May, Pip. Tomorrow is the first of June. And have you been here all that time, dear Joe? Pretty nigh, old chap, for as I says to Biddy, when the news of your being ill were brought by letter, which it were brought by the post, and being formerly single he is now married, though underpaid for a deal of walking and shoe leather, but wealth were not our object on his part, and marriage were the great wish of his heart. It is so delightful to hear you, Joe, but I interrupt what you said to Biddy. Which it were, said Joe, that how you might be among strangers, and that how you and me having been ever friends, a visit at such a moment might not prove unacceptable. And Biddy, her oh word were, go to him without loss of time. That, said Joe, summing up with his judicial air, were the word of Biddy. Go to him, Biddy say, without loss of time. In short, I shouldn't greatly deceive you, Joe added after a little grave reflection, if I represented to you that the word of that young woman were without a minute's loss of time. There Joe cut himself short, and informed me that I was to be talked to in great moderation, and that I was to take a little nourishment at stated frequent times, whether I felt inclined for it or not, and that I was to submit myself to all his orders. So I kissed his hand and lay quiet, while he proceeded to indite a note to Biddy, with my love in it. Evidently Biddy had taught Joe to write. As I lay in bed looking at him, it made me, in my weak state, cry again with pleasure, to see the pride with which he set about his letter. My bedstead, divested of its curtains, had been removed, with me upon it, into the sitting-room, as the airiest and largest, and the carpet had been taken away, and the room kept always fresh and wholesome night and day. At my own writing-table, pushed into a corner and cumbered with little bottles, Joe now sat down to his great work, first choosing a pen from the pen-tray as if it were a chest of large tools, and tucking up his sleeves as if he were going to wield a crowbar or a sledge-hammer. It was necessary for Joe to hold on heavily to the table with his left elbow, and to get his right leg well out behind him, before he could begin. And when he did begin, he made every downstroke so slowly that it might have been six feet long, while at every upstroke I could hear his pen spluttering extensively. He had a curious idea that the inkstand was on the side of him where it was not, and constantly dipped his pen into space, and seemed quite satisfied with the result. Occasionally he was tripped up by some orthographical stumbling block, but on the whole he got on very well indeed, and when he had signed his name, and had removed a finishing block from the paper to the crown of his head with his two forefingers, he got up and hovered about the table, trying the effect of his performance from various points of view as it lay there, with unbound satisfaction. Not to make Joe uneasy by talking too much, even if I had been able to talk too much, I deferred asking him about Miss Havisham until the next day. He shook his head when I then asked him if she had recovered. Is she dead, Joe? Why don't you see, old chap, said Joe, in a tone of remonstrance, and by way of getting at it by degrees. I wouldn't go so far as to say that, for it's a deal to say, but she ain't. Living, Joe. That's nigher where it is, said Joe. She ain't living. Did she linger long, Joe? After you was took ill, pretty much about what you might call, if you was to put to it, a week, said Joe, still determined on my account to come at everything by degrees. Dear Joe, have you heard what become of her property? Well, old chap, said Joe, it do appear that she had settled the most of it, which I mean to say tied up, on Miss Estella. But she had wrote out a little codicil in her own hand a day or two before the accident, leaving a cool four thousand to Mr. Matthew Pocket. And why do you suppose, above all things, Pip, she left that cool four thousand unto him? Because of Pip's account of him, the said Matthew. I am told by Biddy that ere the writing, said Joe, repeating the legal turn as if it did him infinite good, account of him, the said Matthew, and a cool four thousand, Pip. I never discovered from whom Joe derived the conventional temperature of the four thousand pounds, but it appeared to make the sum of money more to him and he had a manifest relish in insisting on its being cool. The account gave me great joy, as it perfected the only good thing I had done. 
I asked Joe whether he had heard of any of the other relations had any legacies. Miss Sarah, said Joe, she have twenty-five pound per annum for to buy pills, on account of being bilious. Miss Georgiana, she have twenty pound down. Mrs. What's them name of the wild beast with humps, old chap? Camels, said I, wondering why he could possibly want to know. Joe nodded. Mrs. Camels, by which I presently understood he meant Camilla, she had a five pound for it to buy rushlights to put in her spirits when she wake up in the night. The accuracy of these recitals was sufficiently obvious to me to give me great confidence in Joe's information. And now, said Joe, you ain't that strong yet, old chap, that you can take in more than one additional shovelful a day. Old Orlick, he's been a bustin' open a dwelling house. Whose? said I. Not, I grant you, but what his manners is given to blusterous, said Joe apologetically. Still, an Englishman's house is his castle. Castles must not be busted set when done in wartime, and whatsoever the failings on his part, he were a com and seedsman in his heart. Is it Pumblechook's house that has been broken into, then? That it is, Pip, said Joe, and they took his till, and they took his cash-box, and they drinked his wine, and they partook of his whittles. And they slapped his face, and they pulled his nose, and they tied him up to his bedpost. And they give him a dozen, and they stuffed his mouth full of flour and annuals to prevent his crying out. But he knowed Orlick, and Orlick's in the country jail. By these approaches we arrived at unrestricted conversation. I was slow to gain strength, but I did slowly and surely become less weak. And Joe stayed with me, and I fancied I was little Pip again. For the tenderness of Joe was so beautifully proportioned to my need, that I was like a child in his hands. He would sit and talk to me in the old confidence, and with the old simplicity, and in the old unassertive protecting way, so that I would half believe that all my life since the days of the old kitchen was one of the mental troubles of the fever that was gone. He did everything for me except the household work, for which he had engaged a very decent woman after paying off the laundress on his first arrival. Which I do assure you, Pip, he would often say, in explanation of that liberty, I found her a-tapping the spare bed like a cask of beer, and drawing off the feathers in a bucket for sale, which he would have tapped your next, and drawed it off with you a-lying on it, and was then carrying away the coals, gradually, in a soup tureen and vegetable dishes, and the wine and spirits in your Wellington boots. We looked forward to the day when I should go out for a ride, as we had once looked forward to the day of my apprenticeship. And when the day came, and an open carriage was got into in the lane, Joe wrapped me up, took me in his arms, carried me down to it, and put me in it as if I was still the small, helpless creature to whom he had so abundantly given the wealth of his great nature. And Joe got in beside me, and we drove away together into the country, where the rich summer growth was already on the trees and on the grass and the sweet summer scents filled the air. The day happened to be Sunday, and when I looked on the loveliness around me, and thought how it had grown and changed, and how the little wild flowers had been forming, and the voices of the birds had been strengthening, by day and by night, under the sun and under the stars, while poor I lay burning and tossing on my bed, the mere remembrance of having burned and tossed there came like a check upon my peace. But when I heard the Sunday bells, and looked around a little more upon the outspread beauty, I felt that I was not nearly thankful enough, that I was too weak to be even that. I laid my head on Joe's shoulder, as I had laid it long ago when he had taken me to the fair, or where not, and it was too much for my young senses. More composure came to me after a while, and we talked as we used to talk, lying on the grass at the old battery. There was no change whatever in Joe, exactly what he had been in my eyes then, he was in my eyes still, just as simply faithful and as simply right. When we got back again, and he lifted me out and carried me so easily across the court and up the stairs, I thought of that eventful Christmas day when he had carried me over the marshes, and we had not yet made any allusion to my change of fortune, nor did I know how much of my late history he was acquainted with. I was so doubtful of myself now, and put so much trust in him, that I could not satisfy myself whether I ought to refer to it when he did not. "'Have you heard, Joe?' I asked him that evening, upon further consideration, as he smoked his pipe at the window, 
who my patron was i heard returned joe as it were not miss havisham old chap did you hear who it was joe well i heard as it were a person that sent a person what give you the banknotes at the jolly bargeman pip so it was astonishing said joe in the placidest way did you hear that he was dead joe i presently asked with increasing diffidence which him as sent the banknotes pip yes i think said joe after meditating a long time and looking rather evasively at the window seat as i did hear tell how he were something or other in a general way in that direction did you hear anything of his circumstances joe not particular pip would you like to hear joe i was beginning when joe got up and came to my sofa look here old chap said joe bending over me ever the best of friends ain't us pip i was ashamed to answer him very good then said joe as if i had answered that's all right that's agreed upon then why go into subjects old chap which is betwixt two such must be for ever unnecessary there's subjects enough betwixt two such without unnecessary ones lord to think of your poor sister and her rampages and don't you remember tickler i do indeed joe look a here old chap said joe i done what i could to keep you and tickler in sunders but my power were not always fully equal to my inclinations for when your poor sister had a mind to drop into you it were not so much said joe in his favourite argumentative way that she dropped into me too if i put myself in opposition to her but that she dropped into you always heavier for it i noticed that it ain't a grab at a man's whisker nor yet a shake or two of the man to which your sister was quite welcome that had put a man off from getting a little child out of punishment but when that little child is dropped into heavier for that grab of whisker or shaking then that man naturally up and says to himself where is the good of what you are doing i grant you i see the arm says the man but i don't see the good i call upon you sir therefore to point out the good the man says i observed as joe waited for me to speak the man says joe assented is he right that man dear joe he is always right well old chap said joe then abide by your words if he's always right which in general he's more likely wrong he's right when he says this supposing you ever kept a little matter to yourself when you was a little child and you kept it mostly because you knowed j gargery's power to part you and tickler in sunders were not fully equal to his inclinations therefore i think no more of it as betwixt two such and do not let us pass remarks on unnecessary subjects biddy give herself a deal of trouble with me afore i left for i am most awful dull as i should view it in this light and viewing it in this light as i should put it both of which said joe quite charmed with his logical arrangement being done now this to you a true friend say namely you mustn't go over doing it but you must have your supper and your wine and water and you must be put betwixt the sheets the delicacy with which joe dismissed this theme and the sweet tact and kindness with which biddy who with her woman's wit had found me out so soon had prepared him for it made a deep impression on my mind but whether joe knew how poor i was and how my great expectations had all dissolved like our own marsh mists before the sun I could not understand another thing in joe that i could not understand when it first began to develop itself but which i soon arrived at a sorrowful comprehension of was this as i became stronger and better joe became a little less easy with me in my weakness and entire dependence on him the dear fellow had fallen into the old tone and called me by the old names the dear old pip old chap now that were music to my ears i too had fallen into the old ways only happy and thankful that he let me but imperceptibly though i held them fast joe's hold upon them began to slacken and whereas i wondered at this at first i soon began to understand the cause of it was in me and the fault of it was all mine ah had i given joe no reason to doubt my constancy and to think that in prosperity i should grow cold to him and cast him off had i given joe's innocent heart no cause to feel instinctively that as i got stronger his hold upon me would be weaker and that he had better loosen it in time and let me go before i plucked myself away it was on the third or fourth occasion of my going out walking in the temple gardens leaning on joe's arm that i saw this change in him very plainly 
We had been sitting in the bright warm sunlight looking at the river, and I chanced to say as we got up, See, Joe, I can walk quite strongly. Now you shall see me walk back by myself. Which do not overdo it, Pip, said Joe, but I shall be happy for it to see you able, sir. The last word grated on me, but how could I remonstrate? I walked no further than the gate of the gardens, and then pretended to be weaker than I was, and asked Joe for his arm. Joe gave it me, but was thoughtful. I, for my part, was thoughtful too, for how best to check this growing change in Joe was a great perplexity to my remorseful thoughts. That I was ashamed to tell him exactly how I was placed, and what I had come down to, I do not seek to conceal, but I hope my reluctance was not quite an unworthy one. He would want to help me out of his little savings, I knew, and I knew that he ought not to help me, and that I must not suffer him to do it. It was a thoughtful evening with both of us, but before I went to bed I had resolved that I would wait over to-morrow, to-morrow being Sunday, and would begin my new course within the new week. On Monday morning I would speak to Joe about this change. I would lay aside this last vestige of reserve. I would tell him what I had in my thoughts, that secondly not arrived at, and why I had not decided to go out to Herbert, and then the change would be conquered for ever. As I cleared, Joe cleared, and it seemed as though he had sympathetically arrived at a resolution too. We had a quiet day on the Sunday, and we rode out into the country and then walked in the fields. I feel thankful that I have been ill, Joe, I said. Dear old Pip, old chap, you're almost come round, sir. It's been a memorable time for me, Joe. Likewise for myself, sir, Joe returned. We've had a time together, Joe, that I can never forget. There were days once I know that I did for a while forget, but I shall never forget these. Pip, said Joe, appearing a little hurried and troubled, there has been larks, and dear sir, what have been betwixt us have been. At night, when I had gone to bed, Joe came into my room as he had done all through my recovery. He asked me if I felt sure that I was as well as in the morning. Yes, dear Joe, quite. And are always getting stronger, old chap? Yes, dear Joe, steadily. Joe patted the coverlet on my shoulder with his great good hand, and said in what I thought a husky voice, Good night. When I got up in the morning, refreshed and stronger yet, I was full of my resolution to tell Joe all without delay. I would tell him before breakfast, I would dress at once and go to his room and surprise him, for it was the first day I had been up early. I went to his room, and he was not there. Not only was he not there, but his box was gone. I hurried then to the breakfast table, and found on it a letter. These were its brief contents. Not wishful to intrude, I have departed, for you are well again, dear Pip, and would do better without Joe. P.S. Ever the best of friends. Enclosed in the letter was a receipt for the debt and costs on which I had been arrested. Down to that moment I had vainly supposed that my creditor had withdrawn or suspended the proceedings until I should be quite recovered. I had never dreamed of Joe's having paid the money, but Joe had paid it and the receipt was in his name. What remained for me now but to follow him to the dear old forge, and there to have out my disclosure to him, and my penitent remonstrance with him, and there to relieve my mind and heart of that reserve secondly? which had begun as a vague something lingering in my thoughts, and had formed into a settled purpose. The purpose was that I would go to Biddy, that I would show her how humbled and repentant I came back, that I would tell her how I had lost all once I hoped for, that I would remind her of her old confidences in my first unhappy time. Then I would say to her, Biddy, I think you once liked me very well when my errant heart, even while it strayed away from you, was quieter and better with you than it had ever been since, if you can like me only half as well once more, if you can take me with all my faults and disappointments on my head, if you can receive me like a forgiven child, and indeed I am a sorry Biddy, and have as much of need of a hushing voice and a soothing hand, I hope I am a little worthier of you than I was, not much but a little, and Biddy it shall rest with you to say whether I shall work at the forge with Joe or whether I shall try for any different occupation down in this country, 
or whether we shall go away to a distant place where an opportunity awaits me which i set aside when it was offered until i knew your answer and now dear biddy if you can tell me that you will go through the world with me then you will surely make it a better world for me and make me a better man for it i will try hard to make it a better world for you such was my purpose after three days more of recovery i went down to the old place to put it in execution and how i sped in it is all i have left to tell chapter fifty eight the tidings of my high fortunes having had a heavy fall had got down to my native place and its neighbourhood before i got there i found the blue boar in possession of the intelligence and i found that it made a great change in the boar's demeanour whereas the boar had cultivated my good opinion with warm assiduity when i was coming into property the boar was exceedingly cool on the subject now that i was going out of property it was evening when i arrived much fatigued by the journey i had so often made so easily the boar could not put me into my usual bedroom which was engaged probably by someone who had expectations and could only assign me a very indifferent chamber among the pigeons and post chaises up the yard but i had as sound a sleep in that lodging as in the most superior accommodation the boar could have given me and the quality of my dreams was about the same as in the best bedroom early in the morning while my breakfast was getting ready i strolled around by sartis house there were printed bills on the gate and on bits of carpet hanging out of the windows announcing a sale by auction of the household furniture and effects next week the house itself was to be sold as old building materials and pulled down lot one was marked in whitewashed knock knee letters on the brew house lot two on that part of the main building which had been so long shut up other lots were marked off on other parts of the structure and the ivy had been torn down to make room for the inscriptions and much of it trailed low in the dust and was withered already stepping in for a moment at the open gate and looking around me with the uncomfortable air of a stranger who had no business there i saw the auctioneer's clerk walking on the casks and telling them off for the information of a catalogue compiler pen in hand who made a temporary desk of the wheeled chair i had so often pushed along to the tune of old clem when i got back to my breakfast in the boar's coffee room i found mr pumblechook conversing with the landlord mr pumblechook not improved in appearance by his late nocturnal adventure was waiting for me and addressed me in the following terms young man i'm sorry to see you brought so low but what else could be expected what else could be expected as he extended his hand with a magnificently forgiving air and as i was broken by illness and unfit to quarrel i took it william said mr pumblechook to the waiter put a muffin on the table and as it come to this has it come to this i frowningly sat down to my breakfast mr pumblechook stood over me and poured out my tea before i could touch the teapot with the air of a benefactor who was resolved to be true to the last william said mr pumblechook mournfully put the salt on in happier times addressing me i think you took sugar and did you take milk you did sugar and milk william bring a watercress thank you said i shortly but i don't eat watercresses you don't eat em returned mr pumblechook sighing and nodding his head several times as if he might have expected that and as if abstinence from watercresses were consistent with my downfall true the simple fruits of the earth no you needn't bring any william i went on with my breakfast and mr pumblechook continued to stand over me staring fishily and breathing noisily as he always did little more than skin and bone mused mr pumblechook aloud and yet when he went from here i may say with my blessing and spread afore him my humble store like the bee he was as plump as a peach this reminded me of the wonderful difference between the servile manner in which he had offered his hand in my new prosperity saying may i and the ostentatious clemency with which he had just now exhibited the same fat five fingers ah he went on handing me the bread and butter and are you going to joseph in heaven's name said i firing in spite of myself what does it matter to you where i am going leave that teapot alone 
It was the worst course I could have taken, because it gave Pumblechook the opportunity he wanted. "'Yes, young man,' said he, releasing the handle of the article in question, retiring a step or two from my table, and speaking for the behoof of the landlord and the waiter at the door. "'I will leave that teapot alone. You are right, young man. For once you are right. I forget myself when I take such an interest in your breakfast as to wish your frame, exhausted by the debilitating effects of prodigiality, to be stimulated by the wholesome nourishment of your forefathers. And yet, said Pumblechook, turning to the landlord and waiter, and pointing me out at arm's length, this is him as I ever sported with in his days of happy infancy. Tell me it cannot be. I tell you, this is him. A low murmur from the two replied. The waiter appeared to be particularly affected. This is him, said Pumblechook, as I have rode in my shay-cart. This is him as I have seen brought up by hand. This is him unto the sister of which I was uncle by marriage, as her name was Georgina Maria from her own mother. Let him deny it if he can. The waiter seemed convinced that I could not deny it, and that it gave the case a black look. "'Young man,' said Pumblechook, screwing his head at me in the old fashion, "'you are going to Joseph. What does it matter to me? You ask me where you are going? I say to you, sir, you are going to Joseph.' The waiter coughed, as if he modestly invited me to get over that. "'Now,' said Pumblechook, and all this with the most exasperating air of saying in the cause of virtue what was perfectly convincing and conclusive, "'I will tell you what to say to Joseph.' Here is Squires of the Boar present, known and respected in this town, and here is William, which his father's name was Potkins, if I do not deceive myself. You do not, sir, said William. In their presence, pursued Pumblechook, I will tell you, young man, what to say to Joseph. Says you to Joseph, I have this day seen my earliest benefactor and the founder of my fortunes. I will no names, Joseph, but so they are pleased to call him uptown, and I have seen that man. I swear I don't see him here, said I. Say that likewise, retorted Pumblechook. So you said that, and even Joseph will probably betray surprise. There you quite mistake him, said I. I know better. Says you, Pumblechook went on. Joseph, I have seen that man, and that man bears you no malice, and bears me no malice. He knows your character, Joseph, and is well acquainted with your pig-headedness and ignorance. And he knows my character, Joseph, and he knows my want of gratitude. Yes, Joseph, says you. Here, Pumblechook shook his head and hand at me. He knows my total deficiency of common human gratitude. He knows it, Joseph, as none can. You do not know it, Joseph, having no call to know it, but that man do. Windy donkey as he was, it really amazed me that he could have the face to talk thus to mine. Says you, Joseph, he gave me a little message which I will now repeat. It was that in my being brought low, he saw the finger of Providence. He know that finger when he saw Joseph, and he saw it plain. It pointed out this writing, Joseph, reward of ingratitude to his earliest benefactor, and founder of fortunes. But that man said he did not repent of what he had done, Joseph, not at all. It was right to do it, it was kind to do it, it was benevolent to do it, and he would do it again. It's a pity, said I scornfully, as I finished my interrupted breakfast, that the man did not say what he had done and would do again. Squires of the boar, Pumblechook was now addressing the landlord, and William, I have no objections to your mentioning, either up or down town, if such would be your wishes, that it was right to do it, kind to do it, benevolent to do it, and that I would do it again. With those words the impostor shook them both by the hand, with an air, and left the house, leaving me much more astonished than delighted by the virtues of that same indefinite it. I was not long after him in leaving the house too, and when I went down the high street I saw him holding forth, no doubt to the same effect, at his shop door to a select group, who honoured me with very unfavourable glances as I passed on the opposite side of the way. But it was only the pleasanter to turn to Biddy and Joe, whose great forbearance shone more brightly than before, if that could be, contrasted with this brazen pretender. 
I went towards them slowly, for my limbs were weak, but with a sense of increasing relief as I drew nearer to them, and a sense of leaving arrogance and untruthfulness further and further behind. The June weather was delicious, the sky was blue, the larks were soaring high over the green corn. I thought all that countryside more beautiful and peaceful by far than I had ever known it to be yet. Many pleasant pictures of the life that I would lead there, and of the change for the better that would come over my character when I had a guiding spirit at my side, whose simple faith and clear home wisdom I had proved, beguiled my way. They awakened a tender emotion in me, for my heart was softened by my return, and such a change had come to pass that I felt like one who was toiling home barefoot from distant travel, and whose wanderings had lasted many years. The schoolhouse where Biddy was mistress I had never seen, but the little roundabout lane by which I entered the village, for quietness sake, took me past it. I was disappointed to find that the day was a holiday, no children were there, and Biddy's house was closed. Some hopeful notion of my seeing her, busily engaged in her daily duties before she saw me, had been in my mind and was defeated. But the forge was a very short distance off and I went towards it under the sweet green limes, listening for the clink of Joe's hammer. Long after I ought to have heard it, and long after I fancied I heard it and found but a fancy, all was still. The limes were there, and the white thorns were there, and the chestnut trees were there, and the leaves rustled harmoniously when I stopped to listen, but the clink of Joe's hammer was not in the midsummer wind. Almost fearing, without knowing why, to come in view of the forge, I saw it all at last, and saw that it was closed. No gleam of fire, no glittering shower of sparks, no roar of bellows, all shut up and still. But the house was not deserted, and the best parlour seemed to be in use, for there were white curtains fluttering in its window, and the window was open and gay with flowers. I went softly towards it, meaning to peep over the flowers, when Joe and Biddy stood before me, arm in arm. At first Biddy gave a cry, as if she thought it was my apparition, but in another moment she was in my embrace. I wept to see her, and she wept to see me. I, because she looked so fresh and pleasant, she, because I looked so worn and white. But, dear Biddy, how smart you are! Yes, dear Pip! And, Joe, how smart you are! Yes, dear old Pip, old chap! I looked at both of them, from one to the other, and then— it's my wedding day cried biddy in a burst of happiness and i am married to joe they had taken me into the kitchen and i had laid my head down on the old deal table biddy held one of my hands to her lips and joe's restoring touch was on my shoulder which he weren't strong enough my dear for it to be surprised said joe and biddy said i ought to have thought of it dear joe but i was too happy they were both so overjoyed to see me, so proud to see me, so touched by my coming to them, so delighted that I should have come by accident to make their day complete. My first thought was one of great thankfulness that I had never breathed this last baffled hope to Joe. How often while he was with me in my illness had it risen to my lips! How irrevocable would have been his knowledge of it, if he had remained with me but another hour! Dear Biddy, said I, you have the best husband in the whole world and if you could have seen him by my bed you would have, but no, you couldn't love him better than you do. No, I couldn't indeed, said Biddy. And dear Joe, you have the best wife in the world, and she will make you as happy as even you deserve to be, you dear, good, noble Joe. Joe looked at me with a quivering lip, and fairly put his sleeve before his eyes. And Joe and Biddy both, as you have been to church today, and are in charity and love with all mankind, Receive my humble thanks for all you have done for me, and all I have so ill repaid. And when I say that I am going away within the hour, for I am soon going abroad, and I shall never rest until I have worked for the money with which you have kept me out of prison, and have sent it to you. Don't think, dear Joe and Biddy, that if I could repay it a thousand times over, I suppose I could cancel a starving of the debt I owe you, or that I would do so if I could. They were both melted by these words, and both entreated me to say no more. But I must say more, dear Joe. I hope you will have children to love, and that some little fellow will sit in this chimney corner of a winter night, 
who may remind you of another little fellow gone out of it for ever. Don't tell him, Joe, that I was thankless. Don't tell him, Biddy, that I was ungenerous and unjust. Only tell him that I honoured you both, because you were both so good and true, and that as your child I said it would be natural to him to grow up a much better man than I did. It ain't a-goin', said Joe from behind his sleeve, to tell him nothing o' that nature, Pip, nor Biddy ain't, nor yet no one ain't. And now, though I know you have already done it in your own kind hearts, pray tell me both that you forgive me. Pray let me hear you say the words that I may carry the sound of them away with me, and then I shall be able to believe that you can trust me and think better of me in the time to come. Oh, dear old Pip, old chap, said Joe, God knows as I forgive you, if you have anything to forgive. Amen, and God knows I do, echoed Biddy. Now let me go up and look at my old little room, and rest there a few minutes by myself, and then when I have eaten and drunk with you, go with me as far as the finger-post, dear Joe and Biddy, before we say good-bye. I sold all I had, and put aside as much as I could for a composition with my creditors, who gave me ample time to pay them in full, and I went out and joined Herbert. Within a month I had quitted England, and within two months I was clerk to Clariker and Co and within four months I assumed my first undivided responsibility, for the beam across the parlour ceiling at Mill Pond Bank had then ceased to tremble under old Bill Barley's growls, and was at peace, and Herbert had gone away to marry Clara, and I was left in sole charge of the eastern branch until he brought her back. Many a year went round before I was a partner in the house, but I lived happily with Herbert and his wife, and lived frugally, and paid my debts, and maintained a constant correspondence with Biddy and Joe. It was not until I became third in the firm that Clariker betrayed me to Herbert, but he had then declared that the secret of Herbert's partnership had been long enough upon his conscience, and he must tell it. So he told it, and Herbert was as much moved as amazed, and the dear fellow and I were not the worst friends for the long concealment. I must not leave it to be supposed that we were ever a great house, or that we made mints of money. We were not in a grand way of business, but we had a good name, and worked for our profits, and did very well. We owed so much to Herbert's ever-cheerful industry and readiness, that I often wondered how I had conceived that old idea of his inaptitude, until I was one day enlightened by the reflection that perhaps the inaptitude had never been in him at all but had been in me. Chapter 59 For eleven years I had not seen Joe nor Biddy with my bodily eyes, though they had both been often before my fancy in the east, when, upon an evening in December, an hour or two after dark, I laid my hand softly on the latch of the old kitchen door. I touched it so softly that I was not heard, and looked in unseen. There, smoking his pipe in the old place by the kitchen firelight, as hale and as strong as ever, though a little grey, sat Joe. And there, fenced into the corner, with Joe's leg, and sitting on my own little stool looking at the fire, was I again. We give him the name of Pip for your sake, dear old chap, said Joe, delighted when I took another stool by the child's side. But I did not rumple his hair and we hoped he might grow a little bit like you, and we think he do. I thought so too, and I took him out for a walk next morning, and we talked immensely, understanding one another to perfection. And I took him down to the churchyard, and set him on a certain tombstone there, and he showed me from that elevation which stone was sacred to the memory of Philip Pirrip, late of this parish, and also Georgiana, wife of the above. Biddy, said I, when I talked with her after dinner, as her little girl lay sleeping in her lap, you must give Pip to me one of these days, or lend him at all events. No, no, said Biddy gently, you must marry. Eh, so Herbert and Clara say, but I don't think I shall, Biddy. I have so settled down in their home, it is not at all likely. I am already quite an old bachelor. Biddy looked down at her child, and put its little hand to her lips, and then put the good matronly hand with which he had touched into mine. There was something in the action, and in the light pressure of Biddy's wedding-ring, that had a very pretty eloquence in it, 
dear pip said biddy you are sure you don't fret for her oh no i think not biddy tell me as an old old friend have you quite forgotten her my dear biddy i have forgotten nothing in my life that ever had a foremost place there and little that ever had any place there but that poor dream as i once used to call it has gone by biddy all gone by nevertheless i knew while i said those words that i secretly intended to revisit the site of the old house that evening alone for her sake yes even so for estella's sake i had heard of her as leading a most unhappy life and as being separated from her husband who had used her with great cruelty and who had become quite renowned as a compound of pride avarice brutality and meanness and i had heard of the death of her husband from an accident consequent on his ill treatment of a horse this release had befallen her some two years before for anything i knew she was married again the early dinner hour at joe's left me in abundance of time without hurrying my talk with biddy to walk over to the old spot before dark but what with loitering on the way to look at old objects and to think of old times the day had quite declined when i came to the place there was no house now no brewery no building whatever left but the wall of the old garden the cleared space had been enclosed with a rough fence and looking over it i saw some of the old ivy had struck root anew and was growing green on low quiet mounds of ruin a gate in the fence standing ajar i pushed it open and went in a cold silvery mist had veiled the afternoon and the moon was not yet up to scatter it but the stars were shining beyond the mist and the moon was coming and the evening was not dark I could trace out where every part of the old house had been and where the brewery had been and where the gates and where the casks i had done so and was looking along the desolate garden walk when i beheld a solitary figure in it the figure showed itself aware of me as i advanced it had been moving towards me but it stood still as i drew nearer i saw it to be the figure of a woman as i drew nearer yet it was about to turn away when it stopped and let me come up with it then it faltered as if much surprised and uttered my name and i cried out estella i am greatly changed i wonder you know me the freshness of her beauty was indeed gone but its indescribable majesty and its indescribable charm remained those attractions in it i had seen before what i had never seen before was the saddened softened light of the once proud eyes what i had never felt before was the friendly touch of the once insensible hand we sat down on a bench that was near and i said after so many years it is strange that we should thus meet again estella here where our first meeting was do you often come back i have never been here since nor i the moon began to rise and i thought of the placid look at the white ceiling which had passed away the moon began to rise and i thought of the pressure on my hand when i had spoken the last words he had heard on earth estella was the next to break the silence that ensued between us i have very often hoped and intended to come back but i have been prevented by many circumstances poor poor old place the silvery mist was touched with the first rays of the moonlight and the same rays touched the tears that dropped from her eyes not knowing that i saw them and setting herself up to get the better of them she said quietly were you wondering as you walked along how it came to be left in this condition yes estella the ground belongs to me it's the only possession i have not relinquished everything else has gone from me little by little but i have kept this it was the subject of the only determined resistance i made in all the wretched years is it to be built on at last it is i came here to take leave of it before its change and you she said in a voice of touching interest to a wanderer you live abroad still still and you do well i'm sure i work pretty hard for a sufficient living and therefore yes i do well i have often thought of you said estella have you of late very often there was a long hard time when i kept far from me the remembrance of what i had thrown away when i was quite ignorant of its worth but since my duty has not been incompatible with the admission of that remembrance i have given it a place in my heart 
you have always held a place in my heart i answered and we were silent again until she spoke i little thought said estella that i should take leave of you in taking leave of this spot i am very glad to do so glad to part again estella to me parting is a painful thing to me the remembrance of our last parting has been ever mournful and painful but you said to me returned estella very earnestly god bless you god forgive you and if you could say that to me then you will not hesitate to say that to me now now when suffering has been stronger than all other teaching and has taught me to understand what your heart used to be i have been bent and broken but i hope into a better shape be as considerate and good to me as you were and tell me we are friends we are friends said i rising and bending over her as she rose from the bench and will continue friends apart said estella i took her hand in mine and we went out of the ruined place and as the morning mists had risen long ago when i first left the forge so the evening mists were rising now and in all the broad expanse of tranquil light they showed to me i saw no shadow of another parting from her end of great expectations by charles dickens